Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, global uh, internet uh, economics conference. My name is Angus Armstrong. I'm director of Rebuilding Macroeconomics and ESRC Research Network. And together with Alexander Mihailov of the University of Reading, we are co-organizers of today's events. The theme of our conference today is celebrating Chris Sims' famous macroeconomics and reality paper written 40 years ago in Econometrica, looking at identification issues in macroeconomics. This is part, this conference is part of the prosperity and resilience research theme at Reading University. Now, before we start formally, I just want to make a couple of points. I'm sure everybody is now familiar with how to use Zoom, but just a few points that I may. First of all, we would encourage everybody to ask questions. So to do that, if you could use the chat function, there is a Q&A function, but we prefer the chat function because that's uh, open to everybody. It's better to have everything in one place. And when you raise a question in the chat function, if you can make sure that you address it to everyone. So if you just type in, then quite often it's just to the speaker or to the chair or to the organizer, but just click it and make sure it's to everyone. And then please do fill in your questions. <clears throat> and if, if, if needs be, also respond to other people's questions. In each of the sessions today, we have a chairperson. So they'll be looking at the chat and picking questions that they think are most relevant and interesting to put to the speakers at the end of their presentation. So that's how to get yourself uh, involved in the conversation and to ask questions through the chat function. Second point, we have 10 presentations. Now each of the five sessions, we have a chairperson and it's a chairperson's job as, as well as introducing and um, curating the Q and A's to also keep the speakers to time. Uh, because we've got a, a, a long day, say 10 presentations ahead. So for the chair people, please do keep this all to time. The third point is just to remind everybody that these presentations are recorded. The recordings will be available on the conference website in probably about one week's time. So it takes a little bit of time to do the editing, to chop out some of the bits of chit chat during the interval. So give us about one week and they'll all be publicly available. That's all from me for now. Um, I am now going to pass over to Robert van der Noort, who is Reading's Vice Chancellor, and we're greatly honored to have him open today's conference. Robert is an archeologist specializing in the North Sea Basin. He's a fellow of the Society of uh, Antiquaries uh, of London, and also a principal fellow of the Higher Education Academy. So Robert, we're delighted to have you open up this Reading University and Rebuilding Macroeconomics one day conference on macroeconomics and reality. And I can pass over to you. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Angus. Um, and, and, and welcome everybody to this uh, one day conference. Um, wish you could receive you here at the University of Reading's campus and the sun is just coming out. It's always a great place to be. Um, but the virtual world we all got used to and hopefully it will work uh, for all of us. So um, uh, I've been asked over the conference with a few words uh, and the conference supports the University of Reading's research strategy theme, prosperity and resilience. And I'm pleased to see how many of my colleagues are here today. Uh, it is now 40 years since the publication of Christopher Sims' seminal paper on macroeconomics and reality. And this conference both celebrates this anniversary and shares, debates, and evaluates new models and methods in macroeconomics. Now, I understand that macroeconomics is still evolving to understand better our complex reality. Evidently, many of the papers today focus on the more established economic topics, such as economic growth, business cycle fluctuation, fiscal policy, and monetary policy and how these contribute to the preservation and expansion of the living standards of societies. And I also understand that in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, many of the old certainties and givens, such as continued productivity grow, ever reducing inequalities, and continually growing living standards are no longer valid. And we all experience that 
And add to this the ever-increasing computing power and the ability to produce ever more sophisticated models, which can only mean that as an academic discipline, uh, macroeconomics is in one of those periods that the philosopher Thomas Kuhn would refer to as being in a paradigm shift. Now, as vice chancellor, I increasingly find myself involved in having to phase up to these new macroeconomic conditions. Uh, and none less so when considering the future of our pension funds, which are still based on now no longer true concepts of ever increasing growth, high yields in the stock market, and thus guaranteed high defined, defined benefits returned to scheme members. Uh, any academic working in a UK university will be all too aware of this, and you may or may not agree with me that the scheme as it stands is no longer sustainable, but it is the macroeconomic modeling that underpins the valuation that seems to be causing our disputes. So I'll throw it all back at you again. You could say that even our pension experiences uh, its own paradigm shift. Now more generally in my role, the macroeconomics of the global economy is becoming increasingly important as we become less dependent on direct funding from our government. So for example, um, understanding the future of fee paying international students is closely bound up with economic development and the emergence of a middle class abroad. Uh, and clearly, it is, it is how macroeconomics helps explain the future of that market that guides us in our strategic planning. And you could have seen what happened with the pandemic. Its economic impact is immediately felt in the number of international students coming across. But what really caught my eye in your program today uh, was the expansion of macroeconomics methods and tools into fields beyond the economy, in fields such as climate change science or related to the COVID-19 pandemic into epidemiology. Now, I have a particular interest in the intersection of economics, climate change and environmental management, not in the role as vice chancellor, but in my role as chair of the Thames Regional Flood and Coastal Committee. Effectively, this committee determines the funding of all flood management schemes for the whole of the River Thames. So we take it up from the source in the Cotswolds uh, all the way down to the estuary where we are planning the second Thames barrier which we will need in about 50 years from now. And I've also oversight of the role of the modeling of the national long-term investment scheme for flood risk management. We call it uh, LTIS for short. And LTIS is quite a unique uh, program and it provides a helicopter view of flood risk management. Uh, the scope is the long-term, so the next 50 to 100 years. We look at all local authorities, risk management authorities, all flood risk considered. And we look at really uh, how all this is impacted by climate change and how we can help benefit the environment. And that's for the whole of England. And what is really interesting for me working with uh, economists, the modeling of the simple question, what is the optimum economic investment required in our flood risk management in England? Um, and I've seen the impact of what a good macroeconomic model well presented can do. So the UK government uh, will today hopefully reconfirm what has announced uh, in the last uh, spending review that it wants to double its grant in aid on flood risk management. Now that is solely on the basis of this macroeconomics model. So I, I, I don't know how to operate it myself, but I know the power of macroeconomics in the real world. Now, now for about my interest in macroeconomics, let's look what is in store for you. Now, the conference proposes a densely intellectual journey, I love that phrase, across recent challenges in the world economy and novel methods and models trying to assess them. So, uh, it is scripted through the session titles and presented by leading scholars, and I'm afraid I can only stay for the first session um, but this, for me, may be the most interesting one. So session one addresses the urgency of climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic. Session, session two moves beyond the standard representative agent framework and realistic open economy frameworks, modeling, and I'll quote here, heterogeneous firms as driving business cycles and heterogeneous consumers in influencing optimal monetary fiscal policy. Session three proposes a method to estimate present-day sophisticated models in macroeconomics under a realistic feature of incomplete information and a model of economic growth driven by rich data. Session four presents computational advances that empower us to solve complex uh, heterogeneous 
agent models using <laughs> machine learning algorithms. And session five concludes by embedding macroeconomics within the broader politics, uh, structures of politics and society. So as a final, and I won't keep you much longer, but the conference joined by two groups, the university's economic analysis research group uh, and the ESRC's uh, Rebuilding Macroeconomics Network, uh, Angus already talked about. So let me say just a few things about the university's economic analysis research group. So it was founded about uh, two decades ago by Professor of Econometrics, Gary Patterson. It is the oldest research unit within the, our Department of Economy, Economics. And its interests include macroeconomics, microeconomics, and econometrics, with an emphasis on the practical application of theoretical concepts. Over the years, the group has been active and influential in organizing important research events in various topical policy relevant issues. And they've worked in collaborations with many organizations, including the Bank of England, uh, the Fondation Banque de France, the European Central Bank, and many others. And at the moment, the group comprises eight members, one third of the economy, de economics department, six current and six recent PhD students and 16 associate members around the world. And great to see so many of my colleagues involved there. I've attended various events, uh, particularly on the sports side, uh, uh, the Rosa system, great fun and very interesting. But I think that's all for me. You've heard more from me than you probably want to hear. Just I want to thank you on, on your behalf, if I may, the organizers of this conference. And I wish you all a great day of learning and sharing. Enjoy. Thank you very much, Robert, for this wonderful opening of our Zoom conference on macroeconomics and reality. Where are we now? It is so nice that you shared your personal experience and thoughts on how macroeconomics relates to your own job, career, responsibilities, activities. You seem to be an expert in our field, don't you? Part of our crowd of fellow macroeconomists. <laughs> kind of surprising for some of us. You also helpfully provided a roadmap for the sessions. So I now proceed to the first one, uh, handing over to um, our head of school, Professor Uma Kampambati. She chairs the first session on climate change and pandemics. Before that, just let me remind something to all participants. Please use the chat function in uh, Zoom to ask questions, which will then be collected by the ch chair sessions, and some of them will be selected to be posted to speakers. Over to you, Uma. Thanks, Alex. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is, um, as Robert said, the first session of, uh, of the conference, and it is on climate change and pandemics. We have two papers this morning um, by Per Krusel of uh, Stockholm University and Matthias Trabant uh, of the Free University of Berlin. Um, I've been asked to keep very strict time, so I will, which means that I will, in, I will let you know when there's five minutes left to the end of your talk. I understand that you have been asked to prepare for 30 minutes. Is that right? Yeah. So, uh, so it will be 30 minutes. I'll let you know five minutes before the end. And then there'll be 15 minutes for questions. As um, Alex said, if you put your questions into, um, into the chat function, I'll keep an eye on it and uh, flag up any at the end. Thank you. So uh, the first paper is Climate Change and Macroeconomics by Per Krusel. Per, I think, is here. Yes. Um, so over to you then. Thanks. Uh, I take it you can see my screen now? Yes. OK. So I, I, I have um, um, slides. I'm happy to share them later with you if you're interested. Uh, there's a little bit more material in the slides uh, on purpose because there may be questions and I will then visit slides I may not actually cover on the main presentation. So I'll kind of start from a big picture because it's useful for me. Um, so first of all, what to do about climate change? There's a scientific consensus that humans cause, cause warming, that it can be substantial, but there's actually less agreement 
or at least there's a lot of uncertainty on how much warming there will be and how warming affects human welfare in various places. Um, uh, so, but having said that, there is clearly consensus that we should limit emissions substantially. The only qualification to that is for people who are convinced that geoengineering will kind of allow us to do something that undoes what we have, but very few people are willing to rely on that alone. So I think this is consensus. We should limit emissions. And the question now is how? Um, so I think for that question, economics is absolutely central. The how question uh, needs to be answered based on an understanding of how our, our societies work. And that means to a large extent how our economies work. And who has knowledge of, about that? We do. Uh, to the extent anyone does, we do. Natural scientists are not good at this, uh, nor are engineers. Um, and it's unfortunately my, my experience that they are uh, not necessarily aware of it. They often propose um, courses of action that are not really cognizant of, uh, of how market economies work. And so I think, well, actually, this is both a challenge and a golden opportunity for us to help the world and showcase, uh, maybe um, improve our reputation among econ skeptics how our subject and our understanding of the subject could be useful. Uh, I, I'm very serious about this. It's, it sounds like big words, but uh, I think it's maybe one of the few big opportunities we have. Most recently, we went through a recession. We blamed for not being able to predict it. I don't know, let's step up to the plate and do something. Um, and I think it, the stakes are huge. If, if we don't solve the how question in a smart and cheap way, um, in particular, if we propose expensive solutions, the world's populations will probably not buy into them. Uh, they will kick out leaders who uh, propose the expensive solutions in favor of people who are climate skeptics and so on. So it's super important to come up with smart and cheap solutions. Uh, not because economists always want to save, but because here there's more, to, more at stake and we do want to stop climate change. Okay. so. How do we do it in principle? I go was a British economist who figured it out 100 years ago exactly. It's trivial because warming is a byproduct of economic activity. It's a it's a cleaner <laughs> cleaner case to uh, maybe use a bad metaphor uh, for a pure uh, externality than anything. Markets fail. Um, so Pigou basically said what we need to do is apply a tax equal to the, to the damage, to the marginal damage that polluters are um, not paying. Um, so, and with this tight tax in place, markets will work well accompanying the tax. And I think there has been no basic quibble with this insight since, since 1920. Uh, add to this, the fact that carbon spreads very quickly in the atmosphere. So if you emit, carbon in Stockholm, it will affect the global climate, you know, a year or a couple of years later, uh, everywhere equally around the world, it spreads that quickly. So that means that this tax you have to apply shouldn't really depend on where you emit, okay? Whether you emit in Stockholm or in China. So, so the solution is a uniform across the globe, global carbon tax. That's Pigou's recipe and that's kind of um, old, literally old insights. Uh, and I think economists have been repeating this message like parrots um, um, without having a huge effect. Um, I think a super important exception is the EU uh, trading system, uh, which is now being expanded to cover more. Or the plan is to expand it. The price has been adjusted upwards because of changes in the way uh, that system works. Really great. But these ex the, these um, this exception and maybe one or two others involve a tiny part of, glo of global emissions. And so, so then why, uh, why haven't people listened to us? Um, I think maybe number one, it sounds more natural to do other things. Um, taxes are like abstract for many people. Um, and they don't necessarily understand why the tax is good. Uh, could also be fairness concerns somehow that 
um, it's not fair to use a tax for some in some places or some people. So what I'll focus on in this talk is a possible explanation number two. Not, not that three is not relevant. I will touch on three, okay? But so I'll try to push here the idea that the reason people don't listen to us is that they don't necessarily understand it, um, what we're saying. So I, I would say that this, this also involves an inner journey for me, like a self-critique. Um, um, and not so much as a macroeconomist actually, but more as an economist in general, I think, and maybe a theorist. We, we in economics, we have a lot of beautiful insights and formulas, especially we have, we derive, you know, to derive conditions for optimal behavior of firms, households, governments, uh, they're kind of math intense. Um, so we have a lot of marginal conditions telling us what's right. Uh, uh, the Pigou tax is just an example of that. Um, and, you know, one of my papers, I have, a, uh, I'm deriving a formula for, uh, for the use in, in the climate case. Uh, and, and it's really nice, but, you know, that's only a small part of uh, the solution. We also need to explain why this, why this is good. Uh, we shouldn't fall in love with our formulas. Um, and, and actually what we need to do is to explain why th these conditions we're proposing are so much better than alternatives that may be more palatable, more intuitive, such as various regulations or whatever you might uh, have in mind. Um, and I think that the reason why we're not very persuasive is that economics typically doesn't go much beyond figuring out the optimum. Um, we typically don't know why, we don't look so much at suboptimal policies. So um, the, the, the theme here is suboptimal policy, that we have to take suboptimal policy carefully. And, and sometimes we're even wrong. We propose a beautiful formula, it is correct, but an obvious alternative is close to correct. And then we might as well go for the obvious alternative. Okay, so we, you know, when do our beautiful formulas, when are they really necessary uh, 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 and when are they not? Okay, so how much better is the Pigou tax than the alternatives is, is one of the concrete questions here. So I, I've, I have a paper called Suboptimal uh, Clim Climate Policy and that's based on work with John Hustler and Connie Olsson and also Michelle Wright there. Um, but I'm also writing other papers with Hustler and Olsson so I wanna emphasize them more. Um, where we basically compare the Pigou tax to alternatives that are worse. So, uh, so, so what I'll go through now is three ways of, of not doing the right thing, three ways of not following our advice, and then systematically compare and see, you know, how bad are they, or are they actually okay or not? So the first type of mistake, the first, first type of deviation is to use the right kind of policy. In this case, let's use a global uniform tax on carbon, but let's set it at the wrong level. So it could either be that we set it too high or we set it too low, considering the size of damages and the, the amount of warming. Uh, it's not easy to know what the right level is because it involves detailed knowledge. So suppose we set it the wrong way, too high or too low. Okay, then let's look at the outcomes. The second case is that we uh, we do still use a carbon tax, but we, we, we maybe for fairness reasons, we let some parts of the world not, um, we don't force them to use a carbon tax. And a common argument is developing countries maybe shouldn't have to use it because we didn't use one when we were developing or whatever. Um, so let's, uh, let's look at that case. Is it costly or not? to have different rates in different parts of the world. Um, thirdly, um, uh, maybe more common and popular proposition is uh, let's promote green energy. So I know that economists wouldn't say um, that you shouldn't tax carbon. They would tend to say, let's tax carbon and let's subsidize green energy. But I think it's very common to think that you don't need to ca tax carbon, you can instead promote green energy. So what I'm going to focus on here is, suppose you don't tax carbon and instead you promote green energy, then what? 
So these are like three examples of commonly discussed things. Um, and, you know, let's evaluate them. Uh, and our, our takeaways are, um, and I should say the takeaways here are, I mean, we are, uh, the takeaways are, they're, they're not like, we're not designing cool cases that give you surprising results. These are like pretty standard questions we wanted to ask. And um, we had no strong prior on how it would come out, but here are the results. Um, it's very costly to, it can be very costly to set a carbon tax based on, sorry, I go again. It is very costly to set a carbon tax based on the hope that climate change is mild and not very costly when in fact it is. So if you under tax, you know, how bad is that? Turns out that's very bad for human welfare. Uh, some of you might say this is obvious, but, uh, they, uh, you know, show some numbers. Uh, second point is, uh, it is actually very costly to let countries or regions off the hook, uh, leave them with lower carbon taxes. So this kind of efficiency dictates that the tax should be the same everywhere, but you might think it doesn't matter too much if it's a little bit different in different places. Well, it turns out it is, okay. Um, third point is when we take, it's like use baseline estimates of uh, uh, green energy and versus fossil energy, um, substitutabilities and so on, uh, we, we conclude that actually green subsidies or uh, sole focus on promoting green green technology is is is, is very dangerous actually it, it with, with a high risk we will not help uh, the climate much at all okay uh, i know th th this is the point where people tend to want to disagree uh, uh, in in my talk and the point is not here's not so much that we know this is bad but there's this big risk that it is. Uh, so kind of for precautionary reasons, um, we, we, uh, we want to em emphasize this. Don't try it, we can fix it by just pushing for greed. Okay, and I'll try to explain this. The first point um, that it's very costly to set a low tax when actually climate change is a big deal, it can be very costly, um, is, is interesting particularly because if you make the opposite error. If you set a high carbon tax, being pessimistic that climate change will be very costly, it would, there will be a lot of warming. So if you set a tax that is too high in that sense, that turns out to not be very costly. So a tax based on being pessimistic uh, turns out to not be very costly at all. So, so actually taxing too high is not very bad at all, taxing too low is very costly. So it's very asymmetric, okay? And, and that's kind of the key takeaway there. So um, um, I have to just check a uh, time. Uh, I'm doing okay, I think. So how do we arrive at these answers? I mean, this is the sense in which this is a macro paper. We use quantitative macro theory. Um, so we use an integrated assessment model a la Nordhaus. Um, it's actually very similar to, to Nordhaus's framework. It's a little bit more kind of easy access than his, I would say. Um, what it does is simply it has equations from natural sciences and economics and quantitative here means that these equations have parameters that are selected to match historical data. Um, and uh, what type of models are we talking about? Well, the economic model is an optimal, essentially an opti optimal saving version of Solus grow mo growth model in a market, uh, from a market with a market description with firms that maximize profits and so on. Um, uh, and then this system we can then use, uh, we can apply various policies in the system, we can uh, simulate paths for economic outcomes, for climate outcomes, and we have well-defined notions of human welfare. We can translate utility levels into observable things like consumption, uh, and so it's like a laboratory that allows us to do 
this kind of cost benefit analysis. Let me point out that this is not a model that you solve with pencil and paper. Uh, it's very simple, so you can almost solve it with a pencil and paper, but the point is not to show off a cool model. The point is that actually most people can use it and you need to do a few things on the computer, um, but not too many. Um, and I think you can go, go a long way in terms of kind of creating realistic uh, output. So <clears throat> the model description here um, contains two slides describing the model in words and then follow some equations that I, I will skip because I'm thinking if people have specific questions, I'll go back to, to those and point to equations. But um, so the key features I mentioned, it's a neoclassical growth model in a market, in a market interpretation. So discrete time, people live forever. There are R regions. R can in principle be a big, big number. I'll kind of show you later how, um, uh, how we, or, or I'll mention at least what these regions are, but they're like the US is one region, Europe is one region, uh, China is one region. Uh, we can go to much more heterogeneity, much more regional tail, but for the purpose of this, I think you only need like seven or eight regions. So all these regions they consume, um, they don't produce oil in all regions except uh, one, um, in any regions except one, uh, that is OPEC and Russia that we kind of designate as the oil, produce, uh, oil producers. So the oil producers sell oil to the rest of the world. Uh, within each region, we abstract from inequality and just have a representative agent for the purpose of this talk. It's kind of easy to add inequality and I think important for some reasons, for some purposes. <clears throat> Output is produced in uh, an extended version of this uh, solar model, like the Das Gupta Hill version with capital labor and not only an a natural resource, but an energy composite that we assume is a CES um, nest of oil and gas, um, including also um, including also kind of new versions of uh, like shale gas and stuff like that, um, coal importantly, and and green energy. So they they go into a nest CES nest, which then goes into the Cobb Douglas function. On top of that, there's a total factor productivity, productivity level of, of, of production in, in a region. And that TFP level gets a hit as modeled by Nordhaus from warming. Uh, depending on the region, the hit could be large or small. So that's a, a stand in for all the kinds of damages you get from warming. Um, capital accumulation is neoclassical. How do you produce energy? Well, we use a, here a bit of a stylized production where um, there is a constant, there's a fixed stock of oil. You can produce it for free. It doesn't really matter if it costs something because the market value is so high, you will use it all up unless you, you know, tax it at very high rates. Um, uh, so th there's that zero marginal cost. And then there's a, really huge amount of coal, um, so huge that if we use it all up, uh, it will warm the world so much that we, we're not going to that region. So essentially, um, we're gonna consider the amount of coal to be essentially infinite. Um, and how do you produce it at the marginal cost that we calibrate to prices, uh, observed prices. So coal is produced at the constant marginal cost, so is green energy. You know. At, also calibrated so that um, the prices match those we observe. There's technical change. I'll get back to technical change. You know, the forms it take can be important. Um, and the climate carbon cycle um, is nothing I will discuss here in detail. It's roughly the same as the one Nordhaus uses. Okay, so there's perfect competition. Countries or regions don't actually trade except in this oil versus other goods. Uh, so we don't disaggregate consumption goods into say agriculture and other goods, um, nor do we consider trade um, between rich countries a la Krugman. This is a very simple model in that sense. Um, governments 
just tax and run balanced budgets. There's no world government that collects money from some regions and give to others. So it's all kind of whatever is going on in terms of taxes is internal to the region. Uh, and we're going to consider tax on fossil fuel. Uh, because I'm sure it's going to come up, uh, you know, this model has many features, but there are also features the model doesn't have. So I, I mentioned that it doesn't have intertemporal trade, for example. It's, it's, it's not that uh, critical of an assumption. It doesn't have endogenous technology. So we don't look at R&D into green explicitly, but we can pick the rate of technical change in green technology as, as a parameter and see what it does. And that's an important experiment. We don't have uncertainty, but again, we can consider um, parameter values at the different intervals of what's uh, considered uh, reasonable. So the IPCC and people who do damage estimation, they have their intervals that they think cover most of the interesting cases. So we can kind of look at the extremes and that's a way of dealing with uncertainty. Finally, nonlinearities, uh, tipping points are believed to be very important and certainly there are many tipping points um, because there is nothing near a global consensus or any kind of consensus on where these tipping points might be uh, on a global scale. We cannot put them in. So what we do to deal with that is that if we are worried about the tipping point, we can raise the damages significantly to take account of and, and, and thereby capture large costs. Okay. Uh, so, so and, and the model can be made much more complicated, but I think with this simple model, you can say a lot of things. So here is here are the equations and, and let me go to the results. Um, and so here, here, here is a, a basic graph that is not the main results I wanted to show, just kind of what are some key features. This is time on the x-axis. And here are actually six different graphs. Let, let's focus on the three graph, three lines that are uh, growing the fastest. So this is global temperature starting from today. If you, have, if you do nothing, that's the blue case, no taxes, or if you do stuff only in the EU. So the first point is that if you do stuff only in the EU, it's as good as doing nothing because the EU is so small. Um, there is a red and a black, and that's, they are distinguished um, in the, in, the, in the way that CO2 taxes are broader, they cover coal and oil. The black is coal taxes, they only cover coal. So they don't cover oil. So there you, you let oil off the hook. It doesn't seem to make a difference if it's only in the EU. So what about globally? Well, globally, so comparing uh, a tax, uh, a global tax, on CO2 or coal. And I have to tell you what the level is of the tax here. So here we don't use the optimal tax. Uh, we use the tax that corresponds roughly to the price of the EU trading rights right now. So suppose we were to use those all over in the world at equal rates, okay? Uh, the warming would not be eight degrees like in the case of no taxes, but the warming would be substantially smaller. So even the EU tax, which I think most people who are uh, worried about climate change claim this is, uh, this is way too low, you should have a much higher rate. Well, maybe you should, but we should note that you get an enormous kick from using that rate compared to using nothing. Uh, the fact that purple and green are on top of each other reflects uh, the insight that it doesn't matter actually if you if you uh, tax oil uh, or not. Why? Because there's not that much oil around. Um, uh, so burning it all up or not doesn't have a major effect on, on the climate. Uh, the last case is the Swedish carbon, carbon tax, which is high, which is at the level where many people would say, oh, this is a reasonable level. Okay. And if you use that globally, then we're down to two degrees, not one and a half, but two. Okay by the end of uh, uh, the 20, 22nd century, all right? Uh, so this is like some basics that taxing only in the EU uh, doesn't help at all. 
we should not uh, get hung up on oil, we should focus on coal, and a modest tax is, is very, very helpful, um, even though it's not as high as many people say, which, uh, including me, say we should uh, tax. Okay, so here's the bad policy number one. So I have three bad policies. The first one was tax globally at the same rate everywhere, but use the wrong level. So the black curve is five minutes left. Yes. Yes. Uh, the black curve, thank you. The black curve shows you uh, the consumption equivalent loss over time of using a tax that is based on being optimistic, thinking that we won't have much trouble uh, with climate change. It won't be very big and or the damages are very small. Okay. Well, it turns out if that's wrong. The, and, and what do I mean by high tax? I mean at the right end of the... In, uh, uh, sorry. What do I mean by not taxing? Here, let's say we don't tax at all. The black, think of that as no tax. Uh, but reality is that we that things are bad, um, unlike our expectations. So reality is that the, the warming is, is at the right end of the interval uh, indicated by the IPCC, IPCC, and the damages per unit of warming are at the right end of the interval given by all those people estimating damages. So if those things happen, well, these are the costs from thinking this is not gonna be bad. So they are huge. 25% of, of global consumption, essentially at, in perpetuity is, is, is huge, huge. Uh, whereas if you do the reverse, you, you tax at the rate, thinking things are gonna be very bad. So you use a very high tax. In fact, uh, uh, it's not bad, uh, then you're making a loss because this red line is above zero, but it's not very big. Uh, and, and the intuition here is that in the baseline on the behind the black line is a big market failure to start with. So if you don't deal with it, it's big. Okay, it's a big cost. The, the red line is that, well, here, uh, there is no market failure. You're taxing anyway, but you know that taxing around the optimum is okay, and the optimum is kind of flat. So you can go quite far from the optimum, and it's not very costly. So that's kind of what's behind that picture. Conclusion being, uh, be cautious. Second point, let's use a non-uniform carbon tax. In this case, I'm letting both Africa and India not tax carbon. Um, the case of China is even worse than this, but anyway, this is good enough for illustration. Uh, and then we let all the other regions tax a little bit more so as to so as to meet the same target. So here we pick the target of 2.6 degrees by 2165. This is a bit arbitrary, but... And then we find that, okay, Africa and in India, here you see the regions, they gain, but only a couple of percentage points in consumption terms. The other regions, lose a lot, the EU is more actually, and the total loss is huge. So, you know, this is clearly not something we'd like to do because there must be ways to compensate for these small gains here um, and, and, and do and follow more efficient policy. If I showed you the Chinese case, it would be even more striking. Yes, 44, uh, and I have one minute to do the last example here. Suppose there's no pigu tax, but we make green technology more productive over time relative to everything else by 2% per year. Here's the temperature path. And let me only compare the green to the cloud down here. The green is that we are somehow, we're not explaining how, but we're engineering faster production of green technology than the rest of the economy, certainly than fossil by 2% by per year, which is really accumulating. What, does hap what happens to temperature? Well, temperature goes up much more than if you would say tax carbon or um, um, than if actually you would have slow technology growth in coal. Why? Because available estimates actually suggest that green and fossil viewed globally are not very close substitutes. It's easy to come up with cases based on your private life that you can get rid of the car and bike or, or drive an electric car. But if you look globally at the kinds of energy 
needs we have, the substitution elasticities are not that huge. So if you help green, what you do is you increase energy use overall, but it's a very bad substitute for taxing coal, which is what we want to do. The whole point of green technology is to tax coal through the back door. And just available elasticities for substitution suggest it's not gonna work. Maybe it works, but it's hazardous. Okay, that's it. I mainly just want to say, I, I find this a very productive area for economists, especially for us macroeconomists. And there are lots of surprising answers to the even most basic questions in my experience. And people just haven't done the work and we should all join in. So thanks. Uh, I might have gone over by one minute, sorry. No, no, that's fine. Thank you, Per. Uh, there have been a few questions um, in the in the chat. Uh, maybe I can ask Hector. He had two questions that he placed. Hector, do you want to uh, speak your questions, or shall I summarize them for you? Okay. So let me uh, let me um, sort of uh, ask his questions. He asks, how robust are are the results? to alternative assumptions of TFP. Um, in particular, if you were to accept uh, endogenous technical change in energy over the medium to long run, would this make a difference to your results? Um, well, it depends on exactly what you mean, but I mean, so we have, um, so one, one assumption we make is Cobb Douglas in energy uh, and, and in all the rest. So, um, um, so I'm going to ask the TF answer the TFP question, but um, so it turns out that if you know if you um, lower energy use, in particular fossil energy use, uh, very abruptly, output would would fall. I mean, this is so in the short run, it looks like uh, capital and labor and energy are very poor substitutes, actually. Uh, you can see this from looking at the price of oil when it goes up in the data, the, the share of oil costs in firms goes up. So it looks like price follows shares. And that look, that suggests it's Leontief. It's a, it's a very complementary input. But uh, so what, what firms do in response to price changes is that they save on this stuff. They come up with ways of not having to use so much oil. They come up with alternative products that don't use it. So, so kind of, if you look more at the share uh, and how it responds over longer periods of time, then you, Cobb Douglas is not maybe perfect assumption, but it's, it's not bad. So behind the Cobb Douglas production function, I would say there is, there is a t endogenous technical change in saving on energy. So that's not fully an answer to your question, but it looks like I have no endogenous technical change, but I'm saying the Cobb Douglas assumption embodies that in a way, uh, because I think in a very short run, it's for sure not called Douglas. So it's kind of by thinking endogenous en energy. Then I think endogenous green and so on. I, we, we think of that as being part of the energy bundle, not so much about the TFP. TFP is more, uh, it's Nordhaus's way of capturing all the kinds of damages we have. So what, shows up in TFP is what's interest, interesting is, is, um, is the damage. And, and the damages don't directly reflect green technology. It's, some people say green technology is the way of the future. With more green technology, we'll have you know wonderful new world. But that's not going to happen by increasing TFP. It's going to happen by simply having more energy available. If, if it's so good, like solar, if we can use it very efficiently, great, we have more energy. But it will not show up in TFP, it will be like an input. So that's my attempt. Okay, thank you. There have been a couple of questions about coal. Um, so one of these is, what's the intuition that only coal matters, not oil? And the second asks, since it's all about coal, can we compare prohibition of coal production with a tax on coal? Uh, yeah, I mean, so the first question is, what's the intuition? The intuition is, first of all, oil and coal are equally bad kind of 
per unit of carbon, there's no difference. Both hurt the climate. So it's not that coal uh, is a worse carbon. It is essentially the same thing as oil. But uh, the market value of oil is much higher than uh, the market value of coal. Why? Because oil is a much more useful uh, source of energy. Um, and so, <clears throat> and there isn't that much oil. That's the point that if, even if you use up all the, and I might say oil, I mean conventional oil. Sometimes people include the oil that's really deep uh, down the oceans, for example, but it's very expensive to take up. So there it's more like you could, I compare it to coal, but conventional oil, there's still a fair amount left, but it's so efficient and there's not so much left of it that it doesn't really matter if we, it doesn't actually matter if we tax it or not. It's efficient to tax it, but all that's gonna do is postpone a little bit its use. It's gonna be used up no matter what. Um, and that will only be a small effect on global uh, global climate. And, um, and then the question was, can we prohibit coal? Sure we can, but, um, I think if we put if we use quantity restrictions like prohibiting stopping coal entirely, large parts of the world will will go under. So it's we we cannot cut fossil fuels to zero. We will have to limit it substantially. So a good system for that is to tax. Alternatively, if you know the right quantity, you can do the European trading system and have a, a given cap on the amount. And then people can trade within them uh, who gets to use that oil within the within the limit and that works equally well but um, it's kind of all coming down it's equivalent to, to taxing at a certain rate um. yeah um another question uh, actually this is the first question that came up do you include prohibitions in particular banning cars when you're talking about green energy in the model um, I mean, no, green, green energy just means make, in the case of cars, make them available, uh, make the production of batteries and cars that run on um, electric batteries, batteries available at the lower cost. That's that we include uh, in our model. Uh, we don't, we don't explicitly pro use prohibition regulate uh, regulation in the model instead we compare with just various levels of the tax tax a tax wouldn't unless it's you know enormous wouldn't get rid of all of the use of cars and i as an economist if you ask me is it efficient from a society perspective that i drive my car to work today um, well, I have to think about it. Maybe. I mean, it, it's, it's my car is a, is a diesel car. I don't use it much, but uh, do I find it efficient from not from my selfish point of view, but society to drive it to work today? I, I think it does because um, if I do, there's some big value of it that I, in, in this case, I avoid <laughs> transmitting COVID back and forth in the subway. Uh, I always take the subway otherwise, but, you know, so I think prohibition, I think, is not the right answer. And it's it's way too costly. If you go for prohibition, you know, the world's populations will just say no and uh, the, the world will get hotter. So, um, so I think you have to kind of find the smart way of um, of getting rid of fossil, fossil energy. And it is actually to tax it. Sorry for long answers to short no, questions. No, that's, <laughs> that's fine. The, there's one uh, more specific question and a more um, sort of discursive question. This is a specific question from Angus is there is good evidence that we discount the future hyperbolically. Can you say how sensitive is the cost of taxes if we change uh, to such preferences in the model? Yeah. I. <clears throat> Um, I don't. I don't think um, the, the 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 discounting uh, is important if you want to calculate the optimal carbon tax. Okay, 
So it's kind of well known that um, it's well known that uh, for for a very strong discounting, when you don't care much about the future, you know, you shouldn't have a very high tax and vice versa. But uh, whether it's hyperbolic or not, I think it's not critical. But my point here is that it's not really so relevant to calculate the, the size of the optimal tax correctly. Why? Because as I showed in this graph um, here, uh, maybe you could argue the optimal tax is here, or if you follow the Stern report, it's about the Swedish um, turquoise level. Okay, it's based on very low discounting, but you know, the reality is here. <laughs> That's the path we're on. Uh, you know, we're down here already, but if we don't tax, so it's it's not so, I don't think it's very fruitful to discuss exactly how high can I make that carbon tax if I assume some type of discounting or other. The key thing is, is this is where we're heading if we don't tax carbon. If you tax carbon at the modest level, you, 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 you do the world a fantastic favor for future, future generations. There's no quibble with that. Um, so to me, it's like I'm pushing the question aside a little bit. Uh, because I don't think it's critical. Um, it's critical for calculating the correct level of the optimal tax. Um, but it's also philosophical if you agree or you don't agree, but anyway. But we're so far from that, that economists need to educate the world like what, uh, why our proposals are good, not exactly the level. Great, so uh, Per, that is a great link into the last question. A couple of minutes, please, on this. Um, so Hector asks, do you think economists only enter into a problem once it is already acknowledged by the other sciences, other disciplines? And could economists do more to quantify um, climate change and uh, to measure the size of the problem? I focused on macroeconomists today because this is a macro conference. Um, and so on purpose, I stayed away. I, I think one of our main um, tasks is to measure, um, is to measure systematically the effects of climate change around the world. One is to measure also the costs of, you know, taxing around the world. Because notice in France and elsewhere, large parts of the population don't like proposals to tax carbon. So we need to also measure and say, OK, it's not that bad, or if this is true, which I think. We need to do careful measurements on both the sides of damages and costs. And we know how to do it. Other people don't know how to do it. Oh, other people, I should say. Natural scientists are not equipped to do this. And so here, I think we need to uh, be ahead of, of others. I think climate change, climate climate science is actually a new science, relatively new science. Um, and Nordhaus entered it in the 80s and uh, he was alone, but I don't know, we we're, we're a few decades behind, but at that point, climate science was relatively new. So we're a little bit behind, but I think we now need to step up. I think it's a obviously world recognized problem and we need to show the other scientists what we can do as economic scientists. and. These are very useful. I think cost benefit analysis is central and it takes all this measurement. Uh, otherwise you can't do it. Cost measurement is about, it cost benefits is about numbers. It's not about like stylized quant qualitative equations or anything. It's, you know, you get, you have to sit down and do numbers and that's what we should do. Okay, thank you, Per. Um, there is another question. I, I think people can keep posting, but we are running out of time. So I'd like to thank you very much. Um, you. It was, yes, it was a really interesting talk. Um, if I can now ask Matthias Trabant. Uh, Matthias will be talking about macroeconomics and pandemics. So over to you, Matthias. Thank you. Um... So let me just load up my slides. Um, um, okay, can you see my slides? And can you hear me? 
Yes, we can. Yes. All right. So then I'm taking it away. Well, um, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation to um, talk at today's conference. It's really a big pleasure and honor uh, to be here today. Um, uh, Alex uh, asked me to um, you know, talk about some of my work that I did since uh, you know the COVID crisis uh, you know started. And so that's what I'm going to do in the next, uh, you know, 30, 30 minutes. Um, uh, the, the first paper that we wrote, uh, we meaning Marty Eichenbaum, Sergio Rebello and I, is titled The Macroeconomic of Epidemics. And um, it's the starting point of, um, of a research agenda that uh, we've been pursuing uh, since we started, uh, you know, working on this since in early March. Um, so what is this paper all about? Well, <clears throat> epidemiology models are, are widely used to predict the cores of, of epidemics in general, in particular the ongoing COVID epidemic. Um, we think that these models are very useful, um, although they typically do not allow for a crucial two-way interaction between economic decisions and rates of infections. And this paper is basically trying to, you know, merge in an epidemiology approach with a macro approach in a particular way. Okay. Now, why do we think this two-way interaction may be important? Well, on the one hand, the epidemic causes a recession as people cut back on their shopping to, you know, reduce their, you know, chances of getting infected. And, you know, we have empirical evidence by chatting others that actually supports that. Uh, conversely, the number of people that go to work or go shopping then influences the rate at which the inf 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 infection spreads. So there's this two-way mutual interaction that we argue is crucial. And uh, how important it is is something that we're trying to answer in this paper. Uh, related to that, we are also uh, answering, you know, trying to answer what macroeconomic policies should a government pursue in an epidemic? So should the government step in in any way and why and how? All right, so uh, this leads us then to, you know, the, the model that we've put together in this paper. The point of the departure is a standard epidemiology model by uh, an SIR model by Kermick and McKendrick, where the uh, transition probabilities are exogenous uh, and, and we're gonna endogenize them, okay? There's a continuum of agents of measure one and the population is divided into four groups. There's gonna be susceptible people. So those that have been, uh, you know, not exposed to the disease yet, they are gonna be infected people that have contracted the disease. There's gonna be uh, recovered people that you know had the virus and have you know recovered and are healthy again and then there are the fraction of the deceased people unfortunately so who die from the uh, disease prior to the epidemic the macro economy looks like this uh, everybody's identical and maximizes the present value utility of consumption so they have preferences over consumption and they dislike to work you know? budget wise um, we have that uh, agents have labor income they receive some transfers in order to finance their stream of consumption and very similar to what pear has just uh, uh, taught, taught, talked about you know we are in entering a Pigouvian tax here uh, mu is a is a Pigouvian tax and it's what we call a proxy in this paper as a containment measures that reduce social interactions so from now on i'm going to talk about mu as the so-called containment rate um, production is going to be uh, is competitive here with representative firms that have a linear production technology and labor and 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 produce consumption goods. Now this model is very very stylized, very simple in order to really dissect and get to the gist of sort of say the mechanisms. Uh, in about 15 minutes, I'm going to you know show you what happens if you extend this model to allow for say features like capital accumulation, agent heterogeneity. All these things are you know things that are going to cover you know at the at a later point of my presentation. Um, so we're keeping this very simple on purpose to really be able to zero in on what's the what is what what are the important dimensions to to think about. Uh, population dynamics are now, you know, how do how do we, you know, we want to combine now the macro economy that I just described pre-epidemic and the SIR, the Kermick McKendrick and you know, Epi model, and this is sort of say the way to do this or how we do this in this paper is that the newly infected people, so the people that have, you know, are catching the virus, you know, they're they're given by a so-called transmission function. So the newly infected people T, you can become infected via three channels in this model. You can become infected because of consumption related activities you go out to a shopping mall you contract the virus there you can get the virus by going to work or you can get the virus by you know general interactions you're running you know you're using the subway you're touching contaminated surfaces and so forth okay now on the consumption part how do consumption infections you know are generated well these are random meetings between the susceptible people that that go shopping and the infected people that go shopping these are random meetings between the two and pi one is a parameter and so these are the the, the number of infections that are generated by just going to the mall 
Um, likewise, on the labor part, we have the number of susceptible people that go to work that ha don't have the, 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 the virus yet and how they are interacting with people that go to work and do have the virus. And, and that creates random meetings and creates uh, new infections. And likewise, SNI here is just these are the random interactions between susceptible and infected people, you know, in the park or in the subway and so forth. All right. So that's how you how the model creates, quote unquote, these uh, new infections. Then the number of susceptible people tomorrow is today's susceptible people minus the newly infected people that have been removed from the, from the pool of susceptibles. Infected people remain infected, you know, in the next period, um, from, from the last period, that there, there's the new arrival, so to say, of newly infected people. And then there are uh, two things that happen in this model. There's a fraction of uh, pi r of the people who had been infected who recover from the infection. So they're going to be removed from the pool of infectedness. And unfortunately, and sadly, there are also people passing away in the model from the infection so with probability pi d people do uh, do or die um, the number of recovered people is uh, tomorrow is today's recovered people plus the, the the number of people who had the virus and have recovered and then the number of deceased people again it's just a stock keeping exercise here the number of deceased people in the, today plus those who actually have passed away unfortunately all right. Now, what are the choices? How people? How do people make choices? Which is at the core of our analysis. Well, the utility in all these people in our model, susceptible, infected, and recovered, they they take decisions. They they're maximizing the present value utility out of uh, consumption and labor contemporaneously, and taking into account that life goes on. There's continuation value. With the probability one minus tau, a susceptible person didn't catch the virus and remains susceptible. With a probability tau, the person this does catch the virus and isn't becomes an infected people tomorrow. And it takes into account that uh, its decisions on consumption and work is affecting his or her probability of getting an infection. So if you cut your consumption, you're going to reduce your probability of catching the virus. If you if you go less to work, you're going to cut your probability of getting getting the virus. Okay. Um, the structure is very similar on all the other you know, infected and recovered people. So I'm going to skip that for time reasons. Budget constraints is something that I have ex explained also in previous slides. Okay. Now, when we take that model and we, uh, you know, we want to sort of say uh, calculate it just as Pierre said, this is not a, you know, done on pencil and paper type models. We want to do quantitative analysis here. So we calibrate this model on a weekly parameterization. We set the mortality rate to point uh, to half a percent based on Korea and then US data. We match statistics from the US economy prior to the epidemic. Um, and um, we, 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 uh, one of the statistics that we are matching is the value, the statistical value of life as used by US government agents agencies, which is a 9.3 million, and that the model replicates all these kind of features, okay? Um, we just, we, we, of course, you know, uh, discuss robustness of our results along many dimensions, and uh, I referred to interested people to, you know, take a look at, to, at the paper for, for a long section with uh, robustness analysis. Uh, what's, of course, important is the transmission function. So how are we calibrating these parameters, pi 1, pi 2, and pi 3? And you know, we were we very explicit about this in the paper, um, you know, using data from Ferguson, from the BLS, and from, you know, from Lee, um, we are, we are uh, backing, uh, verifying in the data that one sixth of the new infections are due to consumption, one sixth of the new infections are due to work, and the remaining two thirds are due to the general infections. Then we are also, you know, structuring our parameters such that, you know, eventually 60% of the population recovers or dies from the infections in the simple SIR model. Okay? Again, robustness is discussed in the paper. All right. Well, that's it basically you know, in terms of the model, we're like marrying a standard macro model with a SIR model. Now let's take a look now what these what the model does predict quantitatively. This figure gives us um, the, the standard SIR model. So that's the model where there's no economic actions taken into account. So a pure epidemiology model, if you like, our starting point. And what happens if you combine that with the macro approach? You know, the, the plot just illustrates the differences between the two. A pure SIR model means that there are, there are infections going up, susceptible, it's kind of fall eventually to you know 40 percent you're going to see people passing away unfortunately because of the virus there's a little bit of a fall in aggregate activity here but that's just by you know people being sick they're not going to work and so those people actually who fall sick they are being removed from the labor market at least in part and so that means there's a slowdown in consumption hours by contrast you know in the model that actually has this two-way interaction between the macro economy and the epidemiology part you see there is there the, the, the dynamics are different uh, more importantly you see that the number of people 
people dying in the economy where you take that two-way interaction to account is smaller than the, than in the, in the very in the mechanical you know epidemiology approach you know? how is that basically being generated well it's generated by the model people cutting back on their consumption and work in order to protect themselves to you know not catching the virus and exposing themselves to the virus okay so in other words this is the trade-off that this model you know embeds now that you know, cutting back economic activity generates sizable recessions at the benefit of fewer people passing away. That's sort of say what this model is, is, is illustrating here. Now, when you think at this from this level, then you know what macroeconomists typically want to do is they want to think about okay, what what is it? Is this a supply side effect, a, a demand side effect? Well, actually, the model has both. You know that simulation that I just showed you embeds a supply side and a demand side channel. Okay, the so supply side effect is that people, you know, that the ep epidemic exposes people who are working to the virus, and so people cut back on reducing their labor supply in order to not contract the virus as much. Likewise, there is a demand effect now that the epidemic exposes people who are purchasing consumption goods and people are going to cut back on that one so there's a demand effect and in this what's so special about this epidemic uh, through the lens of this model is that there are both demand and supply effects at work at the same time that generate this sizable recession now with this in mind, what I've shown you so far is what, what macroeconomists call a competitive equilibrium. So this is there's no government intervention here. Okay? Um, I started out my talk at that the question is, is there any scope for the government to intervene? And um, at the heart of, of, this, of this environment is that there is an infection externality, very similar to the pollution externality that Apera was talking about in his talk uh, you know, a, a little you know, and, and half an hour ago. So what is this infection externality? Now, people who are infected with the virus do not fully internalize that you know, their consumption and work decisions actually influence the spread of the virus and influence other people's likelihood of actually getting, uh, you know, dying and passing away because of the virus. You know, you, you're infected, you, you go shopping, and you don't really internalize that with your activity, you're, you're harming other people and, and may actually lead to death of other people. So that's a classic externality here. And, you know, the question is, you know, what policies should the government pursue to deal with this classic externality? And the paper offers two answers to that. A simple approach, again, very similar to what Per was talking about, a similar a one fits all type suboptimal policy and a very kind of detailed optimal policy. And I want to contrast both. Okay? So what we call simple containment is that we're calculating a, a path for mu, the containment rate that maximizes social welfare. And that, you know, that, that containment Containment is the same for all people. Whether you are susceptible, infected, or recovered, you all face the same, you know, containment. Okay? What this gives you is gives you a very sharp trade-off between economic activity and health outcomes. You know, you, you're ramping up containment, you exacerbate the recession at the benefit of reducing the death toll in the economy due to the epidemic. So let me illustrate these words in a graph. The blue line is the basic CER model that we've seen before. It's the model that you know it takes into account agents' decisions, so people cut back on consumption and work in order to you know reduce, so to say, the death toll. The black broken line now is different, you know, economy. It's the economy when we're choosing what is the containment rate mu that maximizes social welfare. And the dynamic is such that the, the containment is ramped up over time uh, and, and then gradually you know, recedes. Right? That's the optimal containment rate. And what it does it is it makes the recession worse. People cut back more on their consumption. Right? It's basically a partial lockdown, if you think about it, at the benefit of fewer people passing away. Right? And the optimal pattern is such that you know, there is a trade-off that balances these two effects. And there's fewer infections, of course, and thereby also fewer deaths. This is the basic model that we are having. Now, we also consider an extension of this model that maybe has more to do, that basically reflects on a few more dimensions along what we have observed in reality. First, we are including what we call medical preparedness or uh, limitations in the capacity of the healthcare system. Okay? So in other words, when what we saw in Italy, say, or in New York City, you know, the mortality rate can really go up steeply as the number of infections really kind of skyrocks and the healthcare system becomes overburdened. Okay? And we take that into account in, in an extended version that we call the benchmark ERT model. We also take into account that you know there's maybe a treatment that has been developed, a medicine that is developed, and there's a probability de delta C that that medicine is actually being de you know detected. Mm -hmm. And finally, we also include the, the possibility that the, that the society develops a vaccine with a probability delta V. 
And then what we're doing is we're putting all these three ingredients into the model and rerun our simulation. And let me just give you the key figure that we have here, which is, so to say, the benchmark model. Uh, the, the blue line, again, is the competitive equilibrium. Hands off, no government interaction, no government intervention. You see a sizable recession now even deeper, even bigger uh, in the competitive equilibrium compared to the basic model uh, because of the deterioration of the healthcare system. Uh, we have more death uh, because of that. Okay. The black line is now what happens with containment. What is optimal containment you know, now in this environment. And you see that, um, you know, again, there is this trade-off. You engineer a deeper recession that's hurting the economy, but at the benefit of fewer people passing away. What's interesting is now containment is more upfront, is more front-loaded. Even though the epidemic hasn't really started, you, know, the, the, you, you still want to start containment really early on because basically you want to buy time until a vaccine is developed and found. Okay? So you want to try to preserve as many people possible possible at the cost of a bigger recession, but you do that because there is now the chance that actually a vaccine is, uh, is, is, is arriving in time. Okay. All right. Now, so that's one type of, you know, a, a containment, namely one fits all type containment, you know, the, the entire economy is subject to this new C. You could ask, uh, you know, is there a smarter way to con do to containment? Is there some way that a social planner would basically be able to sort of say improve on that? And yes, there is. And that's what we call smart containment, um, when the planner would actually be able to treat people differently. So it would be able to treat susceptible people different than infected people, different than recovered people. If the plan had the ability to identify these three sets of different people and would be able to you know, treat them differently, then you know, it would actually improve. Okay? So that's what we call smart containment. So we're maximizing social welfare you know, to, uh, such that you know, to take into account the differences in, these, in, in the three people. Now, what happens now is that there's basically no trade-off any longer between activity and health outcomes. Okay? Why is that? Well, what the planner would do is it would isolate the infected people from the economy. It would you know, isolate those people. They wouldn't be allowed to go to work and to leave the house. And thereby, it would isolate the economy from the virus very quickly. And so there would be no costs associated with the recession, basically, quantitatively. Okay? So in other words, you know, we have a very, very kind of mild effect of, of, this, of the epidemic if the government is able to identify people. Okay? Now, what must happen here, of course, is the government must be able to identify the individuals who is infected, who is recovered, and so forth. And in this model, it's easy to do that because you know health status is unknown. But of course, that's sort of say something that's very complicated in the reality of your life. Okay? But that motivated us to write a second paper that actually takes up now the challenge of bringing in that the health status isn't very easily observable by the government. Okay? So in this paper, it's called The Macroeconomics of Testing and Quarantines. You know, we do one thing relative to the earlier paper I just discussed, namely that we are allowing that uh, you know, not everybody can observe his or her uh, health status you know, with certainty. Okay? So we introduce a testing structure. So first of all, the health status is unknown, and we introduce a testing structure, a testing infrastructure to test people. And be, uh, on, uh, conditional on testing, you, you then be able to identify people at least in part. Okay? There's three key results from this follow-up work. First is that testing without quarantines can really worsen the economic, uh, economic and health repercussions of the epidemic. So just testing people and letting people know that, oh, you're infected and you're not infected, and that's even worse. You know, people are just going to you know, go free right now. The second result is that once you combine testing with quarantines or isolations, that has used very large social benefits. It basically leads to an amelioration of the trade-offs between economic activity and health outcomes. And I'll, I'll show you a picture next that actually illustrates that point. And then the third result is that you know, temporary you know, immunity, if you think about the virus mutating, or that you, people lose their antibodies, you know, with that environment, you know, then testing and quarantining has huge, humongous social benefits. Okay? So let me first illustrate key result number two with one graph, and then uh, key result number three in the next graph. Okay? So here's two. The blue line is our competitive equilibrium where people don't know their health status. And you see they're cutting back on consumption and hours as before. You have, unfortunately, people passing away. The red line is what happens if the government tests and you allow smart containment. Okay? So you're basically containing the infected. So you test people. Those who have been tested positive, they are contained, isolated at home. And then what you see is that the recession is much smaller and there's fewer people dying. So the trade-off basically starts to disappear. The trade-off between death and economic activity you know, ameliorates. Now, there is a gray broken line here, what we call model with testing and strict containment, meaning that you test, but then people don't, are not allowed to go to the shopping mall, they're not allowed to go to work, but they're also not allowed to leave the house. It's like, 
it's a very strict type of containment. Okay, so really kind of locked into your apartment, you're not allowed to leave it. Then you basically see the trade off disappears altogether. There's a minimal recession here, and there's a you know small amount of death you know that actually happened in the economy. So long story short, testing is really beneficial in basically you know removing the trade off between health outcomes and economic activities if combined with with quarantines. Now, the, 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 in this paper, the final plot that I would like to spend is res illustrating result number three, namely what happens if the economy sh shows recurrent infections by virus mutations or by uh, people losing their Im immune um, you know, antibodies. The blue line is the competitive equilibrium. And you see in the competitive equilibrium, if the government doesn't do anything, we have an epidemic, a, a wave, and then we're gonna get a second wave, a third wave. You know, after about two years, you know, these, these waves do disappear. So we have this oscillation waves in terms of you know the economy in terms of the the epidemic you know raging because of these reinfections you know taking place and you see that the death toll can be really substantial because every wave adds to the death toll now you see with testing if you have a testing infrastructure then then, then basically it's a it, you know the trade-off disappears altogether it's huge social benefits you can stabilize the number of people that's dying like at a very very low level and you have basically no recession to speak of Okay, so one way to think about what this paper argues is that building a testing infrastructure together with a, you know, quarantining containment infrastructure, you know, it really has humongous social benefits, especially when there are recurrent infections. All right, good. So that's uh, that's this 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 work now. Uh, I alluded to this early on is these are very simple and stylized models and one of course pressing question is you know how, how, what happens if you make the model maybe more complicated and some people may say even more realistic and so that's sort of say what I'm going to do in the next two papers that are going to cover here briefly. Uh, the third paper we have written is doing one thing it allows to uh, it, it now for allowing for capital accumulation so there's physical investment that we put in into the model and capital accumulation and we also put in nominal rigidity so that prices do adjust slow Slowly, in a, in a slowly and in a staggered manner. So there's also monetary policy in this model. It's a central bank there that controls the normal interest rate. So if you think about this, it's more like a new Keynesian type, you know, environment. And we show that in this work, in this paper, that our conclusions from the preceding two papers are robust to the extension of the model to incorporate, in, you know, investment and 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 nominal rigidities. What's interesting, what we show in this paper is once you bring in investment into the picture, that the model generates a fall now in consumption as well as in investment. And what's interesting is that in the model, investment and consumption fall by a similar amount. So they fall by the same mar you know, amount, basically, about 8 to 10%. And interestingly, that's something that we actually have observed in the data. And that's a very unusual effect that we see in the data in the current crisis. Typically in recessions, you see investment falling much more than consumption. Investment typically, you know, really falls like a rock in deep recessions and consumption just falls mildly. You know, in the current data, you know, recession, recession, consumption falls by as much as investment. And the model basically allows us to address that. Um, again, it's the supply and demand effects that I alluded to early on that have now similar impacts on investment and consumption spending. And the model illustrates it very nicely. All right. The remaining 10 minutes of my time, I'd like to uh, talk about the very latest project that uh, we have uh, done, which is co-authored co now with two additional co-authors. One is Miguel Godinho de Matos and uh, Francisco de Lima. Francisco is, uh, and, and since the affiliations of those co-authors you know, are with a statistical agency, of course, the views in this paper are not reflecting any of the views of the, of, of the institutions that these authors are working in. Okay. We are we are illustrating in this this what this paper does it it does it it looks a very very data driven approach so we're using a unique administrative micro data set to shed light on 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 people's behavior in the crisis. Okay. Uh, so um, a central question that in, in economics is how do people respond to risk and here we have in mind to you know for fatality risk from the COVID recession. Okay. And, and how you know, can governments actually rely on people to take actions that are commensurate with the risks associated with sort of say events like for instance, epidemic, environmental disasters, terrorism and so forth. Okay? Um, the outbreak of the COVID-19 epidemic provides us with what we think about a, a natural experiment. Ex ante, the epidemic is a very rare event. And during the epidemic, death is still a seemingly small probability event for people. So it's a small probability event, the epidemic, and we want to understand how do people re respond and react to that event. 
And, and are they taking precautions to deal with the risk that the pet epidemic exposes them? Uh, you know, are they taking appropriate measures or is there no scope for government intervention to take place? Now, we think this is a natural experiment to really be worth considering is namely that the probability of dying from COVID differs across people. So it differs depending on your age group. The fatality rate of young is very small, uh, uh, but for older people, you know, 60, 70 and older than 80, the fatality rate is very high. So people have very different fatality rates okay? and people could, and we are understanding, are people diff taking different precautions? Okay? People can cut their consumption you know, on goods and services that require social contact. And we are inter interested in are the young and the old taking different measures to protect themselves against the, the, the fatality risk, you know, associated with COVID. Now, how do we do this in this paper? We're using a, a unique administrative data set um, that, that, you know, allows us to uh, study how did the young and the old, uh, you know, change their consumption in response to the recession. Um, so what is this administrative data set? It's a data set from Portugal. It includes, so to say, the an anonymized monthly data on, on individual itemized consumer expenditures. We have data for all ages, uh, for all people's, for people's age, income, gender, and even education and occupation. It's the, the data that comprises the entire universe of the po Portuguese population, anonymized, I should emphasize again, right? And we're drawing a subsample of 500,000. Now we have individual monthly consumption expenditures of each person per week in our sample. Okay? And these expenditure data are not report, you know, based on self-reporting. No, they are, uh, they are based on firms' reporting of tax, VAT tax reporting. So every receipt can be matched to a particular person as it contains its anonymized fiscal number. Okay? So we have really precise, extremely precise data on that dimension. All right, so um, we are estimating a fixed effects model. And uh, what that fixed effects model basically does is it regresses the expenditures that we have for each individual at point T on a couple of dummies. I have five more minutes, I guess, Yuma, right? Perfect, that's great timing. Thank you so much. Um, so I have, we are regressing the lock expenditures of each individual on you know, year and, and month dum monthly dummies and some you know, individual fixed effects and stuff like that, all not so interesting. What's really important is the delta M and the delta MG parameters here. So after is an indicator function that takes the value zero before the epidemic and starting with the value one thereafter. So delta M gives us how, how much are people changing their consumption of the young cohort? of people in the young cohort. Delta M gives us what's the differential change in consumption or expenditures of all age groups that are older than 49 years. Now, I could give you a big table with the coefficient results. Let me give you a little graph that actually illustrates this maybe in a better you know, intuitive way. The key result is that in the data, the old respond by more than the young. Okay. In particular, here are the coefficients on the x-axis, and you see in the month of March, April, and May, it's the old cohort that cut back their consumption by about 50%, and we can estimate that very precisely. The young, by contrast, they also you know, cut their consumption, but they cut it by only about 30%. So long story short, it's in the microdata you know, that what we see is the young cut their consumption by much more than the old. Okay. Now, once you get into this epidemic, once you get into the empirical work, there's of course a plethora of robustness analysis, and we'll we'll we address them in the paper. So we are you know cutting this into high and low contact goods, you know taking into account how much containment actually was likely to have so to say affected the individual's choices. We are controlling for income differences. We are controlling for comorbidity effects. We are looking at retirees and public servants uh, instead of public servants. Uh, we have we look at alternative models for seasonal and trends. Long story short, all these robust you know, result basically give us the same message to all cut their consumption by more than the young. Why? In order to cut back on their, uh, on their likelihood of catching the virus. What we then do is we are crafting a model in the second part of the paper, and this will be extremely brief now. We're just asking, can a standard model of risk taking explain what we saw in the data? Okay. And, and um, that model has, uh, has, has a couple of features that I just want to brush over, and I'm going to go right to the model results. Uh, there's two age groups, young and the old. There's Epstein's in preferences to model you know, risk. We have stochastic aging. Uh, we have natural and epidemic mortality risk. Okay? And then we combine again that standard model of risk taking with an epidemic epidemiology model, the standard SIR framework, where we have the four possible health states from before. Okay? Um, I'm going to skip over this, but you know what people can do again by by changing their consumption, they can change in the model their likelihood or probability of catching the virus. That's really what's key. 
And then the model does a very good job in addressing or explaining the data that we saw, the microdata. Okay? The model accounts well uh, for the cuts in consumption of the young and the old that we have observed in the actual data. Okay? The top panel has consumption of the young. You see in the data in March, April, and May, the drops of their consumption in the data. And the model does a good job here by taking the epidemic and containment into account. By contrast, the old, they drop their consumption much more in the data, and so do they in the model. Now, the model allows us now to rip apart, if you like, the epidemic and the containment that took place okay, at the same time. So when we simulate the model with only the containment, and so in the model as a counterfactual simulation, switch off epidemic. So just pretend the government does containment, but there wasn't actually an epidemic. What happens then is that the adjustments are symmetric. So the old and the young, they basically cut their consumption by a very similar amount. So the bottom line is it's really the epidemic that caused the differential responses in people's reactions. Okay? So the difference in the behavior of the young and old really is reflected by the inflection risk, not by containment in the first place. All right, I'm going to my conclusions here. So um, this paper has highlighted that the small probability events you know, play an important role in many economic models. And now the focus of policy debates such as, you know, not only on, on, on issues like, for instance, epidemic, but environmental disasters, terrorism, all these small probability events. And we want to know how do people cope with these, you know, with these events. Now, to model the people's behavior with respect to such events, it remains really a controversial issue. It's not, you know, it's a big debate out there. What, how do we model these rare small probability events? Okay. Our results suggest that people responded in a way that is commensurate with the risk they face, actually. You know? So the current, the corona crisis, the natural experiment that we are looking at is that you know, we, we saw that people do you know, react to that. There, there are different probabilities depending on age and people react differently you know, in reflecting, so to say, their mortality risk. Our results are surprising in the light of a literature that actually has highlighted difficulties that people have in assessing these small probability events. And, and our results you know, seem to suggest, so to say, otherwise. Okay? Now. Let me maybe then go full circle to the very first paper I presented. The fact that according to our results, people behave on average rationally in the face of such event does not imply that there is no role for government intervention, of course. Okay. Going full circle to our first paper is really that, you know, we argue that in an epidemic, the competitive equilibrium is not socially optimal. So we still have that infection externality similar to the pollution externality that Per was talking about, and that, you know, that the infected people don't really take into account their effect on the spread of the virus on other people's, you know, health and, and, and income. So it's the, that externality that the government policies like containment, testing, and quarantines can be well for enhancing. And, you know, that's something that to, to keep in mind. All right. So again, thank you so much for for having us, uh, having me and, and my co-authors implicitly at the conference. Um, you know, it's a big honor uh, to be here today and talk to you guys. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Ah, I should say one thing. If you go to this website, which is the very uh, at the very bottom of the slides, you go there. Um, we are offering all the MATLAB and uh, MATLAB and Dynair codes, depending on the projects, you know, for for download. So if you want to work with the with these models, they're all available for download and 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 usage. And um, I thank you very much again for your attention. Thank you. Great, thank you, Matthias. Um, so there are a few questions here. Um, again, a couple of questions from Hector. Mm -hmm. um, the first question he asked was about the role of uncertainty and whether your models, the quantitative results, yeah. are robust to alternative behavioral assumptions and reactions. He then goes on after your last paper, and I'll, I'll read that question out as well so that you can answer both together. He goes on to say that uh, you, your last paper partly replies to my question, but you do not seem to have measures of individual subjective expectations of consumers mm -hmm. and implicitly assume that they coincide with population frequencies. Um, how robust are your results to the perfect information question? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, these are great questions. So thank you so much. Now, um, frankly, um, we think that we are at the beginning of a research agenda here that we started in March. And um, there are many things that are uh, you know, are worth, you know, shedding light on and, and dwelling deeper. Um, in terms of the first question, how, you know, how do we deal with the uncertainty? Well, there is a lot of uncertainty in these models. Uh, people are, don't, don't know whether or not they are contracting the virus. And once they contract the virus, people don't know with certainty whether or not they're going to survive, i.e. recover or passing away. And their decision-making exactly reflects that uncertainty. Okay. Now, 
the, the way expectations are formed, of course, may be crucial or is crucial for the resulting allocations. And, and what we have sort of say highlighted here is, uh, you know, through this sequence of papers, all the way through the last paper I, I talked about, that, that people take an irrational approach, that they're taking into account, you know, the knowledge of information and the structure of the economy and take the best informed, sort of say, um, you know, decision making process to cope with what they know about the structure of the economy and the information flow, but taking into account the, um, the asymmetries uh, uh, taking into account to so say the uncertainties about so to say the eventual outcomes and what we show is that at least from an allocational perspective in the very last paper is that the decisions that people take through the lens of our model which is rational decision making coincide or can account the what we observe in the data okay so had we found an obvious mismatch there that say the data would you know is what it is and the model would you know would suggest you know, we, we have a completely different dimension along which adjustment should take place we would sort of say discard that model but that doesn't seem to be the case the model does generate allocations that are very similar to that so a priori we can't rule out that this model is completely sort of say off the line on the contrary now Frankly, I think it would be ph phenomenal to have ex data on, on consumers' expectations. What did they expect in the moment of a crisis at the individual level? But to be frank, I think we will never have that data. We are blessed with having this administrative data set where we can look at what people did. But um, I think it will be very hard, at least for the, you know, to, to get individual uh, you know, data on expectations formations. Um, I think that's as far as I, I can say, but, I, but that said, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, re, it's a research agenda and that we're not pursuing on our own, of course, that, you know, the, that the colleagues are around the globe are, are working on. And, and I think that's a fascinating issue to kind of continue to work in, in, in subsequent work, undoubtedly. So I really appreciate their, you know, the questions. Great, thank you. Um... So Nicola asks, um, this relates to your, the first paper that you presented. The, yeah. uh, you state that the initial consequence of any epidemic is a reduction in labor, labor demand and consumption. Could you specify how people would cut their labor supply? Is smart working uh, not compensating for that enough? Um, so I think I'm going to be a little careful here. So what they do is that the, the model has sort of say a supply and demand effect. So the demand effect is on a consumption side, right? So people demand less consumption. Now with it comes, of course, a, there's also a supply effect that they cut back on their, on their labor. Um, the way to basically see this is that, you know, people, uh, if they can, and in this model, they, 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 they can do that. They cut back on the amount of hours that they supply to the labor market. They, they are not sort of say do, doing sort of say their you know standard sort of say approaches of going going to work you know? now there, i sense the question has you know the, 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 there's a there's an element to this question that maybe thinks about okay what happens if you have agent heterogeneity when you know you have parts of the population that cannot cut back their consumption or their hours sorry they cannot cut back their hours uh, and, and others can so you can you know thinking about you know telework or commuting or telework and and uh, and stuff like that and so that's something that we are right now working on and uh, we're we're confident to get sort of say you know that that work out you know to the general public uh, very soon where we exactly look into that dimension namely we have especially low skilled low income workers that actually cannot afford to reduce their hours uh, or that they have types of jobs that don't afford so to say to reduce their hours and we we'll see very adverse in the data but also then of course through the lens of the model very adverse so to say allocate in our consequences there um, relative to parts of the population that have the ability to shift their work to the home office and keep on working at home and so they, they there's a very you know there's a there's a lot of you know inequality in that sense um if, if you think about this both from an income perspective but also from a health uh, you know dimension and so um i think all i can say for now is uh, you know stay tuned uh, you know the, the we're planning to po post the paper in the in the next couple of days and and uh, and make that available to the general public um, okay. i think you actually exactly pick up on what she wanted to know because she ended by saying Perhaps data shows some degree of voluntary unemployment. Yes, yes, yeah, that's, and that's what people. I mean, that's what you see that people, you know, that they, are, you know, for the parts of the population that can, mm -hmm. they're cutting back on their on the supply of hours, you know, and and that's exactly what people did. They they just did not go the the last extra mile and in, in getting the last project running 
uh, you know, compared to what they did a year ago before COVID actually did happen. We see that in the data. Um, but of course, that's very heterogeneous. You know, it's not the same for everybody there. And of course, the very first paper, as simple as it is, it was we kept that as simple as it is to really dissect the mechanism. That maybe overstates this a little bit, right? The, the, the first paper, the, the title that we're looking at here on the slides, does not reflect that. There is no substitution into home, you know, offices or, you know, people have to make a living and so that they cannot, you know, reduce their hours. That's not the margin that we have in this paper that can be done. And uh, again, it's fascinating, but we kept this on purpose, very, very kind of uh, transparent to really kind of get a first pass on, on the basic effects. But uh, as, I, as I emphasized again, there, you know, this is a very you know, uh, exciting um, uh, area of, of, of current contemporary work. Yeah. So Ricardo asks, um, would the cost of quarantine change the results? Are your results sensitive to the cost of quarantine? Um, so, um, okay, let me go go back here to so you, you having in mind, so to say, um, I take it the second paper, uh, the macro of testing and quarantines, and and um, when you're thinking about what are so what happens here in the quarantine, what are the costs associated with quarantine, right? So the the, the first cost, of course, is that. Um, there's output costs, right? People do not are not able to go to work, so the economy loses productive capacity in a sense. You remove people from the labor force that are infected, so that's a that's a society cost. Now it comes with a benefit, of course, that once you remove those people, they are not infecting other people, so you have fewer deaths. So this is exactly the trade-off, so to say, and and it's the trade-off gets so to say ameliorated. Okay, now. I, I take it that the question maybe has a, so in other words, long, long story short, the superficial answer to your question is that, you know, quarantines don't actually put it, so to say, increase the cost. No, they, they make, so to say, they improve the economy. They, they make the recession milder and there's more people surviving the epidemic. So it's actually a win, if, in the, if you like about that. Now, I sense the question has a little different angle, namely, did we take into account that, you know, quarantines also have costs, say, in the family? You know, that, that people are, you know, required to stay at home so uh, students cannot go to, to their schools or, you know, there are things like domestic violence. Uh, there are, you know, other costs that, you know, people are maybe developing health issues because of they've been forced to say that all these things are really dramatic and, and really they are, they go to the heart of if you think about this. But that's something, these are dimensions that we do not have, have in the model. You may think about this, that you know, once you would include these dimensions into models like the ones that we have been looking at, then, then there would be a shift that to, toward maybe a little less harsh or a little less long duration of containment. But unless you take the very extreme position that perhaps these costs are, over, are, are bigger than actually the costs relating from the people dying of the virus, there will always be some sort of containment, so to say, that the, that the society would prefer. Um, and it's again, it's a it's a it's a cost benefit analysis here that you that you like. And I I think I, I should emphasize this again. We did keep these models at the very beginning, the first two papers, very simple and tractable and transparent to really go at what is the basic trade-off. And you can think about that quantitatively, the trade-off being resolved in one way or the other really depends on exactly the type of you know, questions that you guys have. Namely, you know, what are the costs of lockdowns? I mean, what are the costs of firms going bankrupt? What we argue is that there will always be this tendency for a trade-off. But how this trade-off then tilts quantitatively is going to depend on the particular features that you are highlighting and that you think that you deem are very important. Okay? Now, that's sort of say the bottom line. And if you start testing, the trade-off may altogether kind of become less of an importance. But again, the tilting at the level that you have then is then depending again on the particular parts that, that you're thinking are most relevant to describe the economy. I hope that that answers the, the question. So uh, there are two questions left, uh, Matthias, and not a lot of time. Okay. But uh, I promise to be brief. Uh, asks um, if key parameters such as the mortality rate are exogenous stochastic processes. What would happen in a RE, and I think that means rational expectations environment, if they did not have perfect information on these processes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the second question I'll give it to you now um, is. Um, is about what governments are doing right and wrong. Based, most governments seem to be aiming for your smart policy. Um, are, they, are, are their results matching what you're showing? And if not, what are they getting wrong? 
on it. So thank you so much. All the questions we can. Yeah, yeah. I'm really. I'm going to be brief here. So um, the mortality rate. What happens if there's imperfect uh, uh, knowledge about this? Well, one of the extensions that we have in our benchmark model is indeed that we have limited healthcare facilities in there. And so people understand, again, through the lens of the model, yes, you know, if, if ICU beds are at capacity, mortality rate shoots up. And what people then do rationally is they cut back on their consumption and work in order to isolate themselves even more. Okay, so that's what they basically do. Now, if you argue that people didn't know that, they didn't watch the headlines of what happened in Bergamo or in New York City, or for some reason didn't believe that, you know, and they still sort of say go there. Well, what you will observe is that imperfect knowledge in that sense will just increase the fatality, you know, numbers. The, the, the people are passing away because of imperfect knowledge, either fatalism or voluntary imperfect knowledge or, or just, uh, you know, people not basically taking these things into account. You will see more people dying, basically, and less of a, re a recession because people don't effect take that into account. So imperfect knowledge is is nothing else than basically people don't reacting as strongly to the, the virus and cutting back their exposition to the virus. And so and we're gonna see more fatalities. That's what you're basically gonna see. Um, the, the second question was, um, was related to what do governments get wrong and what do governments go, get right? I think this picture here is perfectly, you know, it, takes, it, takes, it talks a perfect sto story. Those governments that do nothing, you see lots of death and you see a big recession. You know, we have ample of examples in the in the world that actually see that big recessions at the same time, lots of people dying. And then you have countries that basically seem to have mini recessions and have very small number of deaths, like, you know, Asian countries, like, for instance, Korea and, and maybe other examples, not maybe there, there are the examples there, too. Mm -hmm. So what we what I would argue here is that there are governments that seems to have found something or f they have pursued policies that we offer in this work as sort of say the array of policies you know so in other words if you do testing and quarantine the right way you're looking at an economy that you know has a very small impact on the economy of COVID and very few deaths and it looks like there is no trade-off and we have <laughs> we actually have empirical work that argues there is no trade-off become between economic activity and health outcomes well exactly what we see here if you have the right economic policy the right policies in place you shouldn't find a big trade-off. But then unfortunately, there are other countries that you know are not willing to go into lockdown measures, testing measures, what have you, where you see very adverse re you know, re relationships and, 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 and there is a big trade-off. So I think um, what we learned so far from this work is that the world is complicated, but actually economists can contribute a lot in terms of thinking about the interaction between the epidemic and economic activity on the other one. And there are policies, be it from one fits all type, you know, containment policies, smart containment, testing and quarantine policies. You know, there's actually a big menu that economists, you know, can offer to, you know, to policy and decision makers and, and actually helping to structure policies that, you know, actually, you know, make, make all of us better off and to cope with this crisis. And, and it seems that some countries got it right and other countries, there's maybe, there's maybe upside potential still. And um, I, yeah, that's, I think I want to say for that. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Well, thank um, you so much. Uh, not at all. It's been a, it's been a great talk. Uh, very interesting. Yeah. Um, so, colleagues, I think we we have a 15 minute break. Alex is really driving you hard. Uh, back again at 11 o'clock for the second session, which will be chaired by Mark Guzman, Beyond the Representative Firm and Consumer. So thank you to Per and thank you to Matthias. Well, thank you for everybody. Thank you for, again for the invitation. Thanks for all the participants for these wonderful questions. Really, really, really amazing. And I'm really, really, you know, happy and, and honored again to be here today. So looking forward then to the next, you know, sessions and the remainder of the day. It's a, it's a phenomenal, you know, program that you guys put together. Thank you. Thank you, Yuma. Thank you. So I'd like to welcome everybody back uh, to the conference here on macroeconomics and reality. Uh, and to the beginning of the second session uh, entitled Beyond the Representative Firm and Consumer. Uh, so we have two uh, individuals speaking uh, during this session, Isabel Mejan and Alexander Mihaila. And as with the uh, previous session, uh, about 30, 35 minutes for their presentations and then about 10 to 15 minutes for questions. If you have a question, can you please uh, put it down in the chat? And if you could make sure uh, above the message you write, it says two, uh, please make sure it says all panelists and attendees so that everybody can see what the questions are. So I'd like to uh, welcome our, our first presenter today, uh, Isabel Mejan, 
Uh, she's a professor at the Ecole Polytechnique and a CEPR uh, research fellow. Her primary areas of research are international macro and trade, and she's extremely successful in it with publications in the likes of Econometrica and the AER. She's also a co-editor for the European Economic Review and a successful uh, grant recipient from the European Research uh, Council grants. Uh, so with that brief introduction, I will hand it over to you, Isabel, uh, to tell us about foreign shocks as granular, granular fluctuations. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks for having me in this uh, great uh, conference. Um, so the paper I'm going to present is a uh, joint work with Julian Di Giovanni, who's now at the uh, New York Fed, and Andrei Levchenko, who's in uh, Michigan. And uh, the basic uh, question or the basic thing we would like to do in this uh, uh, paper is to uh, kind of revisit the question of international uh, business cycle shock propagation, but taking the point of view of individual firms. So this obviously relates to a huge literature in macro uh, that um, uh, studies uh, business cycle co-movements. And in this literature, in the textbook version of this literature, but also most of the literature that has followed, uh, the view is that um, international co-movements come from uh, the uh, uh, propagation across countries of shocks uh, through relative price adjustment. And this takes place in models that to a very large extent feature a, a representative firm in each country or eventually in each country and sector. So by definition, this neglects an important feature of the data that has been extensively uh, uh, documented uh, in the trade literature, which basically says that uh, trade is the business of a small number of very large firms. So this is true both on the import and the export side and in previous works with uh, Julian and Andre, we've shown that uh, this uh, sparsity in the participation of firms uh, to international trade matters uh, for explaining business cycle uh, uh, co-movements as uh, individual firms' uh, decision to participate to trade with one particular country has a significant impact on these firms' uh, co-movement with that country. So this suggests that firms are important channels through which uh, shocks can propagate across countries and thus integrating the sparsity in firms' decision to participate to trade might be an important factor uh, to better understand uh, international commitments. So this is what we are going to do in this paper. And by doing so, we are going to uh, kind of extend the literature on the micro of macro which has pointed out uh, the role of large firms and idiosyncratic shocks as a source of aggregate fluctuation. So here we are going to kind of start from this literature, but uh, consider the role of large firms as a driver of business cycle commitments. So more specifically, we are going to try a firm level view of international shock propagation and the very simple argument that we are going to develop in the paper is that foreign shocks, even when they are purely aggregate by nature, are going to affect firms differentially depending on the extent and nature of their international linkages. And because of this, they are going to materialize themselves in the domestic economy as a series of shocks affecting individual firms. So kind of uh, idiosyncratic shocks to firms. <clears throat> So in order to study the consequences of this, we are going to build a quantitative model that will have uh, heterogeneous firms, multiple countries and multiple sectors. And what is going to be uh, kind of nice is that we can implement this model directly on very rich data. So the data we are going to use cover the universe of French firms. And we have information about many things about these firms, including the structure of their cost, their size, their value added, and also a full view of their uh, trade participation at the bilateral level. So we are going to build from this uh, rich firm level data, append those with the world input output database so that we can calibrate the model uh, with multiple countries and multiple sectors solve the model in general equilibrium, taking into account the granular impact of firms. So we are going to uh, take fully into account the heterogeneity across firms that we see in the data, including when solving the model in general equilibrium. And then based on this model, we're going to simulate both hypothetical and actual foreign shocks and study how these shocks propagate uh, to uh, the French economy and how this propagation uh, uh, interact with heterogeneity across firms. 
So let me summarize what we find. So here we are going to come up with three main results. The first one is a novel style of facts that uh, we uh, um, document thanks to our uh, firm level panel data. And this style of facts shows that uh, larger French firms tend to be significantly more sensitive to foreign GDP uh, growth than smaller firms. Um, in the context of the model, this is going to be explained by uh, large firms having a larger propensity to participate to international trade and thus be directly exposed to foreign shocks, but this correlation holds in the data unconditionally. The second result is a, a micro result recovered from the quantitative model. And uh, it says that basically foreign shocks are mostly granular fluctuations. So here is uh, the a kind of uh, the, the explanation for the title of the paper. So let me be a bit more specific about what I mean here. So the object of interest in the rest of the paper is going to, to be this elasticity, which measures the response, uh, the percentage uh, uh, response of the French GDP to some foreign shock. Uh, we focus on a foreign shock, which explains that I'm using a F uh, uh, index here. So by definition, the response of the aggregate French GDP to the shock is a weighted average of uh, the response of individual firms to this uh, shock. And based on this very simple uh, um, uh, aggregation property, one can show that the aggregate elasticity of interest can be uh, decomposed into the mean response of firms and this granular term here that capture the correlation in the data between uh, firm size and their elasticity to the shock. So the argument that we are going to have is very simple. Large firms are the ones that uh, uh, participate to a large extent to foreign markets. Because of that, they are more exposed to foreign shocks. And this exposure to shocks drives a positive correlation between their size and their elasticity to foreign shocks. So this means that this term is positive and we are going to provide evidence that it is positive. But more importantly, what we can do thanks to the structure of the model is to quantify uh, the uh, um, contribution of this term to the overall elasticity. And we consistently find that this contribution is large. So basically this granular residual accounts for 40 to 85 percent of the overall effect of foreign shock uh, to uh, of um, the um, the overall effect of foreign shock onto the French uh, economy. So this is very sizable, meaning that taking into account this heterogeneity in both size and uh, uh, elasticity to foreign shocks is quantitatively important. The third result is a quantitative uh, result as well, but it has a more macro flavor. And it shows that firm heterogeneity uh, in importing tends to dampen the aggregate impact of foreign shocks. In order to show this, we are going to uh, construct an alternative model that mutes heterogeneity across firms within a sector. And we're going to find that the exact same mod, uh, the, the, this model calibrated in the exact same way and fitted with the exact same shock, it uh, implies elasticities that are about 20% uh, larger. And the reason uh, why we have this dampening effect is because in uh, the full model, the shock is going to reallocate market shares towards the larger firms that also tend to have a low influence on domestic GDP conditional on their size. The reason being that these firms tend to produce out of both domestic and also foreign value added. So there is a, a bit of a spillover from the reallocation of market shares towards uh, the impact it has on the domestic uh, um, uh, labor market. And this is this impact that uh, explain uh, the dampening effect. So I'll come back on this afterwards. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the literature, which is vast. So we both mostly uh, contribute to two uh, literatures. The vast literature on the micro of macro, I already briefly uh, talked about, and that has emphasized the role of both firms uh, size and also uh, the structure of the economy into networks as a source of granular fluctuations. We also contribute to the literature on international co movements that has uh, uh, shown how input linkages can create those transmission mechanisms for shocks across countries. But as I said before, to a large extent, has neglected the role of firms in driving those uh, uh, propagation mechanisms. 
so there is still a literature on firms, uh, which is mostly empirical, and uh, that we are going to contribute to with this quantitative model. <clears throat> so if there are no uh, clarification question, I can perhaps go directly to the core of the uh, uh, presentation. Uh, and so I'm going to start with the data. Uh, so as I explained before, the model is based, so the paper is based on a rich quantitative model that requires a, a lot of data. And so the data we are going to use is a combination of firm level data for France that we recover from the tax and customs administration. And that allow us to uh, document a large degree of heterogeneity across firms within a sector in terms of their size and also importantly the structure of their production function, including the extent to which they rely on foreign inputs. Uh, just a, a detail, but uh, which is important quantitatively, we have data on trading goods, so we are going to consider all services to be non-traded in the calibration, which is arguably not true, especially in the case of France, which has a strong comparative advantage in services, but uh, uh, for which we don't have uh, enough good data. So this data only cover France, so we are going to append those with the world input output database, which is a global input output matrix that has 40 countries and 32 sectors. And obviously there are some issues when uh, matching those two uh, uh, sources of data. So the approach that we are going to have in the paper is to use the firm level data to document heterogeneity within a particular sector. And then we are going to normalize all those coefficients so that they exactly match the world input output database at the sector level and thus we can compare uh, France with the rest of the world. So the first thing we do with this data is to document this stylized fact I mentioned before, which is that larger firms are more sensitive to French GDP. To show this, we use a very much reduced form approach, whereby we, we regress on the left hand side the uh, growth of a firm's value added. Uh, on a measure of world GDP growth and its interaction with firm size. And here the uh, coefficient of interest is the one that we recover on the interaction, which you can see is always positive and very significant, meaning that large firms tend to move more with uh, the uh, world uh, GDP growth. This is true unconditionally. This remains true when we identify the coefficient within a year or also within a particular sector and year using only the heterogeneity across firms within uh, this sector to identify the coefficient. In the last uh, column of the table, we also control for the interaction between a firm's uh, size and the French GDP growth to account for the possibility that large firms might just be more procyclical. Here, the coefficient is uh, slightly positive, but not very significant. And more importantly, uh, controlling for this does not uh, change our main conclusion, which is that uh, the uh, interaction term between uh, firm size and the uh, world GDP growth is uh, very positive, meaning that large firms tend to be more sensitive to foreign GDP. Quantitatively, if we double the size of a firm, we are going to increase its elasticity uh, up uh, towards GDP growth by about 0.08, which is quantitatively uh, kind of uh, uh, important. So in, this is true unconditionally. In the context of the model, this uh, um, uh, elasticity, so this heterogeneity in firms' uh, elasticity to foreign GDP growth is going to be uh, explained by uh, firms' propensity to trade. And here we exploit something which is well known from the trade literature that I've illustrated here, but that I'm not going to comment too much, which is that basically, sorry, um, large firms are more likely to both export and import. So this is what we uh, find here in uh, when we look at uh, ex the export side. Uh, so here what I've plotted is a cumulative distribution of uh, firms according to uh, the share of foreign sales in their overall turnover. And uh, what you see here is that there are many firms, including in tradable sectors that do not export. This represents uh, about 60% in our data, 60% of firms. At the other side of the distribution, there are very few firms that are very active in foreign markets so that they get more than say 50% of their sales from uh, their foreign uh, uh, markets. So this corresponds to 
roughly 7% of the population of firms. But then when I uh, plot the distribution weighted by uh, this firm size, I uh, see that uh, there is a strong discrepancy. The 5% of firms that export uh, more than 50% uh, of their production represent something that's uh, like 30% of aggregate value added, while instead the 60% of firms that do not export represent about 20% of aggregate value added. So there is a systematic correlation in the data between the propensity to export and firm size. And the same is true when we look at the import uh, propensity. So this is something that the model is going to fully take into account. So uh, now I'm going to uh, briefly uh, uh, talk about uh, the main ingredients of the model. Um, to give you a very rough uh, summary, the model is basically Armington plus Melitz, plus importantly, input-output linkages that we allow to be heterogeneous across firms. So this dimension is going to be very important. So as I said, the model is a model with heterogeneous firms, multiple countries, multiple sectors. So the pain is really about like uh, keeping track of the indices. So the convention afterwards is going to uh, be that we are going to use M and, and K for countries, I and J for sectors and F and G for uh, firms. So the model has a lot of uh, degrees of heterogeneity, but as I said, we only uh, we can uh, only take these heterogeneities into account for France because for the rest of the world we don't have firm level data, and thus we are going to be to have no choice but to assume any uh, form of heterogeneity away. When we look at France, instead we are going to fully take into account heterogeneity that we observe in the data which uh, means that we can take into account heterogeneities in productivities, in labor shares, in input linkages, in, in, and in export participation. And we also have an extension uh, of the uh, calibration with endogenous markups. So the baseline is going to be based on uh, constant uh, CES markups, but we uh, have also extended the results uh, based on uh, oligopolistic competition and endogenous markups and uh, most of the results uh, go through. So we have, in comparison at least to the literature, we have a richer structure of heterogeneity across firms that uh, we are going to uh, be able to uh, put in the model because we have rich data to calibrate this heterogeneity. So the rest is uh, kind of standard. So from the point of view of households, we are going to have a representative household in each country, uh, which has GHH uh, preferences. Uh, so a disutility of labor, meaning that we have an endogenous uh, labor supply. Uh, and on the consumption side, we are going to have a, a nested uh, a consumption. So a cup du glass across sectors. Then a CES across origin countries. Remember, M is a country. So here we have the elasticity of substitution between countries, which is equal to sigma in one particular sector, J. And finally, uh, we are going to have a last uh, layer of CES, which is going to aggregate consumption across various firms from the same origin country. Okay, so here we are going to have uh, a firm, uh, an aggregate across firms. And this is going to be aggregating across all firms that we see active from country M and sector J in a particular market M. So this is something which is important I forgot to mention. We are going to use a model that does not take into account endogenous responses of the endogenous of the uh, endogenous uh, response, um, responses of the extensive margin to the shock. So instead we are going to assume the uh, selection of firms into uh, um, exporting uh, markets is, is constant uh, in presence of a shock. So this is a, a shortcoming, but uh, we've shown in previous uh, um, work that the responses of the extensive margin at business cycle frequencies are quantitatively uh, small, so uh, we can neglect them. So based on this structure of demand, we can uh, rewrite the demand, which is based by a particular firm in country M coming from a particular origin uh, destination country N. And we can write this as being a share of the uh, bilateral trade flow. So the bilateral trade flow is going to be sold for in uh, general equilibrium. And then 
the heterogeneity across firms is going to, uh, 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 ha uh, to have consequences for what is the share of a particular firm in a particular destination. Those C here that I mentioned to, uh, forgot to mention, are just demand shifters that are going to help us calibrate, uh, match uh, the data regarding market shares across uh, destination markets. So the most important uh, uh, part of the model has to do with firms. So as I said, the baseline is going to assume monopolistic uh, competition, but we have a robustness assuming oligopolistic competition. And firms are going to be heterogeneous in terms of their productivity, the preferences of uh, consumers from uh, various countries with respect to their variety. And importantly, we are also going to introduce a rich structure of cost with a lot of heterogeneity, in particular in terms of firms' labor shares, and also uh, the structure of their inputs, and in particular, how much of those inputs are sourced from abroad. As I showed before, this is very heterogeneous across firms. So this is kind of unusual in the literature to have that degree, that additional degree of heterogeneity. But because we observe those shares directly into the data, we can take into account this source of heterogeneity. So how much time do I have? Like uh, 20 minutes or 15 minutes? Yes, you, you've got about uh, 10 to 15 minutes. OK. So I'm going to speed up a bit, but I'm done with the uh, model. So uh, based on uh, these various assumptions regarding potential sources of heterogeneity, heterogeneity we can uh, finally rewrite those uh, um, shares that I mentioned before. The share of a particular firm in a particular bilateral trade flow is going to be a function of all the degrees of heterogeneity that we've put into the model. The rest is standard. We solve the model in general equilibrium using the uh, market uh, clearing conditions. Um, and um, this uh, last slide about the model is meant to go back to the initial question, which is the role of heterogeneity uh, in this model. So as I said before, the object of interest afterwards is going to be this elasticity of the French GDP to uh, some foreign shock. And by definition, because we, uh, the um, GDP is just the sum of value added across firms, we can rewrite this elasticity as a weighted average of firm level elasticities. Okay, And this is this formula that gives us the decomposition I already mentioned of the aggregate elasticity into the mean response of firms and the covariance between firm size, these omegas here, and their elasticity to the shock. So what the model is uh, um, providing us with um, is a theory for this covariance. And in particular, in the context of the model, we are going to have a very rich uh, distribution of those elasticities that is going to uh, um, reflect uh, the differences across firms in terms of their exposure to uh, shocks. So in particular, firms' uh, cost structure is going to have consequences about firms' direct exposure to foreign shocks through their uh, input purchases. Uh, so this is this first part here. And uh, the uh, heterogeneity across firms in terms of their export uh, um, decisions is, is also going to have consequences about uh, their direct exposure to foreign demand shocks. So basically a firm which is importing a lot of its inputs from abroad is more exposed to foreign productivity shocks, which are going to translate to the firm through the price of inputs. Uh, and likewise, a firm that uh, gets a lot of its sales from foreign markets is more exposed to uh, demand shocks. So what is nice is that because we are going to uh, calibrate the model, taking into account the full heterogeneity in those exposure, we are going to be able to simulate the whole distribution of those elasticities and uh, quantify the extent of, their, uh, of its covariance with uh, firm size. Um, so this is just for the calibration. We solved the model in general equilibrium. Uh, we are going to work with the model in growth rates, which allows us to get rid of many parameters and instead use what we observe in the data, which are input shares, sales shares, etc., to calibrate 
the initial equilibrium and then apply shocks to this uh, equilibrium to derive the elasticity uh, of the French GDPs. So the only remaining, uh, so beside those uh, shares that we observe directly into the data, the remaining elasticities that need to be calibrated are the, uh, um, uh, basically the parameter of the elasticity of the um, uh, consumption and uh, labor supply that we take uh, from the uh, literature. So this finally uh, leads me to the first um, quantitative result that I mentioned before. Um, so based on this model, the first thing we do is to simulate some hypothetical shocks. And so in particular, what we are going to do that I'm going to discuss is uh, either a worldwide shock to uh, foreign productivity. So all foreign, shock, uh, foreign countries are hit by a positive 10% productivity uh, shock. Uh, in this part of the table, or uh, there is a positive demand shock for French goods that also affects all foreign countries. And again, is calibrated at 10% here. And so based on this hypothetical shock, I can uh, um, um, solve the model in this new equilibrium and compute the impact of the shock on the French GDP. So in this baseline specification and calibration, we uh, find an overall elasticity of the French uh, GDP to the uh, worldwide 10% productivity shock, which is equal to 2.7%. But so this is sizable, but the shock is big again. But more importantly than the level of the elasticity, what we care about is mostly the decomposition. So what is important here is to note that most of this 2.7 adjustment in the French GDP go through the granular residual uh, so that capture this heterogeneity and the covariance between firms' individual elasticity to the shock and their size. So we have a sizable granular uh, uh, term, which basically uh, uh, reflects the fact that in our simulation, individual firms' elasticity to the shock is very heterogeneous and correlated with their size. So this is what we show here. So again, based on our uh, strategy, we can recover the whole distribution of uh, firm level elasticities and then compare uh, uh, those elasticities with individual firm size. And we find uh, this positive correlation that is a bit noisy because uh, uh, firms in our model differ in many dimensions, including their sector of activity that also matters for uh, uh, how much uh, foreign competition there is. Uh, but we have a very strong and positive correlation that explains the size of the granular residual. What is interesting as well is that based on this, we can compare those individual elasticities with the aggregate elasticity, which is this red line here. And what you can see from this is that actually in our simulation, most firms uh, um, um, suffer or at least enjoy an, um, uh, an elasticity that is lower than the 2.7% uh, I, I mentioned before. And it's actually the very large firms that actually benefit a lot from the foreign shock. And again, the reason why it is the case is because these firms on average have a larger import share. So what is driving this elasticity in the model is uh, heterogeneity in exposure to those shocks, which is related to the, the firm's import share, the, the share of foreign inputs in their overall intermediate consumption. Because it happens that in the data, this is correlated with firm size, we recover this positive correlation that drives the granular residual. We can show that in an, uh, uh, that uh, this Granular residual is uh, to a very large extent uh, 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 triggered by uh, heterogeneity across firms within a sector. And to show this, we replicate the same decomposition, but instead of looking at the covariance between firm level elasticities and their size, we look at the covariance between sector elasticities and their size. Here we recover again a granular residual that is positive, but much smaller uh, uh, in size than uh, what we recover uh, from the full decomposition. So what this means is that what is driving to a large extent this granular residual is uh, the uh, heterogeneity across firms, and in particular, the fact that the shock reallocates market shares from the small to the large firms. 
Okay, I'm running a bit out of time, so I'm going to skip the discussion of the demand shock that we simulate. I've also skipped something else that we do in the paper, which is to also simulate actual shocks that we see in the data. So we take series of TFP shocks for various countries and fit them into the model. Uh, if you're interested, uh, you're, uh, I'm happy to share the draft of the paper. Uh, based on this simulation, we can also show that Based on that, we can replicate the stylized fact I mentioned at the very beginning. So again, in the context of the model, I'm able to uh, recover for each individual firm the growth rates of uh, its value added uh, uh, following some uh, hypothetical shock, either the productivity shock or the preference shock. And based on this, I can replicate the reduced form regression I, I, I've discussed before and uh, recover the positive uh, coefficients that I've mentioned before. So what this says is that what we've shown to hold in the data unconditionally can be replicated within uh, the model by taking into account heterogeneity across firms in their exposure to foreign shocks. The last result I wanted to mention in my uh, last four minutes is this dampening effect of heterogeneity. So what do I mean here? So what we do here is to uh, compare the results of the baseline model. This is what I've commented before. With a second calibration of the model whereby we neglect heterogeneity across firms. So this model is basically what is used in the quantitative trade literature. So a model with multiple countries, multiple sectors, and input output uh, um, uh, linkages between sectors. And uh, within uh, this model, we can replicate the exercise, uh, feeding the model with the shocks that I've discussed before, and compare what the model implies in terms of the overall elasticity of uh, the French GDP to those shocks. And what is interesting here is the comparison between those elasticities in the fully heterogeneous model and in the model that assumes a way uh, heterogeneity across firms within a sector. And what you can see for both shocks that we've simulated is that in both cases, the homogeneous firm model delivers elasticities that are larger by about 20% than the fully heterogeneous model. So what this means is that the heterogeneity that we've put into the model has a dampening effect and reduces uh, everything else uh, equal, the elasticity of the domestic GDP to foreign shocks. What is the intuition of this dampening effect? Again, we have a long discussion of this in the paper. But what we can show is that uh, the, sources of this, the source of this dampening effect is heterogeneity across firms in their uh, um, import intensity. So basically, what do I mean here? In the model, uh, when we compare uh, the two models here, what we do is to assume away both heterogeneity in size and heterogeneity in firms production function. What we can show is that heterogeneity in size does not lead to any uh, dampening. So if firms were homogeneous in terms of their production function, we would not have uh, such dampening and this we can prove analytically. So what matters here is heterogeneity in firms importing inputs. And what we show in the uh, paper is that the reason why this matters is that uh, this creates a correlation between a firm's exposure to foreign shocks. This is something I've discussed. The fact that firms are heterogeneous in terms of their imp imported input shares means that they are heterogeneous in terms of their exposure to foreign productivity shock. But it also matters for their influence on the domestic GDP conditional on their size, and in particular, firms that import more of their inputs tend to have a lower influence on the domestic GDP because basically when they grow, part of this growth has uh, consequences for foreign labor markets because part of this growth is uh, um, uh, achieved thanks to an increase in the uh, volume of imported inputs. And this is important and creates the dampening that I've um, uh, discussed before. So in the fully heterogeneous model, the foreign shocks is going to reallocate market shares in favor of the firms that are more exposed to those foreign shocks that also happen to be low influence firms. And this is what pushes the elasticity down. Um, sorry, I'm 
uh, running a bit out of time, so I'm going to conclude with this, but I'm happy to answer questions on this uh, dampening effect. So again, what we've shown in this paper or what we've provided is a firm level view of international shock propagation that emphasizes the role of heterogeneity across firms in their exposure to foreign shocks as a source of, uh, as an important feature for the uh, uh, um, understanding of the uh, co-movements uh, of a business cycle across countries. Okay, and thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you, uh, Isabel. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one comes from Hector, uh, who says that, um, or asked, does the uh, NC FICUS database detail the breakdown of French firms' production costs by home versus foreign sales? For example, what fraction of a firm's capital stock or employed labor force is dedicated to sell abroad versus sales in France? And he asked this because he uh, says another important source of reallocation in response to a foreign shock is within firm reallocation in addition to across firm reallocation. So this, the model fully takes into account. So the only thing that we do not take into account would be on uh, responses at the extensive margin. So potentially a firm which is hit by a foreign shock, uh, um, or in particular, if the shock was negative, a firm could potentially decide to stop exporting to that destination and then focus more on, on, the, on the domestic economy. So this is the only source of adjustment that we do not allow, adjustment at the extensive margin because we think of those adjustments to be quantitatively less important, at least over the business cycle. But otherwise, the model fully takes into account the fact that individual firms facing adjustment in relative prices in all destination and all origin country for their inputs can uh, decide to reallocate uh, their input uh, purchases and their sales across uh, markets. So this is something that the models take into account. But again, everything in this adjustment being related to general equilibrium adjustment in relative prices. What is important to notice is that, again, something which I find uh, important is that the model is solved taking into account the fact that some very large firms can have more, or, or more of an impact on equilibrium prices. So we do take into account the fact that the granularity of firms, their, their size, in itself can be uh, can matter for uh, uh, aggregate adjustment in relative prices. Okay, thank you. And then JP has two questions. The first being, if fragile global supply chains reconfigure, for example, thanks to learning COVID lessons, uh, into more versatile, energy efficient global supply networks, uh, including uh, productive intangibles. Could national, international, or even transnational resilience improve uh, out with big firms? So this is, this is a very interesting question that goes a bit beyond what we do in the paper, but that I've worked a bit uh, during the, the, the COVID episode. So basically what this type of model says is that indeed the domestic economy is uh, uh, not very resilient to foreign shocks because firms are exposed to those shocks, in particular through their sourcing strategy, which has a very strong impact. Now the question is that in the context of the model, we do not uh, allow firms to adjust their sourcing strategy. Over the longer run, it could be the case that firms might be willing to adjust. So here, the, the, the answer that I would provide is based on some other uh, uh, research I'm doing with uh, more detailed, even more detailed uh, uh, data, whereby we, we show that there is a very strong degree of persistence in firm-to-firm -firm, uh, relationship in international trade. So firms organize their sourcing uh, strategy based on some long-term contracts with other firms. And what we argue in this, uh, based on this, uh, what I would argue based on this paper is that if there need to be, or if there will be uh, an impact of the current crisis, we should not expect to see it in the very short run because there are very important investments that are put in the organization of those supply shop, the supply chain, sorry. And this uh, very large in investment means that firms are unlikely to adjust over the very short run, in particular because the crisis itself are, has probably deteriorated their, their ability to invest. 
So over the very long run, it might be that the accumulation of big shocks, this one, but also before, say, the tsunami in Japan that we've seen has had consequences in global supply chains, might induce more uh, adjustment in how firms organize their supply chain, and, uh, at least how, they, how well they diversify their supply chain. But we shall not expect to see this in the, in the very short run, because this uh, implies very important investments that uh, need to, to, that will not materialize in the very short term. Okay, and then he follows up on that with uh, the following question. Can you generate ex ante hypotheses for what could happen to productivity and labor as a result? Or would we simply see ex post greater inequality driving the slow onset of crisis as automation, uh, for example, et cetera, exasperates uh, rent exploitation of debt and demographics, stirring up more uh, fast onset of the crisis? Uh, that's a very big question that I'm not sure I'm going to be able to tackle entirely. What this type of model are very useful uh, uh, for, I think, is to, um, um, to, to help understand how aggregate um, um, variables, say uh, aggregate TFP, but also the aggregate labor share, is affected by uh, the reallocation of market shares across firms. So this is an example. The paper provides one example in which there is some shock, of a foreign productivity shock, but an important source of the adjustment is related to the reallocation of market shares within a particular sector and a particular country between firms that are more or less exposed to the shock. And this is true of any type of shock. We can think of uh, uh, um, uh, the automation uh, uh, revolution, any uh, shock to uh, the world markets. Uh, wh what uh, this type of model show is that in order to fully understand the consequences of this aggregate shock, it's very important to take into account the heterogeneity across firms because this heterogeneity means that there will be, as a consequence of the shock, a reallocation of market shares across firms that has consequences in the aggregate, as long as some of these firms are very uh, large and thus have a, a substantial impact in the aggregate. So I think it's very true, for instance, when we look at long run evolution in the labor share, uh, the part of the story is about uh, market shares being reallocated towards large firms. Uh, here we provide an example whereby we think of a shock which is more like business cycle shock, but uh, here as well, understanding uh, the mechanism of the adjustment requires to take into account the heterogeneity. Okay, and we have one more question, which is a follow-up by Hector. So he was asking about uh, the reallocation uh, within firm as opposed to across firm. And he followed that up with, what I was asking about is the fact that most large firms are multi-product which introduces another margin of reallocation, which should further dampen the aggregate trade elasticity uh, for very similar reasons. Okay, sorry, I didn't. So it's true. And this is something the model does not take into account. We do have information on this for trade. We don't have information of, uh, on um, uh, firms output and uh, in particular firms that are producing multiple uh, products. So this is a margin that we do not take into account, although it exists in the data. So it would matter the most if we were to think of uh, shocks that are sector specific, because in that case, it's true that if productivity evolves in a different way across various sectors, then the firm that has that is already like present in those multiple sectors or for those multiple uh, products might uh, have an additional margin of adjustment. So this is true. This is something that we do not take into account, given the type of shocks that we consider, which are really like aggregate shocks affecting all countries, all sectors, etc. Uh, this dimension would not necessarily be, be very important, but of course we know that the reality is more complex than, than this. And if there are multiple uh, shocks affecting heterogeneously uh, multiple sectors, then it's true that there is an additional uh, reason for why large firms might be more able to adjust because they have this uh, uh, structure of diversification. To some extent, this is true as well of the geographic distribution. We expect large firms to be better diversified because they tend to 
export to multiple countries, to import from multiple countries. What we see in the data is that even though this is true on average, uh, there is still a, a very strong degree, of, a very strong lack of diversification in firms uh, uh, trade exposure, uh, which uh, implies that even when the shocks are country specific, we still have a lot of action uh, in the transmission of the shock uh, coming from uh, granularity in the data. And this is especially true when we think of the input sourcing. So basically what I'm saying here is that it's not true that large firms are all equally exposed to foreign shock because they are very idiosyncratic in terms of where they're sourcing their inputs from. And this is very important once we start thinking of the role of these firms as a source of propagation of shocks because their idiosyncratic decisions on where to source their inputs from has a very important uh, uh, consequences for uh, the type of shocks and the, 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 the magnitude of the transmission of shocks across uh, um, to the domestic economy itself. All right, thank you very much, Isabel, for a very interesting uh, presentation about the heterogeneity of firms and importance uh, in trade. Um, we will now move on to our second presenter uh, for this session, uh, Alexander Mihailov, who is an associate professor here at the University of Reading. Um, his research areas are international macro and finance, monetary theory, political macro and socioeconomic dynamics. He has a very uh, varied uh, set of interests he writes about. Uh, in addition to helping put together uh, this uh, session here today, uh, he's the director of the Economic Analysis Research Group at Reading, and he's a co-founder and co-organizer of the European Workshop on uh, Political Macroeconomics. Uh, today, Alex is going to talk about optimal policy if inequality also matters. Alex, over to you. Thank you, Mark. I'm just trying to share my screen now. Right, so um, it's my pleasure and honor to be part of this uh, lineup of prominent speakers in this conference. In fact, when I was thinking about organizing it, it was kind of a um, showing uh, the various dimensions, various aspects in which current macro is updating and developing. Now, uh, my talk is uh, based on a paper with uh, co-authors, as you can see here, Paul Levine, who is in the next session presenting a different paper, Stephen McKnight and Jonathan Swarbrick. Um, and uh, the, the title of the paper, it's still work in progress. We hope to complete it soon and to put it online is limited asset market participation and monetary policy in a small open economy. I have changed a bit the title of the talk to better suit this session. So I'm going to focus on, on one uh, or one of the major aspects of our paper, the analytical part, the theoretical part, which is fully derived. And it's about optimal policy. If equality also matters, equality across two types of agents. So this paper belongs to this particular session because I think, yeah, I'm sure these are the two uh, papers, the only two papers in the program that are open economy papers, where, whereas Isabel's talk was mostly on uh, heterogeneous firms, which are very rich dimension of heterogeneity and very data oriented, very database. Our paper is more of a theoretical paper where we do uh, not have that rich heterogeneity. We have two types of consumers, not firms. But um, uh, so, um, so the important point is to, to figure out analytically what could policy uh, do in a model where agents are not equal because of their constraints, uh, although they have equal utility functions, identical utility functions. So the plan of my talk, uh, I will start with uh, introducing these consumer types uh, and how this uh, feature of limited asset market participation integrates, uh, combines with trade openness, because that's, that's the center of our, of our interest. Otherwise, we have a very, very uh, state-of-the-art uh, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model of a small open economy, which has a uh, rich production, production structure with wholesale sales sector and retail sector. And we do a numerical analysis in addition to what I'm going to show you here analytically. So. Uh, the model is really uh, quite uh, rich and, and complete, but I'm not going to have time to focus on its numerical analysis. I'm going to focus mostly on the theoretical results we are able to derive in a simplified uh, analytic version of the model. 
So I will show you these two elements of the model that are important for understanding what happens in the aggregate economy, what generates the different types of, consum of consumers, and then how this affects uh, the structure of the economy, which will be the constraint when the social planner or the decentralized markets are going to optimize. So my focus will be on the welfare theoretical analysis uh, that we derive a uh, few propositions, basically uh, novel results uh, arising from the combination of limited asset market participation and openness, which hasn't been done in the literature. And that's basically our major contribution. So um, this literature on limited asset market participation is in fact at least 30 years old, goes back to a series of papers by John Campbell and, and Greg Mankiw related to the, pers uh, to the permanent income hypothesis, uh, which was one of the major research topics back at that time. So they divide consumers into patient. These are consumers that are Euler equation optimizers. They are into temporal optimizers. There are also, however, in society, other type of consumers, which they call impatient. That's the original work by Campbell and Mankiw. And uh, these uh, impatient consumers have been uh, known later I think Greg Mankio invented this term uh, in 2000, rule of thumb cons consumers, and he defines them as following the simple rule of thumb of consuming their current income. These agents are variously uh, addressed in the literature using alternative names, which mean the same thing, hand to mouth consumers, non-asset holders, current income consumers. Basically, that's the definition. They consume their current income. They cannot optimize intertemporally. They don't have an Euler equation in their optimization problem. Now, I started to explain that what we have here is really a two agent type New Keynesian model, which is known in the literature as a tank model. It's not a fully fledged heterogeneous agent New Keynesian model, Hank, uh, which uh, I guess uh, Jesus Fernandez Villaverde in his session later on will describe mechanisms, how we can be more realistic and, and solve these models. But why are we doing this tank model? Um, it seems that it's a good first approximation to, uh, to, to types of agents. You know, uh, in macro, one of the major problems is how detailed is aggregation, how realistic is aggregation. So uh, maybe we don't need uh, 1,000 types of agents and 1,000 types of firms. Maybe we need five or six. So in that sense, uh, the two agent um, New Keynesian model is the first step away, for, away from the representative agent. And as I, as I said, recent literature by De Bortoli and Galli and Bilbi shows that these are good approximations. Apart from that, uh, my, my analysis is related to a topic that's very popular uh, in the recent six or eight years, especially after the publication of Thomas Piketty's book. So income inequality and um, a number of authors, basically Aguiar and Bills and co-authors in recent papers have found that consumption inequality tracks very well income inequality. And they also estimate in a very recent paper, which was a surprising uh, thing to me, 40% of the US households are hands to mouth uh, based on the panel study of income uh, dynamics. So I go back to the data to motivate the two features that we put in our model and that haven't been explored together in, in the related literature. Let me focus first on the first line of pie charts. It shows from right to left, the proportion, the fraction of Euler optimizers, so Ricardian agents, um, consumers who optimize intertemporally relative to current income uh, um, spenders. These are the hands to mouth consumers, the, the purple small sector. And as we go from high income economies to low income economies, we can see how much more important this uh, hand to mouth sector becomes, about 80, 85% in low income countries. Doing the same in the second line where trade openness is shown, we see that high income countries are generally much more open, whereas low income countries are less open. So these are relevant features of the reality which we want to capture in our analytical exercise. The full description of the data is here. I'm jumping over this slide in the interest of um, time because I have shown it in terms of graphs. So um, the closest literature to us is closed economy literature, basically, our model is, um, the analytical part of our model integrates the work by Florin Bilby in 2008 in uh, JET and um, the work by uh, Jordi Galli and Tommaso Monacelli in the Review of Economic Studies in 2005. So uh, Galli and Monacelli is a representative standard new, open, new Keynesian uh, small open economy model. They don't have uh, two types of agents. They don't know, they don't have this uh, Ricardian and, and credit constraint consumers. Florin Bilby, 
uh, is not an open economy paper, but he introduces the types of consumers. So we combine these features with these two models. And why this is interesting? This is interesting because Bill B finds in closed economy that this feature, limited asset market participation, alters the transmission mechanism of monetary policy in a very curious way. You know, we teach our uh, students even in year one that uh, if the real interest rate goes up, that would in induce a contractionary effect on aggregate demand through um, basically increasing saving, reducing spending. Uh, but uh, this is not the case when uh, a substantial fraction in society are, are hand-to-mouth consumers. And this is a result uh, discovered by, by Florin Bilby analytically. He terms this inverted aggregate demand logic. So in this case, uh, opposite to the, to the conventional logic, an increase in the real interest rate leads to um, not a contractionary, but expansionary effect on aggregate demand. And moreover, um, when you have this uh, Yaddle region, this inverted aggregate demand logic, the Taylor principle, which is basic rule of central bank to operate monetary policy, basically the aggressiveness, they have to respond more than one to one to expected inflation in order to, to steer the economy to uh, determine the equilibrium. So this principle is also reversed when, uh, Yaddle, uh, when we are in the Yaddle region. So basically we wanna study um, combination of a small open economy like Galli and Monacelli, but not having only a representative agent. And our contributions are along two dimensions. So uh, in addition to the richness of uh, the numerical results, we are, we are still at this stage when we want to uh, confirm the analytical results through numerical simulations. So that's what we have to finish in this paper. But apart from that, analytically, we are ready with uh, these two, uh, two aspects of the paper. We study equilibrium determinacy under interest rate rules and in particular interest rate with inertia and price level tar targeting, which is novel to the literature. And we have some interesting results which kind of reverse what we know about these interest rate rules. And then we study the second aspect of uh, the second way to model monetary policy through a, through a central bank uh, objective function, which is micro-founded following uh, Rottenberg and Woodford. And uh, we, we find different ways of um, approximating such a model depending on different concepts of what is the underlying equilibrium concept of the economy. So I'm going to talk more about this in my talk. To give you a flavor of where the difference in consumers uh, arises from, let me look at the utility function first. It's the same for both agents. In the general model, we keep it isoelastic where the coefficient of relative risk conversion sigma is allowed to be different from one. But to, in order to uh, get analytical results, we have to uh, do what the literature does. By the way, we are, we are here in a company of about uh, a dozen papers, which generally, if you want to have some analytical results on that, you have to specialize to logarithmic utility, given uh, also the open economy dimension. Now, even if this seems a restriction, uh, we can argue that uh, we know from the real business cycle literature, since the time of King, Closer and Rebello, that uh, logarithmic consumption basically matches well balanced growth path in uh, long run uh, growth theory. So it is. it may not be as restrictive as it may seem initially. This slide here, opposite to the previous one, shows where the difference between the two types of agents comes from. Uh, so uh, they have identical utility, but they have different budget constraints. The Ricardian consumers or the R type, they are, to, they are conventional intertemporal oiler consumption optimizers and their budget constraint is quite rich. They can save in domestic bonds and in foreign bonds. Therefore, the nominal exchange rate enters here. They get wage income from working uh, a number of hours net of tax. They get uh, rents from capital and uh, they can consume and invest. They can also receive nominal profits from dividends and possibly there is a tax, um, there is a lump sum tax uh, which the government can operate. They can, um, they differ in, so they differ, the Ricardian agents differ from the credit consumer, from the credit constraint agents by their budget constraint. The, the credit constraint consumers, they can only consume their wage uh, income net of taxes uh, and uh, possibly the government may want to transfer or not to them. So when we aggregate that in the model, the model economy in the simple analytical version of, um, of the model, which we use to derive the analytical results is basically a textbook uh, New Keynesian model where the aggregate demand curve, which is the New Keynesian highest curve here. And on the next slide, the New Keynesian Phillips curve, they, they, have a, uh, they, they look a bit tricky, they have a change, 
So here the change in this curve is this delta coefficient, right? Uh, remember that sigma is one, so otherwise sigma would appear here. That reflects the sensitivity and it's negative of the output gap or aggregate demand relative to the deviation of the real interest rate from its long run steady state value. This is the conventional channel with the minus sign, but this minus sign can be converted into positive sign when the second term here, the second bit in the definition of alpha, which combines our home bias parameter. So one minus WC is openness, lambda is financial inclusion, so one minus lambda is financial exclusion. These are the lamp agents. So the two features of our economy happen to, um, convol to, to, to um, combine here in this convoluted um, composite parameter delta together with the free shell elasticity. And so depending on the size of this that can reverse the sign, we can have the Yaddle effect as in, in Bill B. That's, uh, regarding the new Keynes, that's regarding the new Keynesian IS curve, which is the aggregate demand curve. And so in this graph, I here show how trade openness in fact mitigates, that's known from the literature. You can see here uh, three curves. They are drawn all for the same um, fresh elasticity of two, and um, they have a different um, degree of openness. So the blue curve is the most open economy, uh, 0.5 home bias. The black curve is the most closed economy, 0.9 home bias. So my point here is to look at the region above the zero line between the blue curve and the, and the black curve. As we move away from fully integrated uh, agents in financial markets, so as we move into hand and mouth consumption from right to left, this openness gains a particular region on the plus sign. So it saves, it mitigates the problem with the Taylor principle that will be established earlier. We have some intuition about that. The more open the economy, the less domestic output depends on the small open economy real interest rate. And then the higher the financial exclusion, the less domestic output also depends on this real interest rate because this hand to mouth consumer, the fraction that they, uh, the larger their fraction, they spend their current income, they, they do not really, uh, they, they do that irrespective of the real interest rate or inflation. So the second equation in the basic New Keynesian model, which is really the constraint of the optimization problem in our analytical part is the New Keynesian Phillips curve. And again, similarly to uh, the previous case, it looks very much like the standard textbook case. However, this kappa is a composite parameter now constituted of two other parameters. This is the standard one we know from the literature and delta is a new addition, which comes from again, combination convolution of these two parameters, the home bias and the degree of uh, lamp or uh, financial exclusion. So now it's, it's only the slope. The slope becomes more, um, because we derive analytically uh, these derivatives here. So we can say that uh, this delta had therefore kappa, therefore the slope of the Phillips curve depends positively on trade openness, right? This is home bias, change the sign positively on trade openness and positively on exclusion because lambda is inclusion, right? So the intuition here we have for the time being is that uh, the more open the economy, the more domestic inflation by the increased share of imported inputs depends on the small open economy's output gap. So this sensitivity here is increased. The higher the financial inclusion, the more domestic inflation through the spending of um, hand to mouth consumers, uh, which increases the aggregate demand depends on the output gap. So, um, so far I have talked about the kind of positive aspects of the exercise we are doing, what the economy is, what, what, we, what do we know about the transmission mechanism of such an economy in terms of the New Keynesian uh, IS uh, curve and New Keynesian Phillips curve. Now my focus in this second part of the talk uh, will be on, um, on the essence that I want to convey today. This is about uh, the welfare theoretic analysis, which uh, is um, about uh, generally uh, understanding what's in this economy is um, efficient and, uh, and uh, could there be also equality between the agents if that is an objective for society? Does it cost anything? Is there a trade-off between equality and, and efficiency? Uh, and so we are going to look into this in the standard framework uh, following uh, basically uh, Woodford and Rottenberg in closed economy. So uh, it is known in closed economy that um, these new Keynesian models suffer from suboptimality of their production because of the markup which is charged, this is the gross markup here, defined in terms of the degree of substitutability across the differentiated products. So because of this gross markup, because of the market power of firms, uh, it turns out, I will show that formally in a few slides later related to our model, 
it turns out that um, employment is suboptimally low and, and out output is suboptimally low. So the, um, there might be an employment subsidy uh, in this new Keynesian literature that is a typical instrument which can offset completely this, this um, distortion. This is a market distortion. So I'm now talking about, because if we want to talk about policy, we should enumerate, uh, we should list and address, but potentially address the imperfections or the distortions in this economy. There are three market distortions in our model and three behavioral ones. I start with the market distortions here. Those in the closed economy are well-known, market power and uh, relative price dis dispersion. There is a third one which arises in the open economy. This is known since the uh, classical literature in open economy, uh, the trade wars, the, the, the depreciation wars, the terms of trade incentive of a central bank to favor domestic households. Now, how does it, this is also, of course, uh, repeated in later work by Corsetti and Pezzenti in the new open economy macro style and Gali and Monacelli uh, in the new Keynesian small open economy. So how can an, a small open economy basically influence uh, the price of their products? This is not typical for a, for a, for a non, uh, for a competitive small open economy. That would not be the case. There are models like Goodfriend and King, which assume that the price of the domestic goods is, is determined in our market, so then you cannot really price your output. However, the, the typical feature of the new Keynesian small open economy model is that because of this imperfect substitutability between domestic and, and foreign differentiated products combined with price rigidity, which allows short-term real effects of monetary policy, in fact, uh, monopolistic producers, firms are also price setters of their differentiated product, right? So um, this is the third market imperfection. Gali and Monacelli have exactly this kind of model with a representative agent, and they design an, a subsidy which, which, which offsets exactly the combined distortions of market power and price rigidity and thought manipulation, terms of trade manipulation. We will have something similar in our efficient equilibrium. However, this efficient equilibrium will not be equitable in the sense that agents will not have the same consumption and hours in the steady state. So uh, there are three behavioral uh, assumptions that I think are novel in, in our setup, especially the number two and number three, because um, the, first, the first behavioral assumption is already in the domestic economy, New Keynesian model by Bilby. So these credit constra constraint agents, they are, they are deprived of the ability to allocate part of their wealth to ownership of shares in domestic firms, right? By, by our assumption that they just consume their budget constraint, they cannot save. Moreover, in an international market, that would be the same for foreign dividends, so they cannot uh, own foreign firms. And finally, when we assume complete asset markets in, in international consumption risk sharing, following Gali and Monacelli, so these I agents also are deprived of risk sharing, whereas the Ricardian agents can share risk internationally. So there are three additional uh, behavioral distortions which policy might wish to address, neutralize partially or fully, Again, we don't come here with a definite conclusion. We are just doing the mathematics, still trying to understand the intuition and trying to compare the trade-offs. So uh, I said that uh, I will show you a little bit more formally, which also appears in our model, why, why these uh, new Keynesian economies are suboptimal. Basically, it boils down to the fact that in the steady state, the marginal rate of substitution between hours and consumption um, is not equal to the marginal product of labor and to the real wage because of this wedge here, one minus phi. Phi is the wedge of inefficiency defined in terms of the gross markup. The larger the gross markup, the bigger the inefficiency. So it shrinks because this is a fraction, it shrinks the, the value of the real wage relative to the marginal product of labor. So the real wage is suboptimally low. Therefore, the output um, and the hours that people provide the employment are suboptimally low. And, and the new Keynesian setup in this sense is not first best, is not optimal. Right, so uh, when we uh, analyze uh, optimal policy, we have to uh, define an optimization problem. This optimization problem following Rottenberg and Utwell should be linked to the consumer's utility or felicity function. So, so it should be aggregated up from, from the utility functions of the, of the, of the of the consumers, now we have two types that will be aggregated in a utilitarian way by the proportion of, of their fraction in the population. And in the past, these models were solved about uh, deterministic and constant steady states. So there is no time, time indexing here. And this deterministic steady state was normally the flex price equilibrium, which is called the, norm, the natural rate in the new Keynesian literature. But the natural rate, because of the features of the new Keynesian model is not efficient, it's suboptimal, so there is uh, 
another kind of uh, uh, benchmark, which is the efficient equilibrium. And now we, we introduce following Florin Bilby here a different type of equilibrium, which is the so-called equitable equilibrium, where agents in the steady state are the same in terms of how much they consume and how much hours they supply to the labor market. So three possible definitions in our setup, and they may be deterministic and constant, but the most recent, the more li recent literature uh, generally approximates um, to the second order, the, the, the um, uh, function for optimization, the social welfare function around uh, stochastic and time varying baselines. So not steady states really, but a baseline which is time varying and stochastic. And we are going to see uh, three corresponding ones which are the flexible uh, laissez-faire market equilibrium, which is distorted. It's neither efficient nor optimal, and we, we, find that, we find that mathematically. There is another equilibrium which is efficient but not equitable, and there is a third equilibrium which is equitable but not efficient. So there are, the interesting result of our work so far is that uh, there, there arises a trade-off between equality and efficiency. The economy cannot be in, in these two worlds, it, it has a, a limit of choice, which is potentially uh, the, uh, the, the job of our politicians, policy, policy makers, and, and some consensus in society, some constitutional agreement. Now, to move to, the, to a few analytical results, uh, let me see how much time I have, five, five, six minutes, Mark? Yeah, you've got about six or seven minutes. Right, so uh, we simplify the model to a log utility and um, unitary uh, sigma and unitary uh, elasticity of substitution and no fixed costs. And again, I'm saying this, uh, all open economy macro literature basically does it when, when we uh, strive for analytical results. We have these uh, two um, uh, subsidies here, subsidy schemes. The first one is basically the same as is in Galilean Monacelli and it ensures an efficient equilibrium. But as I said, this scheme is not, is not um, equitable in the same time. This, as you can see, is a tax subsidy on firms, F for firms, and it depends on openness, not on, on lambda. If we want to ensure an equitable equilibrium there in the, in the, in the um, following uh, Bill B in the closed economy setup, we have to introduce an additional tax subsidy here to the C to the credit constraint, uh, credit constraint household. So H is for households. And this ensures equitable but not efficient equilibrium. Uh, so uh, basically we have an interesting decomposition, I think in our paper where generally we can present the deviation of output from the equitable allocation as a multiplication of three relative terms. The first one is the standard output gap in New Keynesian models, a deviation from uh, natural rate of output. The second one is deviation of the natural rate from the efficient one. And the third one is the deviation of the efficient from the equitable one. Right, so here is the result of our several pages of algebra to arrive, to arrive at a micro-founded um, uh, macro founded social welfare function. The first term, the quadratic terms in terms of in inflation variability and output variability are kind of standard. In any kind of New Keynesian setup where we have um, some sort of suboptimality, there is a third term here, this linear term in, in the output gap which arises. This is known in closed economy, it's in the Dalis textbook, but in our case, it has a richer structure. So we denote this by lambda xi because i can be one of the three possible approximations of our model with the three being efficient one. So if we are in the efficient steady state, the lambda term will, act, will um, vanish and we will have, because the state is efficient, we will just have a pure quadratic function without any linear term. The linear terms appear when we have um, this phi uh, inefficiency. Uh, so this term only is exactly as in the Gali textbook with distorted steady state. What our model brings is this additional uh, lambda x1 term defined here, you can see defined, it depends on openness exactly. So the combination of openness and uh, lamp plus the pressure elasticity. So basically we uh, can interpret this uh, linear term here in terms of the suboptimality, it captures the fact that any marginal increase in the output gap relative to the steady state value has positive first order effect on welfare. So welfare loss defined here decreases, that's why the minus sign. Because the output is suboptimally low, any push of the central bank above the steady state has a positive uh, influence on agents' welfare. I am uh, going to show you only this final result before I conclude. This is the inflation, the optimal central bank policy, the optimal 
uh, targeting rule under inflation. The targeting rule is the solution of the optimization problem by the central bank. Here we assume discretion on the next slide. Uh, we assume commitment. I'm not going to talk about the, the, the commitment case in the interest of time, but it is very similar to uh, what I'm going to describe here. So you can see that the final solution is some prescription for the central bank to manipulate the output gap negatively. So in the opposite direction of the, in this case, it's the contemporaneous inflation. It could be a forward looking inflation uh, rule. So this is known as, as leaning against the wind in the literature. So the central bank leans against the wind. Uh, the central bank has to engineer a negative output gap for some periods until inflation is brought down. That's what the targeting rule basically means. This targeting rule, because of the inefficiency, has this additional term. Of course, this will vanish in the third case of uh, I equals three when the equilibrium is efficient, but it will stay uh, in, in the other two cases of um, equitable and um, distorted equilibrium. So we have some enrichment of the literature here uh, coming out from our two features. And basically our interpretation is that trade openness here via the uh, derivative signs uh, requires a more aggressive, just similar to the influence on the steepness of the, of the new Keynesian Phillips curve. Uh, we have a kappa here because of the delta that is ingredient of kappa and because of these derivatives. So kappa is more aggressive in our model relative to the, the other models, uh, meaning it's higher. And this is, uh, this is uh, implied by the, uh, the uh, uh, features of, um, so the higher the trade openness, the higher the financial exclusion, the more aggressive the central bank should be. And we interpret that the more the economy is open, the less the output gap depends on, on domestic inflation and more other external factors. So the central bank should be more aggressive. And also the higher is the fraction of um, credit constrained consumers. They just spend, they don't bother about interest rates or inflation. So they don't look at these, they, they, these, these values don't influence much their decision. That's why the central banks uh, has to be more aggressive. So um, if I have a minute to conclude, I would just conclude on this slide. What we have done so far, and still I'm saying this is work in progress, we want to test this, uh, this um, we, first want, we first want to, to find, uh, to, to think on the, the interpretations of these results, analytical results, and then we want to verify them numerically in the big model with capital and investment and, and two tires of production. But what we have so far is really um, an analysis of the joint influence of trade openness and financial exclusion, first on equilibrium determinacy, determinacy on which I didn't talk, and then on optimal monetary fiscal policy. The interesting result on determinacy, which I skipped in the interest of interest, is that we find results that are different from the usual case. Under the inverted aggregate demand uh, logic, openness increases rather than decreases, which is in the standard case, and policy inertia decreases rather than increases. So this is reversed determinacy. Uh, and equilibria not always exist in some of these regions. Now, when we come to optimal policy, I basically uh, showed you the results. I think the main takeaway message is that we find this trade-off between efficiency and equality beyond the distorted allocation, uh, which is uncorrected by policy. In future work, we already think about enriching this model. And two obvious ways to go about it is to go to, into bounded rationality, especially the version of internal rationality introduced by Adam and Marseille because we, so far we have just rational agents. Uh, and the other way is we have a small open economy, so we don't have strategic interactions between the central banks. They do not play, play ga games against each other. And we may have a two country uh, analysis in the same setup. And it's interesting because the contrasting performance of price level targeting suggests perhaps a new case for international policy coordination. Thank you very much for your attention and apologies for the slight delay. All right, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, there are a couple of questions here. The first one's from Christopher Martin, uh, who says C types are assumed to receive no profits from retail firms. How important is that assumption? This is an absolutely important assumption. It's it's crucial assumption because it um, makes uh, this, this type of agent uh, inferior to the other. So. Uh, we don't look here at the reasons why this happens. In the data I showed you, this was uh, illustrated by World Bank data on adults who have uh, um, a, an account in a bank. And it turns out that in many low income countries, a huge fraction of, of individuals do not have bank accounts. They are deprived from financial markets. They cannot therefore save. So the point here by introducing these credit constraint cons consumers is to to capture in a very 
stylized and abstract way this type heterogeneity, but it's crucial for what we find because, yeah, if, if these agents are Ricardian, we wouldn't speak about two types of agents. There wouldn't be an issue of inequality at all as in the standard Gary Monacelli model. But in the Bilby closed economy model, of course, there are two types of agents. However, there is no open economy dimension there. So what Bilby does is uh, through redistribution of fiscal policy, he makes the agents equal in the steady state. And that's what he calls equitable equilibrium, which we also discussed, but in our richer setup. All right, and a second question along kind of the same lines about the assumption here. Um, going back to the initial assumptions, how realistic do you think this notion of naive consumer is in reality? Wouldn't lower income households realize that they need some level of precautionary savings in order to face unwanted uh, exogenous shocks to their income? So again, this is very interesting. I think uh, speaking generally, uh, we live in societies. These societies are different. Uh, the fractions of this society are different kinds of individuals. Maybe some of these uh, poorest slayers in the society, they would very much like to save, they would very much like to invest, but maybe their current income doesn't allow it. So they are, they are bound to be hand-to-mouth consumers. Uh, this could be a very uh, blatant uh, um, comparison, very uh, literal comparison. You just don't have anything to save. But then if we become more realistic, there will be other layers in society where agents will, have, will be able to save some months a little bit, then there will be agents that are able to save much more, that, that are able to invest, share risk, et cetera. So I don't know. Uh, it's, if we want to be really realistic, we should model heterogeneity across uh, this dimension, precautionary savings, how much an, an, an individual or a household would save in a richer context if we know how to do it. And uh, I know that Jesus is going to propose uh, continuous time methods that solve for richer heterogeneity. So we may carefully look into that, that method if we want to extend along this dimension. But my point was that some individuals may be just constrained, not by their utility as in our case. That's why we think that there might be a, a reason for the redistributions. These agents, they have the same utility, but they don't have the same budget constraint. Again, here we don't study the cause, what produces these different budget constraints, but Realistically, there are different kinds of, of budget constraints and, and uh, different degrees of um, how much you can save. So yeah, a precautionary saving and various degrees of savings could, could enrich the model further. All right, thank you very much, Alex. Those were uh, the questions that uh, they had. So I'd like to thank both Isabel and Alexander for some very interesting discussions that uh, looked at very different dimensions of heterogeneity in macroeconomic models. Uh, we will now have uh, a hour break uh, for lunch, um, and please rejoin us at uh, 1.30 UK time or whatever time it is, wherever you are. Thank you very much. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Welcome back after uh, your lunch break. Uh, I hope it's been a productive uh, lunch break on one of these virtual conferences. We're all experts now on virtual conferences and uh, navigating virtual lunch breaks, coffee breaks and, and the lot. Um, it's great to have you all with us, uh, especially those of you who are now gonna, now will be joining us from, from the other side of the Atlantic, where hopefully it's not a, uh, a kind of hour where you can uh, think about joining. Uh, we're delighted here at the University of Reading to be hosting this event. Um, we're delighted um, for the, uh, the hard work of uh, Alex Mihailov and the Economic Analysis Research Group in putting this together, putting together a wonderful set of speakers. Uh, and this, uh, this particular talk is uh, no exception either. We have two fantastic speakers with really timely and interesting looking papers to come in this session. We have, first of all, um, Paul Levine from the University of Surrey. Uh, and then after that, uh, 2.15 UK time, we're going to have Laura Veldkamp of Columbia Business School uh, presenting. Uh, we'll try and keep things uh, as close as we can to time. So I will uh, badger Paul along and Laura at the various points. Uh, and um, if you want to ask questions, uh, please do use the, uh, the chat function as you've been doing so far today. Uh, and I will relay questions. Uh, when uh, Paul and Laura get to the end of their talks. I'm especially delighted, I always uh, try and pull this card out of the hat uh, when I get the opportunity, but I'm especially delighted in introducing Paul to introduce a fellow Mancunian, 
uh, in this global this global event. Um, it's fantastic to uh, to introduce a, a fellow uh, Mancunian, someone who hails from Manchester. For those who aren't aware, what a Mancunian is for our international audience, uh, Paul uh, has a a, a very uh, esteemed track record. Uh, in macroeconomics uh, and his paper that he's presenting appears to be on an extremely uh, timely question, um, um, namely what can we learn when it comes to impulse response functions uh, about what's actually going on uh, uh, out there, uh, given that we're econometricians uh, and we observe the real world as it is, what can we learn? Uh, and Paul's title is Information, VARs and DSG Models. I whittled on far too long, so Paul, over to you, please take away your talk. Well, thank you for your um, introduction and in, in, invitation. Um, uh, actually, Mancunians are now called a Manc rather than <laughs> <laughs> And I, I do hope you don't support Manchester United. That's no. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me share my screen. Um, so, okay, and um, can everyone see that screen? Is that so? Uh, yeah, we've got your paper now. Yep, you might, if you can make it, I guess, full screen, that's um, yeah, perfect. Right, this is a joint paper with my, first of all, long-standing co-author Joe Perlman, um, and in fact, the um, the subject matter is based on work that goes back some forty years now. Um, uh, Stephen and Bo are more recent uh, co-authors, and um, let me uh, go straight to the first slide which is really a summary of the paper. Um, it's a succinct summary of the paper. Um, the research question is by no means a new one. It actually relates to, to a theme of this, um, this conference, the um, uh, Christopher Sims and the macroeconomics of, of reality, um, where he actually used a, a VAR model to, to model a, a macroeconomy. Um, so my paper is, isn't totally disconnected with the um, with, with the theme of the conference. So the, the research question is, can VAR methods be employed to recover the structural shocks and impulse responses of a data generating process if it is a DSG model? So we we'll, we'll start by assuming the DSG model is a data generating process. I know there'll be members of the audience who don't like that assumption, but I will say a bit about that. But making that assumption can um, a VAR recover um, the structural shocks and can it be used to study the impulse responses in this, the, the, um, the DSG model? It, can it be used to validate them? And can it be used in a sense to, um, to disprove or find faults in the underlying uh, DSG model? An important contribution of our paper actually is in the next bullet point. It, it brings together a number of of quite separate strands of literature. Um, and the first strand is, is really um, some macroeconometrics um, literature, and it's, it's on the issue of fundamentalness and invertibility. Uh, these two terms are used in different parts of the literature. I'll say a little bit more about that as I proceed. And the second strand is on imperfect information in what I call a representative agent model. Again, I'll I'll um, expand on, uh, on why I'm referring to a representative agent model. The third is, if you like, a more recent literature on heterogeneous agent models. And we look at a class of models that distinguish local idiosyncratic information um, and aggregate information. And finally, if fundamentalness, and I'll explain that um, in due course, if it fails, there is a notion of approximate fundamentalness that one can use. So the main results. First, uh, validating a DSG model by comparing its impulse responses with those of a data VAR must take into account the information assumptions in the data generating process. These are information assumptions on the part of both agents and the econometrician. Uh, the uh, second main result is that we demonstrate conditions that relate to these information assumptions for which it's impossible, it's impossible for data VAR to account for the impulse responses of a DSG model. Okay, th this is a somewhat negative conclusion, but I do, um, I do temper it late uh, 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 towards the end 
um, in ways in which I'll explore. So let me start, I'm gonna start really with, uh, if you like, it's a down our tutorial. <laughs> it's a little mini down our tutorial where we start off with a general nonlinear DSG model expressed in terms of that first equation where Y is the, the, the state of, um, it's the state of the economy, the state of macroeconomic variables up to time T. We linearize this about a trend or a steady state, and this gives us equation one. The Y here is the N by one vector of macroeconomic variables. Um, YTS is the expectation of the variable at time T, uh, given the information set. Now the information set is going to consist of observables um, up to that time. And we're going to assume that this is a common information set available to all economic agents at time T. It's important to note here that the A0 matrix can be singular. Um, now the shocks, are uh, Gaussian white noise shocks. They have to be Gaussian for the um, imperfect information solution. Um, and they're, not, they're normally distributed therefore with uh, zero mean. And, and we, 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 we assume it, um, <coughs> that, that, that they are, are normalized at the unit matrix so that the, the variances actually enter into this matrix psi. Now, information. Now we add it measurements. We distinguish the measurements of the econometrician, this expression here, and the measurements of the agents in the model. And for much of the paper, we're going to assume that the observables are the same, but the information um, uh, mappings um, are, 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 are different. So, um, um, so just to summarize this, that uh, MTE is a vector of, of observable variables of dimension M. Um, and we're going to um, confine ourselves to the case where the dimensions of the shocks is greater than M. Um, so this avoids the stochastic singularity problem when we come to um, estimate this. So MTE is, is a vector of, obs of observables up to the maximum they can observe the full state and th th this is the case of perfect information. So let's, um, let's turn to expectations and information assumptions. Um, in the new shocks literature agents observe, uh, just observe the, the, the so-called new shocks but the econometrician does not so that in this case agents have got more information than the econometrician. This is the so-called famous missing information problem. Um, it's a missing information on the part of the, the econometrician. And in, all, in the textbook and, and in the standard econometrics literature, this is the, the, the highlighted cause of non-fundamentalness. Um, I, I would at this point mention a very interesting paper by Lubick who, who generalizes our setup to allow for agents with different in perfect information sets. Uh, but the main assumption, the, the, the main point in this slide really is, is the default assumption. In Dynar, the default that's not even mentioned is that agents have got perfect information. So in other words, if we just go back to this slide, the, this matrix LA is the, is the unit matrix. So when we press stochastic simulation in Dynar, this is the information assumption that's made. Now the question then is, how does the econometrician's problem change if agents don't have this perfect information but instead have imperfect information? At this point, I should just make a note about terminology. Um, imperfect information is also known as incomplete, also known as, as partial, also known as private, sometimes all this is referred to as an informational friction. Um, I know the terminology is, is confusing and I have to say Joe and I have contributed to this, that we've used incomplete, partial and private in, in, in different times in different papers. Um, but we're now settled on imperfect information. 
So the next question on the next slide I want to consider is, can a representative agent model actually assume imperfect information? Uh, can it make sense? So let me try and make sense of a rational expectations model with imperfect information. Now this starts with a, a comment by in this paper by Svensson and Woodford that if in an RA model, all private agents have a common information set, then they must have full information about the relevant state variables. The, the common information set can't be an imperfect information set. It can't exclude some of the state variables. Otherwise, they would have no impact on the economy. That's their reasoning. Now, there's a deeper uh, reason or link between the representative agent model and information in Ragnar, <coughs> who establishes that under conditions of complete markets, which after all an RA model is, the market equilibrium must usually imply a revelation of perfect information. Um, uh, this is explored in, in further in, in a paper by my, my co-author Stephen um, and, uh, and, and Graham, uh, Liam Graham. Okay, a third uh, possible reason why it makes no sense is, is that Arrow de Brewer contracts re require perfect information. So these first three bullet points indicates that it makes no sense to assume in a representative agent model that agents have imperfect information. However, it does make sense in a limiting case of a heterogeneous agent problem. So let me just move to a heterogeneous agent a generalization of, of what we started with. I want to generalize the first equation by adding all these terms in red. Now, as, as well as an aggregate model, which is what you had before in one, we, we have a model of decisions by agents, on, if you like, on islands, decisions of households and firms on islands and expectations of those firms on islands, uh, given by this extra dynamics in terms of the uh, individual agents' decisions and in terms of the aggregates. Why T2 now is purely an aggregate um, that doesn't involve individual decisions. It would include, for instance, exogenous shock processes. Now the link between the global variables and the uh, and the island variables are on this, this this next bullet point. You just integrate over the the individual decisions, um, and we also have global shocks. So we have idiosyncratic shocks and global shocks. And we have to generalize the the, the, the measurements. Um, again, we have the aggregate measurement equation here, and then the idiosyncratic or the island measurement equation in, involves these extra terms and an idiosyncratic shock. Um, again, um, when we aggregate over the, the idiosyncratic shocks, uh, uh, these sum to zero. <coughs> and um, if we actually exclude the idiosyncratic shocks, um, then we're back to the, um, the uh, uh, model, the representative agent model um, uh, represented by one. Um, now we can talk about perfect information with idiosyncratic shocks uh, on the assumption that agents observe those idiosyncratic shocks, but that's not a, a particularly interesting case. Now this is a special case, there are special cases um, of, 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 of this model. Um, given in the, the, these various equations. Um, um, and, um, and the number of papers by Nymark, um, my co-author Stephen and Liam Graham um, have a, an important paper in this area. Rodrina and, and Walker is another important paper. Angelitos, whoa. Angelitos in particular is, is an industry in this area and it's published a lot. Um, there's another paper that we refer to in our paper by Forney et al. Um, that has no saddle path dynamics and has a particular property that, that in fact is not general. Um, now the next um, bullet points is an encompassing setup that encompasses all of these cases. Um, and um, I, I move quickly just to make this point about um, the um, a finite state space um, a solution. Um, 
until um, until Rodini and Walker and came along, the the way one solved this model was to set up a hierarchy of expectations, where agents form expectations of other agents' expectations, and so on. And one looked at the convergence of this hierarchy. Now, in fact, we can completely avoid that complication using the new techniques that Rodina, Rodina I should say, and Walker have, have pioneered. And Joe and I have done some, some more work on this that I'm going to report. So um, let me let go to the first theorem of, of the paper. Um, uh, by the way, how, how long have I had? Because, I, because you, 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 you did introduce me. There was a long talk about Manchester at the beginning. <laughs> You've had uh, just about uh, 16 minutes or so, Paul. Okay, right. Um, okay, theorem one shows how to map equation one into Blanchard Kahn form. And, and what we see is we have these extra terms that are not invo involved in, <coughs> in equation one. Uh, they involve current expectations of current variables. Remember, under imperfect information that they're not observed. Um, and so the, uh, um, and the measurement equation of, of the agents is generalized in this way. Um, in the standard Blanchard Kahn setup, we have two types of variables. We have uh, a, a predetermined variables or backward variables, ZT, and forward looking variables or jump variables, XT. And if you take out those red terms, you would see a, set, a setup that you should be familiar with. And going back to the, this special case, this is one of perfect information. Um, again, if you, um, if, if you specialize M and M1, M2, and M3 and M4, you're back to the model without those terms in red, which is perfect information. So let me um, I go through the imperfect information solution. Um, now, following work that I mentioned that Joe and I have been working on for, for many decades now, we, we apply the, the Kalman filter updating, and this is given by the, these, the, these, these two uh, bullet points. Um, uh, the Kalman uh, filter forms the best estimator of variables at time t based on the on, on the estimates at time t minus one of current variables and based on this, this linear combination of the, uh, the prediction error where x is the, the Kalman filter. Now this looks very much like adaptive expectations but in the Kalman filter, um, this is not x, uh, I mean k, k is endogenous, <laughs> it's given by this relationship and is given in particular by the um, in terms of the, the Riccati equation, which is on the next page. Everything else here is in terms of the fundamentals in this um, setup here. Um, so this is actually is the most important slide in, in the presentation. Um, and it generalizes the BK solution to include a process that describes the prediction errors given by the prediction error, the, the one period ahead prediction error of, of Z and it gives this solution where if you take away everything in red, you're back to the standard Blanchard Kahn saddle pass solution that um, I think everybody doing an advanced macro course should, should recognize. What you add are these extra terms and they're extra terms in the prediction errors. And you can see they, they add richer dynamics to the, to the model. They make the, the dynamics more complex. And it's these terms in red that are going to drive all the results in, in, in the rest of the talk. Um, what's, um, everything here is in terms of, of the fundamental the matrices defining the model, apart from the Riccati equation matrix PA, which is a solution of this equation here. Um, now this is a steady state solution. It's when all the Kalman filter learning settles down and um, we'll look for a positive definite solution of the Riccati equation. It's well known that um, there's a, a unique, um, there is a, a solution and it's unique under quite mild conditions, um, which um, 
if you're a control theorist, you would recognize as observable, observability and controllability. Um, again, you can go back to the agent under perfect information. It's a special case um, where M1 is the unit matrix and M2 is zero. In this case, the um, J is equal to the unit matrix. And the Riccati equation simply reduces to the covariance matrix of the shock. So there's nothing to solve. Um, theorem one. Um, the theorem one re relates to the limiting case. Um, the, the limiting case is when the covariance matrix um, of the idiosyncratic shocks becomes very large. In other words, it, it's, a, it's a model where the idiosyncratic uncertainty by far outweighs the aggregate uncertainty. Um, so although agents receive signals about the composite shock, you remember the, the measurement equation, the, the, the signal of the aggregate shock is too noisy to make any inferences about it. So this takes us back to the, um, therefore in the limiting case to our model of imperfect information. Um, in our ongoing work, um, we are uh, working on the non-limiting case. Um, and to summarize then, at this point, we have a, a perfect information, an imperfect information solution to our RE linearized solution, where the imperfect information solution is the limiting case of a heterogeneous agent model. So that's where we are at this point. Um, so this takes me to the A, B, C, and D of VARs. And uh, here I want to summarize the um, work of um, Fernando Villaverde, who's, um, who's also giving a paper and may be looking on at the moment. Um, <clears throat> and um, the starting point of this is, is a log linearized RE solution of a DSG model with this can be either perfect or imperfect information. It has the following state space form. Well, these, this is the state, this is A, B, C, and D. I've used tildes because I'm using A, B, C, and D for other things later on. Um, and you can see S is, a, is, is the state. Again, M, T, E is, is the state of observables. Um, we must have that this matrix has got stable eigenvalues. Um, um, MTE um, is M by one. The number of fundamental shocks is, 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 is K. And again, we must have, we must have more shocks than observables. Um, and certainly we can't have less shocks than observables. Otherwise we have the stochastic um, um, singularity problem. Now note I have the, 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 this notation, this E, we introduce in order to make the subsequent uh, analysis simpler. It doesn't change anything fundamental. So the first result is the, uh, the poor man's advertibility condition, um, which um, I'll come straight down to here. It consists of a rank condition, and it consists of a stability condition, in which case we can back out the shocks by solving for the state space representation and we get an infinite var. So the, um, the equations four and five, a little bit of algebra um, gives you this. Expanding the series, we get this. As long as we have this matrix as non-singular, that's the rank condition. As long as this summation um, converges, these are, this is the state. In other words, these, this matrix here has got stable eigenvalues. Then the summation exists and this is the infinite bar representation of our model. Um, now, um, now, what happens if this invertibility condition fails? Now, the, the, now this is most important because the, the failure of invertibility is, is all pervasive in, in DSG models. If it fails, there exists a so-called innovations representation in terms of the one period ahead prediction error. So this is the one period prediction error of the observables for the econometrician. Um, this is the innovation. And the resulting VAR that the econometrician estimates is not what she thinks it is. It's not the, the VAR in the fundamentals. It's the VAR in these, the, these innovations. If the system is invertible, all is well. 
because the innovation is, is a linear combination of, of the structural shocks. Um, and what this suggests that in the case of, of non invertibility, where this relationship doesn't hold, is a measure of non fundamentalness which re regresses um, the structural shocks on the innovations and uses a standard ordinary least squares measure of goodness of fit. Um, under uh, invertibility, th th uh, this is going to be zero. Uh, this is for each shock. Um, but we can use this to indicate the, um, the breakdown of fundamentalness for individual shocks. If it's close to one, then we can conclude that fundamentalness is not that important for this shock. And one further important bullet point is that in the absence of invertibility, one must use the imperfect information solution to compute A. I'll come back to that. Um, I've, got, I've, got about, um, I've got about five minutes, have I? I'm sure we had more than five minutes talking about Manchester. <laughs> You've got about five minutes, Paul. <laughs> okay, the, okay the, the two definitions of, of invertibility. Um, we distinguish A invertibility from the viewpoint of the, um, of the agent, that system one is A invertible if agents can infer the true values of shocks from the history of the observables. And then the concept of E invertibility, the system in one is E invertibility if the value of shocks can be deduced from the history of the econometrician's observables. Um, now, theorem three established a necessary link between these two concepts. Um, for the, we also have a generalization of the poor man's invertibility condition. And for a square system, it again consists of a rank and stability condition involving the A, B, and E matrices, but these are different under the um, perfect and imperfect information solutions. It's important to realize that. And what theorem three says, Assume we have a square system and assume that the poor man's invertibility condition holds under um, perfect information, but agents do not have perfect information as an endowment. In other words, somehow they don't observe the, the state. Um, again, we have a square system and then each of the following conditions is necessary and sufficient for the others. The important thing here is that e invertibility is only possible holds if and only if we have this extra rank condition um, which comes about because of the imperfect information solution and if a is invertible so e invertibility is only possible under a invertibility if the solution um, um, is only possible under a invertibility and you should recall that um, or realize that a invertibility means that the imperfect information solution will exactly replicate the perfect information solution um, now I've got some, um, that's theorem three. Okay, theorem four is actually relates to those slides. And theorem five is recoverability, which I always um, intended to, um, to, uh, to bypass. I mean, there is a further concept when um, one realizes that the, the econometrician always has an advantage in that she has the, the full sample. Um, so at time t, she can use the, all the data from time t onwards to the end of the, the period. And this gives you the concept of recoverability. The question is, can, um, can recoverability save the day? And our answer is actually no. Um, um, we have an analytical illustration, um, um, which I just want to, can I have another five minutes? <laughs> um, sure. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, okay. Um, okay. This th this is a fairly standard RBC model with capital consumption. Our measurement consists of the um, the rental rate of capital. This is the interest rate. The innovation actually uh, this should be the rental rate of capital. So there's a subscript um, um, a superscript K missing, and I'm going to solve this under imperfect information and perfect information, and this is the result. Under perfect information, we have a ARMA 1 1 process. Under imperfect information, and this is really from theorem 4 that I've glossed over, we have this solution 
um, in terms of the fundamentals, but the um, but the var that the the contrition can recover is in terms of the um, of the innovations, which is this. So this is recovered by the var. In order to actually get back to the the, the fundamentals, one needs this extra term, which is a Blaschka factor for those who are familiar with the Blaschka factors in this this literature. Um, so the a theoretical var econometrician will estimate 10, whereas the, the DSG var econometrician that uses the model will understand the Blaschka factor and be able to recover the shock from nine. I mean, given some um, um, identification um, conditions, which, which are by, by no means trivial, um, but in principle, um, if she can solve those identification problems in particular, she would have to identify these parameters lambda one and lambda two in the model, um, and she can actually get back to recovering the, um, the the fundamental shocks. So, if I can summarize now, can I uh, um, just? I, I you can, can, Paul. Yeah, you can summarize it. Okay, I can summarize it actually in in, in two slides. Um, it's still a standard process uh, procedure to follow precedent of. of famous authors to estimate a VAR and compare impulse responses with those generated by a structural VAR. Um, or we can estimate by Bayesian methods of the model and use Dynar to estimate the, the VAR model directly, that's the VAR solution, by Bayesian techniques. Um, but that assumes API. In fact, both of them effectively assume agents have got perfect information. And this next point just points out the all pervasiveness of non fundamentalness in DSG models. It comes about through through many ways. If data contains measurement errors, then these counter shocks and the system cannot be fundamental. If some variables observed by the contrition with a lag it can't be fundamental. If there are new shocks, um, in other words, anticipated shocks with delayed effects, this can't be fundamental. Even in square systems, and this is in the A, B, C, and D paper, and also in our paper, a particular choice of observables can mean the, the solution is, is not fundamental. But the good news is that with their choice of observables and shocks, um, the smetz filter is invertible. Um, but I, I would just point out they 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 don't uh, they don't assume um, measurement errors. Um, if they did, we'd be back to the same problem. So my final slides, um, there are other parts of the paper. We have a numerical solution. Um, um, the paper also discuss other possible ways that have been proposed to bypass VARs and so circumvent the non-fundamentalness of structural VARs. We don't say anything new about that, but we do point out a literature, a recent literature in particular, a couple of papers by, by, by Stock and Watson. And finally, let me just uh, have a little advert for our Dynar toolkit that will implement all the procedures in our paper. It contains uh, the solution for the imperfect information model, um, it has Bayesian estimation under imperfect information. It has the poor man's invertibility test when the model is not a um, invertible. I should say when it's, it's not a, a invertible, it's a test, or if you like, it's a test for a invertibility. Um, there are tests for approximate fundamentalness, which I haven't talked about very much. There are many examples, and um, we're actually presenting this toolkit at the MMF conference in, in 2021 in the pre conference um, course. So, all of you out there, I see lots of people out there, this is very strange. <laughs> all the, Many of uh, out yeah, may, uh, may well be, be a theoretical non DSG VAR modelers. Um, if you come to our course, you can learn how to become a DSG VAR model. And that's, um, I think I'm just, I, th I think I'm more or less on time because I, I think we had fun. Pretty much. Yeah, that was great. Well, thank you. Really, really interesting. Had a couple of uh, questions that have come in, and we've got about uh, seven or eight minutes in which to uh, go over them. So Alex Mahalov, first of all, says, great talk, Paul. Would your paper claim that a DSG model-based estimation would be superior or preferable to an a-theoretical VAR estimation, or are there trade-offs? Um, well, the answer to that is short. <laughs> it's a short yes. Um, I think, um, um, I mean, I, I would favor it 
you know, quite obviously from what I've been saying, uh, Bayesian estimation of a DSG model. And then if you want to, want to validate it with the data, I, I see no particular reason why one should treat the, the VAR as a data. It, in these models, the, um, the papers often start off with, with a theoretical VARs. Um, and then um, with, um, and then they go on to, to examine various uh, identification schemes, um, which, which have got no relation at all to, to DSG models, even if they are invertible. These, these data VARs um, become the stylized facts, and then they become the data, and then they come to the DSG model to compare the impulse responses with the so-called data. Um, now, I, I don't see why one can't just compare the, um, the second moments of the DSG model with the second moments of the data. I think I'd prefer that as a, as a, validate, as a validation procedure rather than using VARs. And in any case, if you want to, want to estimate um, impulse responses, one doesn't need to use VARs. Um, we can estimate them directly using the methods discussed in Stock and Watson. Um, but one has to say here, well, one needs good instruments for the, for the structural shocks. Okay, thanks, Paul. And then Nicola Rubino uh, says, Paul, I was wondering, isn't the idea of having a dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model be the DGP perhaps a bit much, a bit too much theoretical and a bit to the opposite of what Sims might have wanted while building up his, his unrestricted VAR model? Um, no, I think you're alluding to alternatives to the to the, to, to the DSG model. Um, um, well, yes, this, this, this paper is sponsored by uh, so rethinking macro that is looking at alternatives um, and uh, I'm quite sympathetic to these alternatives. I am working on behavioral models and um, there are behavioral models that actually combine RE models with, um, with, uh, with non-RE models with, with learning models. Um, so I think, I think I'm, I'm sort of agreeing with the, with, with the question. Um, and I would say this about um, about VAR models and DSG models and behavioral models. Um, I mean, if you wanted to, to disprove the, the DSG model, if you want to point out the shortcomings of a DSG model, what you can't do, this is what this paper shows, you can't, you can't look at VARs and compare the VARs with the DSG model. You can't do that to disprove or to uh, invalidate the, uh, the, the DSG model. Okay, thanks, Paul. Uh, are there any more questions or comments out there? Laura, you can unmute yourself if you want. So I, I was just, um, I wanted you to talk a little bit about what you thought the role of, of VARs was uh, going forward, because it seems like, you know, this was a big evolution in a time when we mostly had just aggregate data to work with. And so it was a really big question, you know, could we identify model parameters given these sequences of aggregate data? But in today's reality, we've got all these micro series, right? We have surveys, we could, you know, go measure people's beliefs, we could, you know, so is, is the, the, you know, vast array of micro data that's available now a potential way to get around this? And, you know, if so, should, should we still be using VARs? Are there other techniques that, that would be better suited to you know, the, the modern availability of data and computing power? Um, well, I, I, I did talk quite a lot about heterogeneous agent models and um, um, exactly the same problems arise in those models as, as, as in the aggregate models. Um, you know, certainly the, the heterogeneous agent models um, do require and it's essential to use this micro data to uh, to calibrate and I suppose ultimately to to validate the, these models um, I don't see how in any sense they, they get around the problem of invertibility I may be wrong I may be wrong I haven't really thought about it but I can't see at first glance that any way you can get around the problem of fundamentalness and and invertibility through heterogeneity, I would think the problem even gets worse. But uh, you know, but certainly we, we do need the the um, uh, uh, macro data to um, to calibrate and, and to validate, and maybe even to estimate the heterogeneous agent models. And um, well, there's, there's a lot to be done in this heterogeneous agent model to uh, um, to model diverse expectations. Uh, 
it, it strikes me that um, there's a remarkable lacuna in heterogeneous agent models in that there's very little attention to heterogeneous expectations and heterogeneous information. Um, this, this is glossed over as far as I can see. I don't know whether the people out there or people on the panel doing heterogeneous agent models will agree with this, but there does appear to be an omission of in a consideration of, of diverse expectations and uh, heterogene, heterogeneous information. And where is the heterogeneous information is in much of the heterogeneous agent literature? That's my question. I don't know, are, are you, uh, perhaps you can ask it, you can answer it, Laura. <laughs> I'll do my best in the next talk. Okay, that's great, that's great. It's a link between the talk. It's always good to have a link between things. <laughs> But thank you, Paul. That was a really interesting talk from somebody I, I, I you know, studied all the original DSG papers many, many moons ago. I've since strayed and become a sports economist. Um, but I certainly recall uh, you know, reading um, you know, the, the Prescott papers, Kittle and Prescott and so on in the 80s. And they were talking back then about you know, micro data becoming available and more surveys and micro data. And obviously it's only, only much, much more much more now, more now than it was what was back then. Um, so, but thank you for a really interesting talk on this interaction between uh, VARs uh, and DSG models. It seems to be a perennial, a perennial struggle, uh, and uh, uh, perhaps a, a blow has been landed. So, thank you very much for that, Paul. Uh, I think we'll uh, we'll now make a, a handover to Laura Laura Feldkamp, uh, joining us from Columbia Business School. Um, we're delighted to uh, to make use of the virtual the platform to be able to have transatlantic speakers uh, and um, she's going to present a, a, a talk entitled a growth model of the data economy. Um, Paul do you want to unshare your slides so that uh, Laura can share yeah. hers? Mm -hmm. right. Thanks Paul and go ahead Laura. There we go. Look good? Looks perfect. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to, to be here with all of you today. So um, this is a growth model of the data economy. I guess um, I was trying to think about whether this could be a DSGE model of the data economy. So I think it's a very, very simple model without so much S, without so much stochasticity, but, but we'll see. We can talk about at the end whether, whether we can um, enrich this and, and merge this with, with Paul's approach. But in any case, this is joint work with Mariam Farbudi, uh, who's at MIT. So our basic question is, the modern economy looks sort of like that, where we've got these firms that are spitting out lots and lots of data. In fact, in the US, the five, five most valuable firms in, in the stock market are firms whose primary assets seem to be intangible and, and you know, thought to be largely the value of their data. Um, and these, you know, the, these, this business of, of producing data and perhaps selling or data or data services um, has slightly different economics than the you know, standard macro models, the workhorse models that we've used for a few decades now where firms combine capital and labor and they produce, you know, rival goods that could be called widgets. Um, and so we wanted to write down a model of this economy and ask how does it work and to what extent are its economics different? So the, the you know, most valuable companies are data intensive, you know, is this really a new economy or is this sort of old, you know, a, a new version of old economics? Um, and we took a pretty agnostic approach to that. But one thing we think that's important is that this, you know, the reason that this is coming to the forefront right now, that this discussion is emerging is because we're developing really much better data technologies than ever before. So machine learning and artificial intelligence couldn't tell whether a picture was a cat or a dog or a tree, you know, a, a decade ago. And, you know, now they've, they've sort of cracked that problem to the point where these technologies are much more useful. Um, and so, you know, but the thing to realize about these technologies is there are, fundamentally prediction technologies. So we're gonna think about improvements in data that's being used for prediction. Now that's not all data. Um, you know, we're focusing on a certain subset of data. Data can be, you know, patents can be digitized, you know, music can be digitized, but that's not really what the big data revolution is about. And that's not what this paper is about. So we're talking about statistics and records of transactions that are being used to solve a prediction problem. That's what we mean by, by data or big data in this paper. So a starting point is, could data accumulation alone sustain ag aggregate growth? So we're basically going to ask the Sola 1956 question that he asked about capital. He asked, could capital alone sustain growth? But we're going to ask it about data. 
So we're going to be holding technology fixed here, not because we don't think that, you know, TFP shocks are important source of fluctuations. I'm sure they are, but because we wanted to focus on this one simple question, uh, whether data alone can sustain growth. And then we can put other ingredients back in the model once we understand the basic forces. So those basic forces are, we'll see a form of decreasing returns that look very much like capital decreasing returns, but we'll also see a force of increasing returns that's unique to data. And then we'll apply these tools to analyze things like data platforms and data barter, and we'll see how far we get with, with those applications at the end. So what I wanna do is I wanna construct a recursive framework that features data accumulation and transactions will generate new data and a changing world will make old data depreciate. And we'll explore three key ideas. One is data cannot sustain growth without technological progress. So in that sense, this is gonna look very much like capital accumulation. So there'll be decreasing returns, but there's also a form of data poverty traps um, where there's some increasing returns and that will mean that new firms face initial losses. And lastly, if I have time, I'll talk about who becomes a data seller and returns to specialization in data versus goods production. So here's the model. There's a continuum of competitive firms, which I'll index by I. Each firm produces KIT to the alpha units of goods with KIT units of capital. Okay, so I'm abstracting from labor here simply because I'm trying to make the model as simple as possible, but there's nothing wrong with including it. And these goods have quality AIT. So this is gonna look sort of like TFP, but I want you to think about it a little bit differently. That's where data is gonna enter. So we'll, we'll use the word quality for it. And I'm gonna do something a little bit you know, poor form for, for presentation, but I'm just gonna tell you about the equilibrium of the demand side economy because there's nothing interesting going on there and I just wanna put it to the side. So firms are gonna take the equilibrium price PT is given. That's what it means to be a competitive market and their quality adjusted outputs will be perfect substitutes. So what does this mean? Price will be some parameter P bar times the total output, that's what YT is, to the negative gamma. So more output, lower price, fine. We have a, it's just a, a supply curve relationship. But um, total output is the integral over all firms of their quality times their quantity, K to the alpha was the number of units they produce, that times A is the quality units. So the total quality units are our aggregate supply. So that's the, you know, that tells us how uh, demand maps into prices. And the action in this model is that the interesting piece is how data features in goods quality. So quality is gonna depend on a chosen production technique. So you could think of a firm trying to decide, you know, should we produce uh, a gray sweaters like James is wearing or blue sweaters like what I'm wearing? And we're trying to forecast what will be a high demand good today. We could dye the, the wool in either way. Um, and the firm has an optimal technique, but they don't know it. So the optimal technique is theta plus epsilon. And this is a combination of two random pieces because this is gonna be learnable, theta, and the epsilon will be unlearnable. So theta is an AR1 process. So we want this to be a, a dynamic process. The, the firm is basically doing a dynamic tracking problem. Um, and because that's what's gonna make data have a value over time, the fact that theta is persistent, but it's gonna depreciate over time as well because data might be about what theta was many periods ago. And that's not as relevant as what data was you know, about today's data is. So it's an AR1 process. It's gonna have persistence rho and innovation eta, which is normally distributed with mean mu and variance sigma theta squared. The unlearnable com component is mean zero. If it had a mean, we would just throw it in learnable piece. Um, and it's IID, normal zero sigma A squared. So then quality of a good of firm I at time T is A hat, that's a parameter, minus, this is a squared tracking error. So what the firm wants to do is set A equal to theta plus epsilon to the extent that if it could do that perfectly, if it knew exactly what theta plus epsilon was, it would, it would equate these two to maximize its good, its good quality and maximize the price that they get for their good. But it can't do that because it doesn't know what theta plus epsilon is. And so it's gonna set A as close as it, can, as it can to this target. And we're gonna penalize them by a squared forecast or a squared deviation, okay? So this is basically the, the tracking error squared. So what does data do? Well, let's first talk about where data comes from. Data is a byproduct of production. So the N is a number of data points and 
It depends on how many units I produce, that's K to the alpha. And it depends on a parameter that's firm specific, that's data mining ability. This isn't essential, but it's gonna allow us to talk later about you know, how data productive or data efficient firms or data savvy firms behave differently from, from firms that are not very effective at using or producing data. Okay, so the more I produce today, the more units of data I get. Now, what does each data point do? Well, I'm gonna index a particular data point by M. So M runs from one to N because N is the number of data points I get to see. And each one of those data points is, is effectively a signal about that learnable component of my optimal technique. So it's, a, it's equal to tomorrow's technique, uh, optimal technique target, theta t plus one, plus some signal noise. And that signal noise is just normal zero sigma epsilon squared. So more data points give me more information about what the optimal technique will be tomorrow, which allow me then to choose my, my chosen technique closer to the optimum and allow me to get higher quality, produce higher quality goods. Basically, I, you know, the more data I get, I can forecast tomorrow, hey, people are gonna really like purplish blue sweaters and I'm gonna be able to produce this really hot commodity that's gonna earn a lot more, you know, higher price than if I chose green or something that's, that's not, uh, not optimal in the market today. So I just wanna point out that this model embodies something that the people who've been writing about data, mostly in the operations literature, uh, call the data feedback loop. So they point out that a firm that does more transactions or has more customers or operates at a bigger scale generally gets more data. More data allows them to operate at you know, higher quality or maybe more efficiency. We could interpret this, this optimal technique as something that's cost minimizing, right? Inventory control or uh, something like that. Um, and that, that you know, then being able to operate more efficiently allows you to uh, attract more customers and do more transactions, which in turn gets more data. And that's going on in this model. Where is that happening? Well, here's the more transactions or more production generates more data. More data will map into a higher level of average goods quality. So that's your more efficiency. And a more efficient firm will turn out to, will choose a higher K. They'll choose to invest more because they're more efficient. And so that's gonna be profit maximizing. And so that data feedback loop is going on inside this model. So then the last piece of the model is we wanted to think about a market for data. So um, delta IT will be the amount of data that's traded by firm I at time T. So if delta IT is positive, that means the firm is purchasing data. If delta IT is negative, it means the firm is selling data. And a firm in a given period, a firm can buy or they can sell, but they can't do both at the same time. They can buy one period and sell the next, that's fine but you can't buy and sell essentially to yourself. So there'll be a data price pi T that clears the market. Now, the last piece of this that, that makes it quite different from physical goods is that data is typically thought to be non-rival. You can use it and you can sell it, right? I can copy it pretty much freely. So that we wanted to capture the, the spirit of that, but it poses, pure non-rivalry poses a problem, which is if we've got a competitive market, and we wanted to start with a competitive market because it's much simpler and we want a simple framework, but it poses the quandary. If you've got a competitive market, why wouldn't you sell all of your data and sell it over and over and over and over again? Because you wouldn't move the prices against you because what competition means is you don't impact market prices. So there'd be effectively no cost if data were purely non-rival. So we're gonna think of data that's partially non-rival. IOTA will be the fraction of sold data that's lost. And I really think of this as a stand-in for the fact that we don't have perfectly competitive markets. That if I give all my data away to my competitors, it does harm me, right? So maybe it doesn't mean I actually can't use that data, but it probably means that the data that, that I gave away is now less valuable. It, it offers me less profit opportunity. So we're gonna model that as a fraction of lost data. It could also be privacy restrictions, right? So we have laws now saying that you can't just collect all your consumers' data and give it away to everybody. Um, there's some of it that you have to hold on to, or maybe you can transfer it if you give up rights over it. So the final piece is that we'll put in a data adjustment cost. And this is there for exactly the same reason that you have adjustment cost to capital and capital accumulation models, which is it avoids one period of convergence. And the way we think about this is if you've got a mom and pop shop, 
that's never really done anything with their data. You know, they've got the old fashioned cash register and basically toss it all away. It's not free for them. They can't just go buy some big data set and immediately know what to do with it, and how to profit from it. They've got to accumulate some expertise. They might have to hire uh, some additional workers that, that would allow them to, to use that data profitably. Okay, so this gives rise to a simple recursive solution. And the key to the recursive solution is to define the right state variable. So the state variable here is something we're gonna call the stock of knowledge and we'll denote by omega. So let's talk through this. I wanna start on the inside of this, this expression. So the expectation of theta conditional on, this is the information set of firm I at time T, this is a forecast. Right? We call it a, a posterior if you want to use a Bayesian term, but it's also a, a forecast of what this thing is. And the difference between that forecast and the realization of theta, that's a forecast error. So this thing is a squared forecast error. An expected squared forecast error might be what we call a conditional variance or a posterior variance. And the inverse of that conditional variance is a conditional precision. You could use the conditional variance without the inverse as a state variable. That would work as well. There's no problem with that. We kind of liked inverting it because then bigger means you have more knowledge, right? And less means less knowledge. Whereas if you use the variance, larger would be more uncertainty. Okay, so this is a conditional precision. It's the inverse of the expected squared forecast error. Well, that's a handy object because now we can write expected quality, that AIT for a firm, as being A hat minus Omega inverse is the expected squared error between my chosen technique, which will turn out to be the expectation of theta conditional on the information set. And this piece is the variance of the unforecastable, the unlearnable component. Let me go back to AIT. Omega inverse is the difference between these two terms squared. This piece, you never get any information about. So no matter how much data you accumulate, this thing still has variance sigma A squared. So the, the expectation of quality is uh, a hat minus my invert stock of knowledge minus the variance of the unlearnable risk. Okay, so then we can write this problem as a simple one state variable Bellman equation. This will be the last bit of math I show you and then we'll get on to, to pretty pictures of the results. So the optimal sequence of capital investment choices solves this recursive problem. So this is the value of this amount of knowledge. So think of this as like a, a present discounted sum of a stream of data investments. And so we're going to maximize over our choice of capital and our choice of data, purchases or sales. And what are we maximizing? Well, this is the gross revenue of good sales. It's the price times that's the expected quality. That's this expression we worked out up here, times the units that I produce, k to the alpha. Minus, this is my data adjustment cost, minus the amount that I pay for data Keep in mind that delta may be negative. If delta is negative, that means I sold data. So minus, minus, I'd be getting some positive revenue from that. And then minus the rental rate on capital and the number of units of capital that I rent, and then plus the discount, time discount rate and the value of the data that I have tomorrow. And the key thing is how do we link today's state to tomorrow's state? So we need a state evolution equation. And that's basically coming from a Kalman filter. Right? This, is a, this is a Kalman filtering problem where we're tracking theta. Theta is an AR1 process. It's got a linear state equation, and we have an observation equation, which is these data points that are revealing something about theta. And so we need to use a modified form of a Kalman filter because there are actually two sources of information here. One is the data, and the other is you get to see at the end of the period what your goods quality was, and you know what technique you chose, and that also reveals something about what the state was as well. Okay, so this is the number of data points you produce. And then tomorrow's stock of knowledge is, let me start with the second term. This is the inflow of new data that you got in time t about theta t plus one. So this is the number of data points that you produced. I'm gonna add to that if you purchased data, I'm gonna subtract from that if you sold off some of your data, but I've gotta use these indicator functions because remember if you sell some of your data, you lose a fraction of what you sold. If you buy data, you, buy, you get everything you bought, right? So that's this piece, We're one if delta is positive. But if delta is negative, if you sold data, you lose a fraction of it. So these things adjust for that. 
And this is sort of like, this takes the form of the model of actually something like a negative bid ask spread. Okay, I'll just leave that there. If you know how to do DSGE models with, with bid ask spreads, this is like the inverse of that. Okay, so this is the number of data points that you get to add to your stock of data. This is the precision of each of those data points. So this is the total amount of new precision that's flowing into my stock of knowledge. This is yesterday's stock of knowledge. And this is how I discount that previous information. So I have yesterday's stock of knowledge. This is what I learned from seeing the outcome of my own goods quality. Okay, so I'm gonna add those two together. And then I discount for two reasons. I discount because this information is about theta t. And theta t and theta t plus one, that's an AR1 process. I want to discount it by the persistence. That's what rho is, the persistence of that AR1 process. So if theta is not very persistent, like in the limit, if theta were IID, then yesterday's information would be totally irrelevant because today we're just taking a new draw. If the, the theta process has a very high persistence, then yesterday's data about yesterday's state is very relevant for today. And so I'm hardly gonna discount it at all. Okay. This is the variance of the innovation of the AR1 process. So similarly, if that process has a really variable innovations, then information about yesterday's state is not very relevant because today's state is likely to be quite different. So then I'm adding the variance to it. But if it has very small innovations, I don't add much. So I'm essentially discounting yesterday's data according to the persistence and the variance of the R1 process. And the formula for how we do this is given by the Kalman filter. Okay, so we can think about what's going on in this problem. Um, oh, let me first just define a few terms. So let me just point out that this Bellman equation reveals the value of data. So if we're gonna do something like Paul's exercise where we go and get some you know, data and we estimate this model structurally and we quantify that Bellman equation, it would reveal the value of data for a firm. And that's a big deal because a lot of people would like tools to help better value firms that have large data stocks. V prime omega is the price that a firm's willing to pay for a unit of data. That should be the, the, the marginal value. We should see that be equal to the price. And then omega T is kind of like a discounted sum of data investments. We discount old data according to the persistence and the variance of the AR1 process that, that represents the state, right? So in industries where the state is moving very rapidly, you know, maybe in the finance industry, we're gonna discount data a lot. If data is about like customer characteristics, well, those probably aren't changing very much. We don't move all that often. Then that's gonna be a, a setting where your theta process is quite stable and you're not gonna discount your data very heavily. Okay, so those are the objects in the model. So now I wanna talk about first diminishing returns, increasing returns, and if I have time, I'll, I'll say something briefly about specialization. So most of you have probably taught macro and look at this and say, oh, that's the solo growth model. Right? We've, many of us have, have drawn this on the board or put it up on a slide many times. And what it represents is the inflows and outflows usually of capital. But here it's the inflows and outflows of data. So given this stock of knowledge, the red line tells you how many new units of data would I be adding to my stock of knowledge? What is that? Well, that's my data savviness parameter or my data efficiency parameter. The number of units that I produce, that thing is what we called NIT, the number of new data points times the precision. Okay, so that's the new amount of data or data precision that I add in a given period to my stock of knowledge. The black line is outflows. What are outflows? Well, that's the data that I effectively lose because data depreciates. Okay, and so that's the difference between uh, omega IT and this discounted omega IT. Notice that this is not a linear function, but in many of the uh, numerical examples we do, it, it turns out to look very linear. And we have a, a proof in the paper that it's approximately linear uh, for certain sets of parameter values. So what this tells us is that when the stock of knowledge is quite low, that the inflows exceed outflows. And that as the stock of knowledge grows, there's concavity in this inflow um, curve and that causes the uh, growth of the economy to slow and eventually come to a stop. Just like in the solo model, as we approach steady state, growth grinds to a halt. Now, you could look back at this model and say, aha, but you manufactured this. Where did I manufacture this result? Right here. And the reason that it's manufactured, I'd say manufactured here, is because there's an upper bound 
on the quality of a good, right? So I, I can get as much data as I want, but the best I can ever do is drive this term to zero. And that effectively means that quality is a hat. And so I've put an upper bound on this process. So I wanna step away from this particular model for a, for a moment and ask how general is the, is the idea that there's diminishing returns to data and how much is it a relic of that particular assumption that there's an upper bound on goods quality. So for a minute, I want you to consider an arbitrary model where data is used for forecasting. I wanna hold on to that, that assumption, but that forecast affects output in some way. So there's some mapping between forecasts or forecast precision to output. And then argue that data accumulation can only sustain growth if both of these two assumptions are satisfied. The first is a perfect forecast would need to generate infinite real output. Think about that for a second. We've got lots of models that have perfect foresight. I have yet to see any that argue that that produces infinite real value. Now, if you had perfect foresight, you, could, you should leave right now and go bet on the stock market and become exceedingly rich by tomorrow morning. But that's quite different from saying in the aggregate, if we all knew what was gonna happen tomorrow, that we would all be able to generate real infinite value, okay? And you know, why is that necessary? Well, if that's not true, then there's some finite upper bound that we would achieve with perfect forecasts. And if there's some finite upper bound, then we've got to have some diminishing returns because any non-concave function is going to exceed that upper bound. But there's a second, so, so you may or may not believe that if we know tomorrow exactly, we can generate infinite real output, but there's a second condition that's equally troubling, which is the future needs to be deterministic. To get infinite output, we're going to have to get to infinite precision, right? For any finite valued mapping between forecast and output. So we have to be able to get to zero variant forecasts. But what does it mean to have perfect forecasts, to have zero variance forecasts? It means that tomorrow's state must be a deterministic function of observable variables today. If it's not a deterministic function of observable variables today, it could be a deterministic function of things we don't observe, but then we can't forecast it perfectly because we can't observe the things we need to, to forecast, right? or we can't have future randomness. There is no fundamental randomness in the universe between today and tomorrow, otherwise forecasts are not possible. So you can buy into these two if you want, but they stretch many of the narratives we tell about, about economics. That's what you need for data-driven growth to sustain, be sustainable in the infinite future. So this model kind of rigged it, but there's some general, more general idea about why it's a good idea to model it in something like that way. Okay, so what you get out of this model is that when all firms, uh, that should be grow together, uh, the path is concave. So because of that diminishing returns, the stock of knowledge grows and flattens out and similarly aggregate output grows and flattens out. But something quite different happens when a single firm enters, when everybody else is in steady state. There we get quite different dynamics. What I've shown you so far looks you know, hey, accumulating data is kind of like accumulating capital. There was really no new economics there. Here's where something new happens. We can get convex data flows. So there exists some parameters in the model and a threshold of the stock of knowledge such that when knowledge is sufficiently scarce, so we, this, this happens when a firm doesn't have too much data and has a lot of data diminishing returns kick in, but it has a small amount of data, the net data flow might be increasing over time. So we can get this S-shaped inflows curve, we can get a net increase. And this comes from that data feedback loop. The a firm is accumulating more data, it's becoming more productive, it's growing larger. When it grows larger, it gets more data, and that's generating some convexity in data inflows that look quite different from what you typically get of capital accumulation models. Although I should say there are some models of, in the growth literature of poverty traps of complementarities and such that do generate that sort of effect, but it arises quite naturally in a data economy. Just to interrupt you, Laura, you've got about five minutes left. Perfect, thank you. Um, so that, uh, that, that convexity is quite important because, you know, well, convexity means increasing returns. That sounds like a great thing, right? Returns get higher and higher and higher, but think of the other side of that, which is that when the stock of knowledge is low, increasing returns means that the returns are quite low. 
So increasing returns is a really bad thing for poor countries. In the growth literature, increasing returns for companies is a really bad thing uh, for data poor companies. So you can see that S-shaped stock of knowledge accumulation, but notice that that means this is negative. These are profits. This firm starts out making a loss. That's its very low returns to goods production and to data accumulation. And the book value of the firm, which is the accumulated profits, plus the value of purchased intangibles. So in that case, that's plus the value of the data that they buy, um, starts out negative, becomes even more negative, and doesn't become positive until some, sometime around period nine. So you know the, this model doesn't have any entry or exit, but one could imagine that a long period of sustained losses might deter many a financially constrained firm from being able to enter and compete in the model. And so I think that would be an interesting area of, of research, but this certainly is suggestive. And it speaks to you know, some of the early um, you know, experiences of these big data companies we've seen, like Amazon, for, for example, didn't make profits, just made losses after losses after losses for years and years and years as they were starting up. So um, this speaks to a phenomena that we see in reality, which is data barter. So lots of data is being bartered for services. And if you want evidence, take a look at your phone. It doesn't show up on here. Um, pick up your phone, open it up. I bet you've got an app on your phone that you didn't pay a monetary value for. Somebody paid to develop it and they gave it to you for free. And why do I put for free in air quotes? Because you are paying for it. You're paying for it with your data, right? And so what's happening is somebody gave you a digital product and you paid for it with data at a zero monetary cost. That's a classic barter trade. And barter arises in this model, particularly early in a firm's life. Firms are willing to engage in costly investment and costly production of goods that they sell at a zero price. And the reason that they're willing to do it is because it generates data, okay? So we can, because the, the value, marginal value of data is positive, the, we prove that data barter can arise in this model. Okay, so the last thing I wanna mention is return to specialization. So in the long run, who specializes in using data? So when there's a single data producer, right? We're just gonna move one firm and they become more efficient. So they're, we're talking about moving that data efficiency parameter Z, right? So for a given amount of production, how many um, data points do you get out of it? So when a given a single firm becomes more efficient, it keeps that knowledge and uses it to sell higher quality goods. So their omega H, their stock of knowledge goes up relative to the less productive firms. That means that they can have a higher average quality and they'll profit more from selling these more higher quality goods command a higher price. But something very different happens if we consider a steady state where a measure of firms uh, have low data mining ability and others have high data mining ability. And that when you've got these equilibrium effects going on because a measure of firms affect equilibrium prices, you can find that the high data productivity firms, this is the stock of knowledge of those, those firms that generate a lot more data, minus the low data productivity firm stock of knowledge, that can be negative. In other words, the guys who are producing the data end up less well-informed. How can that possibly happen? Well, because they're selling all that data. So there exists a set of parameters such that, or there's a region of parameters such that the efficient data producers don't keep their data. They specialize in selling that data as much as they can. And you can think of this like in trade, everybody does what's in their comparative advantage. So these high data efficiency firms have a comparative advantage in data production. And the other firms have a comparative advantage and high quality goods production, not an absolute advantage. They're no better at doing goods, but they have a comparative advantage in high quality goods production. And so you can get the endogenous emergence of what kind of looks like data platforms where they're doing a lot of transactions. They're producing high volumes of junk goods. You know, the cheap apps on your cell phone that crash all the time that you took because they were free, but don't really generate much value, but they scrape all the data off your phone if that's even legal anymore. You might have agreed to it. That's what these data platforms are doing. They're selling junk, a lot of it, generating tons of data out of it. They're very effective at mining data per unit of transaction, um, and they're profiting primarily from the data. 
Okay, so uh, probably close on time. I wanna point out that we assumed here that data was socially productive, but that that's not essential. And then the paper, we showed different ways to extend the model. Uh, one of them is to allow data to be purely for business stealing and to generate no, no welfare advantages. And we get the same dynamics um, as we do in the main model, but I'll refer you to the paper and other extensions. So this is a really new area of research. Um, I'm hoping that this is a really simple framework that other people could build on. So, you know, there are lots of things that are not in here, right? We should put back some technological progress. You might think about using data in order to help um, technology progress. We can think of data as being, a, you know, I basically presented to you like a data version of a solo model, but maybe the next step is to do a data version of a Romer model, right? Where we have inputs into idea production. You could think of doing, um, you know, firm entry and exit. Uh, I alluded to the fact there's probably something interesting there, but there's a bunch of work being, you know, that needs to get done to actually model that and see whether that's true. So big data is information that's generally used for forecasting. At least that's what the big data technologies are doing. And that generated diminishing returns to forecast precision. We basically can't grow forever by just, you know, forecasting tomorrow better and better. But data has some features of technology. It's non-rival and it raises productivity. And so that's led other macroeconomists to, to model data as though it were just you know, adding to the stock of ideas. And that's not quite right either. So it's got increasing returns when knowledge is low. We can get zero prices and negative profits that arise because production is a form of costly investment in data acquisition. We got returns to specialization. We can get data hoarders or data platforms from highly data efficient goods and you know, lots of new directions. In addition to the ones I mentioned, um, you know, we should start thinking about theories about how to price data. This is a really important asset in, in the modern economy. And we don't have a lot of guidance about how to value it, how to value firms that own it, how to measure it, how to you know, think about how it contributes and interacts with other factors of production. We also could think of um, data as a, as a portfolio choice. So, you know, which data do I want to get? And so you could imagine theta instead of being a, a scalar AR1 process is a vector AR1 process. So theta becomes a vector of risks and I could choose different kinds of goods, each of which would give me different amounts of information about different elements in that vector, right? And so you could think of specializing in a product space as a way of investing in a particular you know, piece of information, a particular element, uh, data about a particular element in that in that theta vector or some combination of them, right? So we could we could add a lot of richness to this um, by by you know thinking about this, and it would be it's very easy to rewrite this model in vector form. So I talked about entry and exit and endogenous growth. I'm interested in you know lots of other ideas, and I you know I I will never get to all of these. So I encourage anybody who's interested to take some of these and run with them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. We have some questions in the chat. So the first one is from Hector Calvopardo. He says, Laura, the assumption of depreciation in data accumulation is a bit at odds with how AI and machine learning works. In particular, machine learning is data hungry, so the models work better with bigger data sets. How much do your results depend on this assumption? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think we could, uh, in the long run, even with machine learning and these data hungry technologies, we're gonna see diminishing returns. Um, for example, there's a paper by um, Chernozukov, Hortaksu, Pat Bajari, and one other co-author whose name I forget. Um, Pat was the chief data economist uh, or chief economist at Amazon. And so they, they actually got Amazon's data and looked at you know, how, how much better are they doing in forecasting you know, sales and, and you know, inventory decisions and so forth. And you know, along many dimensions for which they do lots of transactions, they have hit the period, the, the, the point of diminishing returns. Uh, even though they're using the most sophisticated um, machine learning and AI algorithms out there, they're hiring the very best data scientists, they have so much that um, an additional unit of data for them really does very, very little for, for their precision. But I, I do agree with the comment that at low levels of data, um, these technologies are not gonna work very well. And so um, you might, one, one way you might build on this model is to think about this mapping between data points and precision uh, in a more nuanced way. So I have some work with Simona Abis where we're, we're looking at um, burning glass hiring data and, and you know, we see firms switch from um, 
old technology, you know, learning uh, tools in, in finance um, to uh, hiring people with AI skills. And it depends very much on the amount of data that they have. So, so you could imagine that there are two kinds of technologies for mapping data into precision. And depending on how much you have, how much data you have, you might choose a different technology. And that's going to look a lot like models of switching from, um, from a artisanal economy, where if you've got low capital, you know, you just own a few hammers and a bench, you're, you're probably not going to try, you know, industrialization style production, you're not going to try to use a factory, but a factory industrialization production uses a different technology with a different factor mix, but you'd only choose it if you had enough capital. So you could imagine writing a data model that had that, you know, a similar sort of uh, choice in technologies, depending on the amount of data that you had, you choose one or the other. I like the idea. Thanks, Laura. Just before I read the next question, you provoked me to just jump in, which is the assumption that, um, you know, that Amazon can't learn anything more from any more data must rely on, you know, to use time series jargon, stationarity, the world stationary isn't changing. Um, but presumably if the world is changing, then you are going to get to points, you know, pre post pandemic, where things change sufficiently dramatically that once again, data becomes valuable again. So it's, it's about um, how quickly the world changes relative to the rate of data flow, <laughs> yeah. right? So they're, yes, the world's changing, but they're also getting an enormous amount of data each and every day from us to, to keep us up to date on those changes. Um, I, I should say, I don't want to misrepresent the work. It didn't say that there was very little value to any data. It said that there were categories of goods that were sufficiently similar that they had an overwhelming amount of data. But when something like a new good came online, that was quite different from the existing goods, um, you know, there the, the marginal value of data was, was still quite high. Thanks. Uh, Mark Casson asks, what is the relation of your model to Arrow's economic implications of learning by doing macro model from 1962? It looks like your data is what is learned and it depreciates over time. Yeah, so um, if, if I'd had more time, I would have done connections to the literature and learning by doing is, is right at the top of the list. So. Um, the idea that activity generates knowledge in some form is, is similar to models of learning by doing. What's, what's quite different here is that um, learning by doing creates knowledge that's embodied in the human capital of a worker. So I can't freely copy it. I can transfer my human capital to you. That's called teaching, right? And we do that and that's a lot of work and we get, we get paid for that, right? But it's not it's not free. I can't just remove my hard drive, say, let's make a copy and, and plug it into yours. Um, you know, there, there are sci-fi movies written about that, but uh, uh, not a reality today. Um, and so that, that makes the, the market aspect of it quite different. So I can buy a data set from you, but I can't buy your human capital. That's the, the outcome of your learning by doing. Thanks, Laura. Eddie Gerber says, very interesting, Laura. I'm very sympathetic. I have two short questions. Can you again take me through how data is married with measurement theory information sets and uh, data is dual capital information? Also, how is data related to intangible capital? Okay, so let me start with the second one. Data is a form of intangible capital. There is other intangible capital that's not data, you know, goodwill, brand, and, and so forth. But this is a piece of intangible capital that, that I think is, is, is important. Um, you know, one of the reasons that we started looking at, I think I put it up here, book value was in order to, you know, try to develop metrics in the model that, you know, people look at book and market value to try to get at the, the, um, the value of intangible capital. The market value of this firm is, is, is V of omega, is that Bellman equation. So we have a, a you know, a, a, a concrete notion of what book and market look like. And those would be the objects that people would typically use to infer the value of intangible capital. Now, in this model, all of the difference, you know, comes from, uh, you know, that it would attribute all of the intangible capital to being data because there's no other intangible capital here. But, but you know, as a measurement exercise, you could you could try to distinguish uh, dis distinguish these and and strip out the the value of data. So so this is really a subset of that, but it's a particularly interesting and particularly important subset of it. Um, how does this, how do we think about data showing up in the information sets? So um, the information set of, uh, I wish I had my, my touch screen, I would write on here, but my, uh, the information set of an agent is the past history of all the data points that they've seen and 
their realized uh, good quality. They also get to see every other firm's quality of goods, but it turns out that that doesn't reveal anything about theta. What that tells you is how precise was other firms' knowledge, um, but that they knew anyway through the structure of the equilibrium. So, so we can throw that in the in the information set as well, but it doesn't it doesn't change your forecast of the level of theta one one way or another. Um, so. So what we're doing is we're effectively doing Bayesian updating. I had yesterday's forecast of theta. That's my prior. I got some new information. That's my, my new data from my outcome and the data points that I either produced or, or purchased or, or minus some that I sold. Um, and, and so I've got these, these new signals and, and I'm essentially doing Bayesian updating. Uh, I call it Kalman filtering because there's some dynamic aspect to it here where, where what I'm forecasting is, is changing over time. But the common filter is, is derived from, from just doing a, a applying base law. Thanks, Laura. You've generated a lot of comments, which is fantastic. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll ask one more and then we'll wrap up on the hour so that okay. folk can go and take a coffee break and whatever, but you can follow up the, uh, the comments sure. in the chat yourself afterwards. Sure. So Christoph Schultz uh, asks, is data not the same as information with noise? Yeah, so it is a, it is a form of information. Um, and you know, I think part of what we wanted to do was bring information back to the discussion about data because people who are writing about data were mostly equating data with um, you know, either a form of capital right, in, the, in the sort of more financy literature or in, in macro, they're equating it with TFP saying, well, you know, information, a, a noisy signal about something is, is different from an idea, from an innovation, from, from a new technology. And so, um, you know, what's, what's different about this paper is that it's bringing uh, noisy information tools to try to model data in an equilibrium economy. Great, thank you, Laura. Um, sure. Well, as, as said, there's a couple more, a few more comments down there. Um, and so it, it just remains for me to thank you, Laura, for a really, really interesting talk. Uh, thank Paul as well uh, for making it what was a really uh, fascinating session that we've uh, we've just brought uh, to an end on information and big data. There's now a 15 minute coffee break for you to do whatever you uh, whatever you see fit in that 15 minutes before we return at 3:15 UK time with the session four computational advances, which is chaired by Carl Singleton. See you in 15 minutes, everyone. Okay, hello everybody, welcome back. It's my great pleasure to be chairing the fourth ses session today on computational advances. Uh, we're gonna follow the same format as the previous sessions, that is two talks. Uh, each talk will be around 30 minutes each and then around 15 minutes for questions, which I will collect from the chat window. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Jesus uh, Fernandez Villaverde, who is currently Professor of Economics at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I'll hand over to you, Jesus. Okay, thank you. So <clears throat> today I wanted to talk about solving heterogeneous agent models by deep learning. And this is going to be a joint presentation with Carlo Nuno at the Bank of Spain, since he has been helping me uh, as a co-author in a lot of the research related to this project. And the presentation today will be loosely based on joint work with different co-authors. So the first paper will be Financial Frictions and the Wealth Distribution, uh, which Beyond Gallo uh, Nuno is also co-author with Samuel Hurtado. And the other paper will be Solving High Dimensional Dynamic Programming Problems Using Deep Learning, uh, which Beyond Gallo is also co-author by George Sorg and Maximilian Bogler, both of which are PhD students at at Princeton this year. And the examples and code uh, for everything that I'm going to tell you today can be found in this GitHub repository. And we actually have considerably more material than the one I'm going to uh, be able to discuss today. So I think that during the presentations earlier today, you have already seen many situations that justify why researchers in microeconomics are interested in models with heterogeneous agents. Economic agents, think about individuals, firms in the context of international economics, maybe even countries, are heterogeneous along important dimensions. 
think about age in models with overlapping generations, think about their locations in terms of a spatial or economical position within, for instance, different industries, think about differences in productivity, differences in wealth, differences in information sets, different in beliefs and expectations. And the reason why we care so much about this type of heterogeneous agent models is because even with <clears throat> within narrowly defined subgroups, we observe large individual heterogeneity in behavior, and it is hard to explain those type of behavior within the context of a representative agent model. I'm not going to spend a lot of time giving you examples of the type of models I have in mind to solve, but think about all the class of questions in macroeconomics that are inherently related with heterogeneity. What accounts for changes in income and wealth inequality? What are the consequences of changes in tax progressivity? What are the consequences in social security and welfare program reforms? Consequences of changes in educational policies, etc. Every year I have two or three students on the market and every year they have questions related to this type of issues. But also we care a lot about questions related with aggregation bias. So for instance, we may, word, may, we may wonder whether or not um, uh, having heterogeneity matters for the business cycle, or matters for the welfare costs of the business cycle, or matters for asset prices, or matters for the effects of temporary changes to tax cuts or the effects of monetary policy. And again, I think that this morning you have already seen uh, some papers that have dealt with this type of issues. And also all the political economy of all the previous questions. People vote to a large extent based on the consequences for themselves of different policies and Hence, if we want to understand the political economic dynamics of a country, we want to have a better understanding of models with heterogeneity. But let me not spend much more time on this type of big picture motivation. And let's point out that to compute and to take to the data, that is to do econometrics of this type of models with heterogeneous agents, we need to deal with the distribution of agents, capital G of T. And I'm indexing this distribution by T to the node that is affected both by shocks and by possibly initial conditions. And at the core of every model, what we are going to have is an operator H that is going to characterize how this distribution G of T is going to evolve over time. In the case that we are dealing with models in discrete time, G of T plus one will just be G sorry, H of GT, ST, where ST are all the other aggregated state of the economy as a productivity level or a demand level or some uh, stand of fiscal and monetary policy. In the case that we are dealing with a, a continuous time model, what we will have is that the partial derivative of G with respect to T is going to be given by H of G, T, S, T. Of course, in these cases, H will be different, but I want to keep a, a homogeneous notation. And why do we need to uh, keep track with how this distribution of agents uh, evolves over time? Because at the end of the day, agents care about prices. Agents do not care about the distribution per se, but agents care that if there is a lot of agents with a lot of assets, for instance, the price of assets may be different than if there are fewer agents with assets. And I want to know when I make my decisions, the distribution today, which will imply some prices today and the uh, distribution tomorrow, which will imply prices tomorrow. And if you notice a little bit, what we are having over here is basically that this is nothing more than a chapman kolmogorov of equation. And this, when we are doing in this in continuous time, is nothing more than a kolmogorov of forward equation. So later on, I will come back and try to provide you some intuition of how we can rely on what mathematicians and numerical analysts have learned about solving this class of equations. Now, imagine that the type of uh, heterogeneity that you have is discrete. You have n discrete types. For instance, in some of my own research with Robert Barrow, what we have is agents with high risk aversion and agents with low risk aversion. In that case, GT is just a vector. And what H of uh, GT and ST is nothing more than an uh, equation that is, is actually going to be a linear operator induced by the equilibrium dynamics of the economy. And the only thing you need to do is you need to keep track of n minus one weights. When n is small, so for instance, n is equal to two or equal to three, we have a few types. This is not particularly different. Why only n minus one weights? Because of course the weights need to sum up to one. So we only need to keep track of n minus one of them. 
However, even in this case where we have only two or three agents, we still need to solve for the associated operator, which can be a highly nonlinear function of ST. The problem is when we have a large number of discrete types, for instance, n is bigger than three, because then not only we need to solve for this highly nonlinear function of ST, which is the operator, but we are also going to run into the course of dimensionality. Even tracking n minus one weights can become prohibitively costly. Think about models with five or six types of agents. You need to keep track of four or five different weights. You are really running into the course of dimensionality. And something that sometimes is not sufficiently appreciated it, uh, is that this is not only going to be about an issue of speed, it's also going to be an issue of memory requirements. And it's going to be very easy to run out of memory before one realizes. But if the situation with discrete types can get complicated quite soon, when we have continuous types, that is, for instance, agents can have a continuum of uh, assets from zero to a large amount, the situation is much more challenging. And why is that the case? Because now the distribution of agents, and by the way, this will also happen if we have a mix of continuous and discrete types of agents, is an infinite dimensional object. And we know that we cannot store infinite dimensional objects in the computer. Moreover, H now is going to be a very complex nonlinear operator and manipulating the chalman kolmogorov or the kolmogorov forward equation numerically is going to become the only possibility and in addition to it is going to be a very difficult task. And one could say, well, instead of just keeping track of the whole distribution, we can have some type of ad hoc behavioral roles, but this is often unsatisfactory. First, because we don't really know uh, if the ad hoc behavioral rule is really a very good representation of what agents do. And second, and to me, that's a much more serious challenge, because we will only like to know how much this ad hoc behavioral rule departs from a standard rational equilibrium solution, even just to understand what the consequences of behavioral rules are. So how have researchers tried to solve this uh, problem of dealing with these distributions? As I was saying before, if we have n discrete types, we just keep track of n minus one weights. If we are dealing with a continuous um, type or a mixture of continuous and discrete types, what we do is we extract a finite numbers of features from the distribution GT. What type of features we extract? Well, a classical approach has been moments, like in the celebrated crucial idea of keeping track of the mean, which I will return in a second. Other authors have proposed to keep track of key quantiles. You can also keep weights in a mixture of normals, etc. And then what we are going to do is we are going to <clears throat> stack either the weights or the features of the distribution in a vector mu. And in that sense, we are going to substitute the operator capital H for the operator lowercase h that now instead of depending on the whole distribution GT is going to depend on these features. Of course, in the case of discrete types, capital H and lowercase h are going to be the same. But when we have these features of the distribution, when we have continuous types, then it's going to be yes, an approximation. Now that makes the problem a little bit easier because we can store mu t in the computer we have moved from an infinite dimensional problem to a finite dimensional problem. But we are still facing the challenge <laughs> that H can be a very highly nonlinear operator. And then what we are going to do is we are going to parameterize H by a vector of coefficients theta. Of course, now I'm going to abuse notation a little bit and I'm going to still keep H as that operator that has been parameterized, but with a semicolon before theta to highlight that we have these coefficients that we need to keep track of. And in that sense, what we are going to do is we are going to search coefficients theta such that the operator lowercase h mu t st generates an economy that behaves as closely as possible under an appropriate metric to the economy generated by the distribution gt that follows the operator h. Okay, so far what I have done is present a very abstract setup. So let me go back to the classic uh, Crusella Smith model to show you how the solution methods that many of you may be familiar with is just a particular example of what I told you. So remember that the Crusella Smith model is just a neoclassical growth model with a finite number of aggregate productivity shocks, lowercase st, and heterogeneous households due to idiosyncratic labor shocks that cannot be uh, perfectly insured because we have incomplete markets. 
that implies that in this economy, we are going to have two aggregate variables. First, we are going to have the aggregate productivity shock ST, and we are going to have a household distribution GT that is going to be a function of the assets of each household and the productivity shock of each household C. When we integrate those, um, that distribution with respect to assets, we are going to have the total amount of capital in the economy by a market clearing condition, KT, which is also going to be the mean of the distribution, and we are going to have capital C because and Crucial and Smith are going to assume that a lot of large numbers uh, is going to hold in this economy and then idiosyncratic labor shocks are going to be washed out in the aggregate. So what do Crucial and Smith say? Well, remember in the previous slide that we need to extract some features from GT and the feature that they are going to uh, propose is the log of its mean. So mu t over here is just going to be the log of kt. Extending this idea to higher moments or other key quantiles, as I was mentioning before, is a straightforward yet tedious. And then remember that the next step, when we have this operator that now depends on these features, is to parameterize H. And the way Crucial and Smith are going to parameterize is just assuming that is a linear function on the logs, recall, but where the coefficients are going to be functions of ST. And what we are going to do is we are going to find these coefficients that depend on the ST by simulation. Basically, we are going to come up with some guesses. We are going to simulate the economy. We are going to look how KT and KT plus one are related, and we are going to just estimate these thetas until convergence. Okay, so the only thing I have tried to do by showing you Crusell Smith is show you how this is just a particular application of this much more general approach. And then, of course, I will use this much more general approach to introduce the idea of deep learning. Very good. So what is the problem with Crusell and Smith? Why couldn't just we say, okay, Crusell and Smith figured this out in the mid 1990s. Let's go home and do something else. Well, the problem is that Keeping track of the mean and, and log linear functional form work well for the basic Crucial and Smith model, but what an arbitrary model. And you know, it's very easy to come up with dozens of examples where maybe keeping track of the mean is not good enough and where having a log linear functional form is not satisfactory. And Crucial and Smith do not really give you a constructive approach to come up with a more general way to handle this problem. Also, the Crucial and Smith approach suffers from the course of dimensionality. It is difficult to implement where we have many state variables. Think, for instance, about a household that instead of holding one type of capital needs to hold five different types of capital or a portfolio of five different assets. It's very, very costly to implement the Crucial and Smith in the computer or where you need to keep track of a lot of higher moments. And finally, a little bit more at theoretical level, we don't have very good theoretical foundations of why the, the, the method converges, and we don't really know much about the metric under which it converges. And in fact, there is a little bit of a literature that discusses how to evaluate the Crucial Smith method precisely because this absence of clear theoretical results. Okay, so how can deep learning help? So deep, deep learning is going to help us to address the three challenges that appear before. First, it's going to tell us, um, impossible, how, uh, sorry, possibly how to extract features from an infinite dimensional object efficiently. Remember that over here, I told you we have the distribution GT, and then the thing is how do we summarize this distribution GT in a vector of, in a finite dimensional vector of features mu t. Well, that exercise of dimensionality reduction is exactly for what deep learning was originally designed. Second, how to parameterize the nonlinear operator mapping how distributions evolve. So if we go over here, how we go from this structure H into this structure that now depends on a, on a set of coefficients theta. Okay, and again, we uh, deep learning is going to help us to do that parametrization in a general way. And finally, how to tackle the course of dimensionality, how to be able to move into problems that have a lot of state variables. Given the time limitations and that I only have 30 minutes, today I will only discuss the last two points and I will leave how to extract features from infinite dimensional objects efficiently for another day. Okay, so let me give you the general idea of what deep learning is. Suppose that we want to approximate an unknown function y of hx, where x, and now I'm going to use 
a vector, like in uh, this is a slightly different form in the math notation to denote a vector that has this n dimension. In our notation before, of course, y is just mu of t plus one, which are the features of the distribution tomorrow. And to save on notation, I'm going to assume that mu t is a scalar, like in Crusoe Smith, just the mean of the of capital, but this is just to save you a lot of extra notation. And x is just going to be mu t and st. Remember, the x is what we have over here. Okay, so the problem at, at a very mathematical level is how we approximate this unknown function. And by the way, we are doing this in the context of heterogeneous agent models, but this is exactly the same problem that if you are trying to approximate a value function, a policy function, a pricing kernel, a conditional expectation, a classifier, which is a generalized form of a tobit and a probit, etc. At the end of the day, most of what computational economics is about is approximating unknown functions about which we know relatively little. Okay. So a neural network or an artificial neural network is an approximation to H of X built as a linear combination of M generalized linear models of X, the whole vector of state variables that has the following form. We are going to take now H is going to be NN to denote that this is the neural network approximation. We are going to have a leading term and then we are going to do this combination of one to M linear models. And what are these linear models going to be? They are going to determine by some coefficient, which is just a weight. And then we are going to have an arbitrary activation function. And what the arbitrary activation function does is takes each of the components of the state vector X, moves them or activates them more slowly or more uh, intensely using theta of nm and then moves them with a coefficient. Okay, what type of arbitrary activation functions you can have in mind? So for instance, you can have the most popular these days is ReLU for rectified linear unit, which is the simplest one I can imagine. It's basically zero from minus infinity to zero, and then it's just the uh, 45 degree line. And soft plus is just an approximation to it that is differentiable. It's log of one plus e to the power of x. So how are we going to be able to approximate any function we want with this very, very simple red Relus? Well, very simply, because by playing with the thetas, I'm going to be able to make this relu go up or go down or be more uh, steep or less steep as I want. And through the theta zeros, I'm going to be able to move it to the left or to the right. And just by combining them with theta m, I'm going to actually be able to approximate any function that I want. The only thing I need to do is select the right thetas here, 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 and here. And this is what is sometimes known as training the, the network. There is a lot of details exactly about how you train the network, but let's say for the interest of the presentation today that you just select these thetas to make this H of NN as close as possible to H under some relevant metric. So how does this compare, how does this neural network uh, approximation compare with other approximations you may be familiar with? Well, something you may be familiar with is a Chebyshev polynomial approximation. And in the Chebyshev polynomial approximation, what we do is we pick a basis, a phi of m, also on the vectors of the state, on the, on the state vector x, and we find linear combinations. Basically, look at this and this, what we are doing in the neural network is we are trading off having a lot of basis functions for just having one activation function. But in exchange, we need to have a lot of other extra coefficients. So basically what we are exchanging is a rich parametrization of coefficients for the parsimony of basis functions. Mathematically speaking, we are going to move from a problem that is about the addition of functions into composition of functions. And it turns out to be the case that there is a very deep mathematical reason why this is a very good idea. There's also some issues about how we determine these thetas that are slightly different, but those are secondary. Really at the very core of what we are doing is we are moving as you are doing when you are doing Chebyshev polynomials or splines or any other type of polynomial or series approximation from adding functions into composing functions. And why is this a good idea? Because we have theoretical and practical reasons for it. In terms of theoretical uh, reasons, we have two classic yet remarkable results. The first one is the famous universal approximation theorem by Hornick, Skinscombe, and White that established that this approximation is a nonlinear universal approximation. That is, we can approximate any Borel measurable function mapping finite dimensional spaces to any 
desired degree of accuracy. Why is this so important? Because I'm not imposing things like differentiability. I'm not even imposing continuity. I'm only imposing Borel measurability. And look, if you cannot even have a function in your model that is Borel measurable, I will actually argue your model is not that interesting. It's probably some type of weird model. This is in comparison with Chebyshev or other series approximations where we often need differentiability and we always need some type of continuity. But even more importantly, what you can show is that given that we are composing functions and not adding them, we break the course of dimensionality. And this was first shown by Baron in 1993, but there has been a lot of extensions that make the theorem even more general. And basically says that a one layer neural network as the one I showed you before, achieves integrated square errors of order big O one over Q, where Q is the number of nodes. In comparison for series approximations, the integrated the square error is of order O1 divided by Q2 to the power of N, where N is the dimensions to be approximated. And remember that the problem is that as soon as this N is going to be large, since we are going to have 2 over N, a large number, this is going to be a small number. We, that means that we are going to have a very, very large error. And that basically is telling you that the neural approximation will be able to handle problems with 50, 100, 200 state variables. I have computed approximations to dynamic programming problems and to heterogeneous agent models with 225 state variables, continuous state variables. You are never ever in a million years going to be able to use Chebyshev polynomials to approximate anything that has more than 20 or 30 uh, dimensions, even if you use extremely aggressive uh, sparse grid uh, schemes. But, and this is even more important than the theoretical uh, reasons, we have very, very solid practical reasons. The algorithms that are based on neural networks are extremely easy to code. They are actually, I will argue, much easier to code than using Chebyshev polynomials or spline. Even more importantly, we have a state-of-the-art libraries. You don't need to start from scratch. Uh, we have things like TensorFlow that has been uh, designed by uh, software engineers at Google, which is an absolutely wonderful library, absolutely state of the art, much better than anything you are going to ever be able to uh, code yourself using Chebyshev, splines, or other type of similar approximations. Also, the algorithms are very stable. And again, if I had more time, I could tell you a little bit why that's the case. And as I was mentioning before, they are scalable through massive parallelization. One of the very, very nice thing about approximating things this way and not in this way is that we are going to be able to really, really take advantage of massive parallelization. And in fact, that's why we have come up with, or the industry, not us, of course, but we have come up with dedicated hardware specifically designed to solve this type of problems. And this is, for instance, an FPGA, which is just something that I'm using these days, is a uh, um, a processor where you can rearrange using software the way in which the registers are distributed within memory and that gives you an enormous capability of doing things at a much much faster speed and you can say well is this FPGA something a little bit too crazy it costs four hundred dollars you can, uh, you can buy them, uh, sorry, you can rent them by the hour on Amazon Web Services for less than 50 cents an hour. So no, this is not something crazy or strange. But most importantly, some of you may have learned that Apple has released their new M1 processors, which have a neural neural network dedicated portion of the, of, the, of the processor. That means that if you walk into your local Apple store, you are going to be able to buy in a regular and absolutely a normal and conventional computer, something that by construction can do this much better than this. So you may like Chebyshev polynomials, you may like splines, you may like whatever algorithm you learn in graduate school. I'm going to tell you I couldn't care less because my hardware is going to be so much better than yours that I'm going to blow you out of the water. Okay, so this was for just an introduction to neural networks. So what is the deep in this uh, deep learning? Well, the only thing that you are doing is you are just multi, uh, building multi layers of these neural networks that I was having over here. So instead of having here an XN, what you are going to do is that XN in, in itself is going to be another, the output of another neural network from the original XNs. And you can do this as often as you want. And 
you know, if you want the formal definition, is just what you build is an acyclic multi-layer composition of J plus one neural networks. And you know, if you want to think about, for instance, what we do in my paper uh, with uh, with Gallo, with Max, and, and with George, what you will have is an input layer of the state variables of the model. Then you will have a first hidden layer where you reweight everything, and then you will have a second hidden layer, and you will have the output layer, which will be in our case, the value function of the problem with heterogeneous agents that we are keeping track of. And the Chris, reason, you have yes. five minutes. Yeah, it's okay. I have, I will probably finish early, in fact. Okay. And in fact, uh, what you can get out of having this uh, multi layer network is that you are going to be able, you are still breaking the cross of dimensionality. You are still, of course, be having a universal non linear and non linear universal approximator. But more importantly, the rates of convergence to the right. Oh, sorry, to the exact function that you are looking for is going to be much, much faster. And that's why this deep learning has uh, um, taken off over the last 10 years and why you know, it has become one of the most useful tools this day in the world of machine learning. And you probably have heard about the big successes of deep learning, uh, playing, for instance, Go or Chess, that's just a dynamic programming problem. So that's at a very fundamental level, not very, not very different than what we do in economics. And again, as I was mentioning before, it's very, very easy to use those uh, or to implement those ideas using TensorFlow. And uh, um, what else I wanted to tell you over here, and of course, you know, you can think about a standard neural network as a very particular example of a deep learning uh, algorithm. So in that sense, how can you, for instance, use these deep learning ideas in, in real life? And since I only have a couple of minutes left, let me just sketch the algorithm that we have in the first paper I was mentioning at the introduction, financial frictions and the wealth distribution. It's a very similar model to a crucial smith model, except that now we are going to have uh, financial frictions, and then the agents are going to rent, are, are going to uh, borrow from a financial expert, and the financial expert will be the one operating capital. So what we are going to have over there is that we are going to have, remember the uh, operator H, we are going to have an initial guess, H sub zero for the operator H. Given this current guess, as I was mentioning before, we can solve the dynamic problem of all the different agents in the economy. And that will allow us to build all the endogenous time series in the model, debt, assets, capital, output, etc., and all the new outputs in the future, which is going to be the moments of the distribution. And then we can use these endogenous objects and these endogenous objects to train the network and have a new approximation h of n plus 1. And we then go back to 2, and we again construct time series, and we get to 4, etc., until we get to convergence. So what you will realize is that this algorithm actually looks a lot like Russell Smith. The difference is that how you extract features from the distribution, how you build the parameterized operator, and how you update the parameterized operator is done by deep learning, and not through the proposals of Russell Smith, which, by the way, in their particular model work very, very well. It's just that we don't have a constructive way to generalize them to an arbitrary model. And the great thing about deep learning is that it gives you a general way to deal with models that go beyond Russell Smith. Anyway, let me conclude since I'm running out of time. I think that deep learning has a tremendous potential for macroeconomics. I have been doing this computational macro for 20 years, and I will say this is the most exciting innovation since the arrival of sequential Monte Carlo methods in the late 1990s. And I think there are fantastic theoretical reasons to use it, but more importantly, great practical reasons for it. And it can also be used for many other uh, features, which I have many other goals that I haven't uh, explained today. For instance, to solve high dimensional dynamic optimization problems and for taking the SE models to the data I have another paper where I show you how I show how you can do a structural estimation of DSE models using non-structured data like satellite photographs or text analysis and you estimate the structural DSE model thanks to the fact that you can build a uh, deep learning okay let me stop here since I think I have run out of time great thank you very much Jesus it's a very interesting talk. It makes me think back to when I was a grad student and I was uh, dabbling in some macroeconomics and I was always afraid of state variables. And now you're talking about hundreds of state variables. Yes. Um, which is quite some, uh, quite some progression. Yes, um, hopefully. <laughs> there is, so there are a couple of questions in the chat window. Um, I'll try yeah. and summarize. So Alex, I think it's Alex Mihailov. Um, 
he he talks about um, the, the possibilities this raises for uh, revisiting benchmark models in macroeconomics. And he asks, how much do you expect these new methods to dominate in the field in the next five years or so? And will they revolutionize macro, expanding our knowledge and hence our confidence for policy advice? Uh, yes, I'm very, I'm quite optimistic. I'm quite optimistic because I think we are going to be able to deal with uh, models that are going to be able to have much richer features. Uh, of course, there is always, uh, when we are building models in economics, there is always a tension between having a model that is very simple and straightforward and stylized and really understanding what is going on versus models that are richer and maybe because they have too many features, they, they, they get a little bit complicated to analyze. And I think that and the top macroeconomists in 10 years or in five years are going to be the ones who know how to write a very, very simple model that maybe gets the intuition right and then build a quantitative model that you can solve using deep learning that gets the numbers right. Uh, but you know, at, at the end of the day, right now I will say that the most important policy discussion everywhere in the advanced world in the in the Western economies is inequality, the different aspects of inequality, mm -hmm. how inequality is evolving, what we can do about it. And if you want to take inequality seriously, you need to have models with heterogeneous agents. And if you want to have models where inequality is sufficiently rich, it's just not something very stylized, you need to deal with many state variables. So for instance, uh, right now, something I'm also doing with Gallo is what are the consequences of monetary policy for inequality. Um, this is something that central bankers, and I know from talking with many presidents of federal reserve systems or, or governors of European of, of banks in Europe, I know this is at the absolute very top of their agenda. And as, as a profession, we need to be able to, to tell them something about it. And I think that deep learning will help us to provide policymakers with better instruments in their, in their, for their decision. Then, of course, they will make whatever they want, and, and, and we need to be also be careful about those models. And uh, just as I, and, and I'll try to, to keep the, the second part of the answer uh, short, I think that we have learned that uh, this machine learning works so incredibly well in so many different fields that it will be really remarkable if economics is an exception. And I don't know, there is this old saying about the incredibly the incredible success of mathematics you apply mathematics everywhere and they always seems to work and i think that with machine learning is a little bit the same so in that sense i'm quite optimistic thank you so um so nicola rubino asks uh nicola rubino asks yeah. how many neuronal layers would be optimal for a neural network application okay so you this sorry i'll just carry yeah. on so you mentioned baron 1993 but how much more deep should an ann be to be give us the best modeling solutions and the best empirical forecasts. Okay, very good. So um, all this is what sometimes is known as determining the hyper parameters. So this M for instance, or then if we are doing the, 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 the deep learning, how many layers. I think that this is, um, you know, it's a, it's a little bit the same like when we do simulations you or, or any other type of numerical method. Uh, we need, as, an, as a profession, we need to accumulate some experience about uh, how many of those we need. I can tell you what has worked well for my models. Uh, I cannot claim they are going to work well for every model. I found that three or four layers and then around six to 10 neurons per layer are able to give me everything I need in terms of flexibility. Okay, so you don't need a tremendous number of them, but you know, this is something that you will need to fine tune a little bit in each of your applications. But if you say, let me try something easy, I will say three layers, six nodes per layer will probably be a good starting point. It's a little bit like, you know, uh, I don't know how many of you took uh, classes in time series when people were, uh, everything was about armas and it was always, you know, always start with an ARIMA 211. That's kind of a good default. So I will say that uh, three times six is a good default. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, Sichuan Wang asks um, or, or mentions that your example uh, on slide 22 had time series data. And therefore he asks, would it be more natural to use LSTM rather than ANN? Uh, I'm not quite sure what they stand for. Hopefully you do. Um, okay, so first of all, remember these are time series, but these are time series generated within the context of the model. These are mm -hmm. not time series out from the data. 
And in that sense, I think that uh, um, uh, you really want to capture the dynamics involved by them. And I think that an artificial neural network is just going to do much better. Okay, and that's what you really want to keep in mind. This is not, um, we are not really trying to capture the dynamics of, um, of I don't know, the stock prices in, in SP500. We are trying to capture the dynamics within the context of the model. All this is within the model. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, so Eddie Gerber asks, um, could you maybe tell us what the limits are of the training function you use in the neural network algorithm? Does it need to be differentiable or other limits uh, or are there other limits on nonlinearity? Uh, no, not really. As, uh, okay, so first of all, I'm not sure if Eddie means uh, the function we are trying to approximate age or the function that we use as the activation function. Uh, if we are using, um, if he's referring to age, then the activation universal function. Yeah. Sorry, okay. So the activation yeah. function. Yes. If it is the activation function, in fact, ReLU is non-differentiable over here at zero, and mm -hmm. yet people like it because it's so easy. I tend to use soft plus because in that way I get rid of non-differentiabilities in one point or another. That kind of gives me a little bit of better results. But a lot of people say, bah, uh, use ReLU, I'm fine. You have like a few points where you have non-differentiabilities, you can always smooth them. That's not a big deal. Mm. So in that sense, I will say either ReLU or SoftPlus are going to probably give you a very, very good idea, a very good uh, situation. Basically, what is going to happen then is that you have non-differentiabilities or jumps. What you will have is that one, as you get over here, one of the coefficients, you are basically composing these different functions. What will happen is that they will jump. And uh, you will need to play a little bit with the coefficients, but in general, you are going to be able to, to deal very, very efficiently or let me say it more carefully, more efficiently than with alternative methods for non-differentiabilities and, and for jumps. And again, I'm sorry, I don't have a lot of time to have examples about it, but non-differentiabilities in particular are very, very easy to handle. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions? So we've got a couple more minutes. If anybody mm -hmm. wants to ask uh, Jesus a question or if you want, you want any more, Want to share any more thoughts, Jesus? Uh, no, nothing. I, I will just say that I will encourage people. I have some of this material online on my webpage. Uh, so if you go to, to teaching, uh, if you go to my webpage and you go to teaching, I teach this material in a class called Continuous Time Methods in Macroeconomics. And I have there a lot of slides for people who want to learn about it. And I will also be uh, happy to provide people with more references. The very good thing uh, about this is that being a method, uh, so let me let me quote Adam Smith, since we are economists. And you know, one of the great insights of Adam Smith is division of labor. And one thing I like deep learning a lot is there is a lot of really really brilliant people. Um, you know, in the UK, for instance, there is a fantastic group of researchers at Oxford and Cambridge doing this. In the US, you have great people at Columbia and Stanford. These are some of the top minds of their generation, and they have thought about this deep learning. Uh, and they have come up with great set of resources, great set of textbooks. And as economists, we can really borrow from them. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. And for instance, if anyone once uh, the standard textbook to learn about some of this stuff is by uh is uh, let me open it's god fellow and i'm going to put the the reference in the in the in the chat give me one second and those are really really fantastic source uh, uh, sources so it's not that you need to do uh, you need to reinvent anything um let me just do this this will probably and I can do panelists and attendees, I think. So that will be the Amazon uh, link. And that's the standard textbook. If you want to learn about some of this stuff, that will be a fantastic textbook that you should buy. I tell my, when I teach this class, I teach a class on deep learning to graduate students on machine learning. And I, told, I, and I tell them to get this book, put it under the pillow when they sleep. So maybe the, the wisdom will penetrate in their brains. <laughs> Thank you. So um, his, just because just we've got a, a couple more minutes, one last question came in from JP. Um, how are you applying verification and validation to your modeling process through the hidden layers, particularly if prone to spoofing with generative adversarial networks? Not quite sure what he means by the verification or validation of your modeling process. 
So okay. can he elaborate a little bit? Um, perhaps you can chat in the, uh, during the next yeah. talk, perhaps, and follow okay. up with, with, J, with JP. Okay, right. Well, thank you very much, Jesus. Uh, I'd like to applaud, but uh, it's <laughs> very difficult. Um, so thank you. Okay, so uh, we're a little bit ahead of time, but I think we might as well uh, move on and uh, uh, and therefore give more time perhaps to discussion following the next talk. So Lee, are you are you ready? I, I am here and I'm ready to share. Okay, thank you. Yeah, please share your screen. Is that right? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Okay, so our second talk uh, in the computational advances session is uh, uh, by Lee Tesfatsion, uh, who is currently a, a research professor and professor emerita of economics at Iowa State University. I'll hand over to you, Lee. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Just let me check that first. Yeah, it's very clear. Okay, all right, good. Okay, I'd first like to thank the organizers, uh, Alex and Angus, for inviting me to present. Um, two themes are stressed for this conference. What new methods will help us to understand better our complex and evolving macro reality? And what new methods will help us to address better our new policy challenges? In keeping with these two themes, uh, what I'd like to talk about today, again briefly, will be, be describe an approach to economic modeling that I call agent-based computational economics, or ACE for short. And after a concise presentation of the seven specific modeling principles that define the ACE approach, I will briefly explain why I, I believe ACE modeling facilitates macroeconomic modeling in three critical regards. First, facilitation of comprehensive empirical validation. Second, facilitation of policy development arcs all the way from initial conceptualization to ultimate implementation. And third, facilitation of the presentation of findings to stakeholders in a clear and intuitively compelling manner. So as noted on slide three, all macroeconomists share two concerns. How, how do real macroeconomies work? How could they work better? And what I'm gonna argue in the talk today is that uh, there are five essential features of real world macroeconomies uh, that we should really pay attention to. First, real world macroeconomies have heterogeneous interacting participants. Second, they are open-ended dynamic systems. Third, the human participants are strategic decision makers. Fourth, all participants are locally constructive. And what I mean by that, at any given time, they are constrained to act in accordance with their own local states, consisting of data, attributes, and methods. And fifth, real world macroeconomies are reflexive. That is the actions taken by their participants at any given time affect future local states. And these five essential features imply that real world market economies are locally constructive sequential games. So as will next be carefully explained, I believe ACE modeling embodies all five of these essential features characterizing real world macroeconomies. And thus it permits the study of macroeconomies as locally constructive sequential games. So what is ACE? Okay, so as indicated on slide six, a summary definition is that ACE is the computational modeling of economic processes, including whole economies, as open-ended dynamic systems of interacting agents. And thus an ACE model is a computationally constructed world. ACE shares three basic goals with other variants of agent-based modeling. First, to enable modeling of real-world economic systems for which coordination is a possibility, but not a modeler imposed restriction. Second, to enable agents to act as freely within their computationally constructed world as their empirical counterparts act within the real world. And third, permits events to be fully driven by agent interactions starting from modeler specified initial conditions. However, in contrast to other agent-based modeling approaches, 
an ACE model is required to satisfy spe seven specific modeling principles. I've written these out with care in order to enhance the ability to compare and contrast ACE with other modeling approaches, because there's been a lot of confusion about what agent-based modeling is or isn't, okay? So this is a variant of agent-based modeling with very specifically written out modeling principles. First, as explained on slide seven, modeling principle, principle MP1 defines an agent to be a software entity within a computationally constructed world that is capable of acting within that world based on its own state, that is based on its own internal data, attributes, and methods. Modeling principle MP2 asserts that agents in an ACE world can include a wide scope of entities, individuals, social groupings, institutions, biological entities, or physical entities. Modeling principle MP3 requires agents to be locally constructed. That is, the action of any agent at any given instant must be determined as a function of that own agent's state at that instant. Continuing on, MP4 expresses agent autonomy. This is a critical one, agent autonomy. The external coordination of agent interactions is not permitted. Rather, the coordination of inter agent interactions must arise endogenously, if at all, as a result of agent interaction. Modeling principle MP5 asserts that the state of the computationally constructed world at any given instant is determined by the ensemble of agent states at that instant. Modeling principle MP6 asserts all events in the computationally constructed world must be determined solely by agent interactions starting from initial agent states. And finally, and importantly, modeling principle MP7 asserts that the role of the modeler is limited to the setting of initial agent states and to the ex post observation analysis and reporting of out outcomes in a non perturbational manner. So turning to slide nine, if you put these seven principles together, which I know I've gone through very quickly, but what they do is define ACE models as computational laboratories. And, and even more specifically than that, ACE is a computationally constructed world that evolves over time like a culture in a Petri dish. A researcher sets initial conditions in a Petri dish in accordance with some specific research purpose. However, once the Petri dish cover is closed, no further interference with the growth of the Petri dish culture is permitted. Slides 10 depicts an illustrative agent hierarchy for an ACE model macroeconomy that includes three basic types of agents, decision makers, durable goods, and institutions. And you can, starting with basic types of agents, these can be specialized in order to instantiate various derived types of agents, as shown in this slide. Object-oriented programmers here in our audience today will recognize the analogy between agents in ACE models and classes in Java and other oriented object-oriented programming languages. And indeed, agent-based modelers, including ACE modelers, typically implement their models using object-oriented programming languages. Slide 11 makes brief mention of an ACE macroeconomic study appearing in a 2015 journal of economic dynamics and control article. The goal of this study was to counteract a false perception among some ACE commentators still making these comments today that computationally constructed decision making agents could not exhibit the same level of rationality as human decision makers that they had to be necessarily stupid in some sense. And to the contrary, what this study showed is that ACE consumers and firms can be endowed with learning capabilities, ranging all the way from simple reactive or enforcement learning to the sophisticated use of adaptive dynamic programming methods for the approximate achievement of intertemporal utility and profit objectives. A key point that I stressed in this study is that the GE in DSGE modeling can be split into two conceptually distinct parts, G and E, and the equilibrium requirement E can then be replaced by an L indicating that model decision makers have learning capabilities. As seen on slide 12, continuing this study uh, synopsis here, two basic types of locally constructive learning methods are explored in this study for 
consumers and firms with intertemporal objectives. The first basic type referred to as reactive learning asks, if this has happened, what should I do? But the second basic type referred to anticipatory learning asks, if I do this, what will happen? And what I'm arguing here today very strongly is that both types of learning are fully possible within computationally constructed worlds with strategic agents. In this study, the Pareto Optimal Nash Equilibrium for consumer and firm learning methods turned out to be when all consumers and firms implemented rolling fixed horizon learning with a certain look ahead horizon, which is denoted on slide 12 as the EOFH method. Interestingly enough, this method then dominated the more quote unquote sophisticated learning of the uh, explicit adaptive optimizer who used adaptive dynamic programming. There, there are interesting reasons for that, which I could go into in this, maybe in the QA session. But anyway, this point of this, this article is to stress again that computational decision-making agents can be just as rational or irrational, for that matter, as human decision-makers. On slide 13, I note that a key advantage of ACE modeling is that researchers can test for the existence or absence of equilibrium at multiple conceptual levels. And illustrative the equilibrium conceptualizations at different levels of analysis are listed on slide 13. These levels range from microeconomic analysis of agent attributes and methods, to the meta-analysis of trading networks, to the macroeconomic analysis of growth patterns. So ACE does is a multi-layered approach to modeling that allows looking at equilibrium in a very general, uh, sophisticated manner. On slide 14, I note another key advantage of ACE modeling is that it permits a comprehensive approach to empirical validation. As I indicate on EV1 on slide 14, an ACE modeler can check to ensure that the exogenous inputs to a model are empirically meaningful and appropriate for a purpose at hand. The inputs can be, as indicated here, initial state conditions, functional form, shock realizations, database parameter estimates, and parameter values imported from other studies. EV2 on slide 14 stresses that ACE modeling permits a modeler to check to ensure that modeled processes are empirically meaningful and appropriate for a purpose at hand. This is particularly important, in my opinion, uh, because process validation is not something we see often uh, in current macroeconomic mainstream models. And what I mean process is how do people trade? How do they form their settlements? How do they uh, form long-term contractual relationships? What is the process by which they do this? The dynamic processes. And the processes should be consistent with real world essential scaffolding constraints, such as physical laws, stock flow relationships, and of course, accounting identities. On slide 15, I go on to say, of course, ACE modeling also permits the more traditional types of validation, output validation, and, uh, and in uh, yeah, output validation for descriptive purposes with using in-sample fitting and predictive output validation out of sample forecasting uh, of new data that was not available at the time the model was constructed. On slide 16, I, I note another advantage of ACE modeling is its facilitation of policy analysis. Ensuring, of course, that a policy is ready for implementation typically requires a series of modeling efforts at different scales, and I would, would argue with different degrees of empirical validation. And if you move too soon to policy implementation, you're gonna entail a major risk of unintended consequences. Therefore, on slide 17, I've been developing uh, for my work in electric power markets, I've developed a standardized policy readiness level uh, classification that's turned out to be immensely useful to understand and, and, and appreciate the modeling efforts of a wide range of people using different levels of empirical validation. One of the most important advantages of ACE modeling I then argue is it supports a full arc of policy design all the way from concept to implementation. And as, slow, as I show on slide 17, policy research can be divided into nine distinct policy readiness levels or PRLs. At one end of the scale, you've got PRLs one through three. They describe initial policy research efforts from basic conceptualization to low fidelity modeling. 
policy research at these periods one through three typically carried out at universities and research institutes where we don't have large budgets to do a lot of different large scale modeling with, with detailed empirical verification. At the other end of the scale, you've got periods seven to nine describing policy research efforts involving prototype large scale modeling, field studies, and real world implementations. And typically these are what you see carried out by industry, government, and regulatory agencies. And between these two extremes lie PRLs four to six, which I characterize here as the valley of death. And I say PRLs four through six span the range between moderate fidelity, small scale modeling, and prototype, but still small scale modeling. The problem is that you see relatively few policy research studies conducted in PRLs four to six, which of course is the bridge between the conceptual type of modeling one through three and the more uh, field study oriented and deployment oriented uh, modeling occurring at uh, seven through nine. And this is why I refer to this as the valley of death. And I'm, I say we need to encourage more studies that bridge between the two worlds, between the academic and the industry. And, and uh, basically, I'm arguing that ACE provides is well suited for bridging this valley. ACE computational platforms permit policy performance testing at these valley of death PRLs four to six. And I can say based on 15 years experience using developing and using ACE platforms to test market designs for US electric power markets, I can assert with confidence that ACE is well suited for bridging this valley of death. Another aspect of ACE on slide 19, uh, uh, that I uh, experienced in a recent watershed project, I have observed how ACE facilitates what I, what's called iterative participatory modeling, or IPM for short. Now, IPM is an ongoing open-ended learning process among modelers and stakeholders, consisting of repeated cycling through PRLs one through nine. And we facilitated and practice IPM in our watershed study with local people involved directly in watershed management. It was quite successful to be using modeling, ACE modeling in particular, and then going through a variety of steps with stakeholders um, and, until we learned that we had to go back and revise the model and once again, uh, work up towards stakeholder uh, comments on the modeling. So we had these PRLs one through nine that we basically iterated through uh, over and over again as an ongoing learning uh, approach instead of trying to provide a definitive solution in some sense and walk away. Okay, the final thing I wanna mention is uh, standardized presentation protocols. Um, this is an important issue for all ACE modelers. How can ACE policy models and findings be presented to stakeholders, regulators, and other interested parties in a clear, intuitively compelling manner? And my proposal here is to develop a nested sequence of standardized protocols, presentation protocols, tailored to the policy readiness level of the modeling effort. Okay, and so then I, we've actually put this into some bit of practice and it really facilitates instruct, um, communication with stakeholders to be able to point, I mean, actually in our watershed model, we were modeling the people we were talking to. So we would come at them with a model in which we could say, this is you, <laughs> you are modeled here <laughs> and we are modeling your role here. What do you think about the way we've actually expressed your, ex, uh, your participation in this watershed management project? Okay, so in conclusion, um, I just want to uh, mention uh, a couple of things. First, I do believe uh, as fiercely as the previous speaker that in my case, ACE modeling is a useful addition to the toolkits of researchers studying real world macroeconomies. And I'm also thinking it's useful for not just the modeling of macroeconomies, but specifically for policy research. But I do recognize that much remains to be done. And I've touched on today briefly four important issues uh, that I think need to be looked at more carefully. First, comprehensive empirical validation. And second, perhaps refinements of these policy readiness levels specifically for different types of policy application within macro standardized presentation protocols, again, tailored to the policy readiness level of the model being presented, 
and finally, demonstrated value in real world economic application. So in case people are interested, I have prepared a slide to, uh, that gives you basic references, online references, where the ideas that I've briefly, briefly presented in my talk today can be explored at greater length. And the uh, links are annotated. Um, and they provide res uh, pointers to four ACE resource sites plus a background paper. So the first link here is to the ACE website or the homepage that I've been managing, uh, maintaining since 1996 uh, uh, when the first browsers actually appeared. And then the second one is a very active, also a very active site that specifically addresses ACE research within the area of macroeconomics. The third site mentioned, uh, explains in much more care and detail the empirical validation of ACE models, has a lot of different resources uh, linked with annotated uh, explanation. And the fourth stresses presentation protocols for ACE modeling, and again, provides an extensive uh, array of pointers with annotation to work that's been done in that area. And everything I've talked about today, really briefly, is available in a much greater uh, length and more careful explanation in the background paper, the final mentioned link here, which is a fairly recent article I've had, Modeling Economic Systems as Locally Constructive Sequential Games in the Journal of Economic Methodology that appeared in 2017. So I thank you very much for your time. And uh, questions, of course, are most welcome. Hey, thank you very much, Lee. So there are a couple of questions already in the chat window, and I'm sure a few more will come in. But before that, because we've actually got quite a bit of time, I wanted to um, invite you maybe, for somebody who is ignorant about these models, like uh, uh, as ignorant as, about these models as myself, um, to elaborate maybe on um, a couple of the examples you were mentioning that sounded really interesting, where, where you and yourself have used AC models to actually advise and uh, affect policy. Uh, you mean elaborate on what kind of assumptions we made? No, 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 just the examples. Oh. Uh, you, you mentioned you were actually modeling the people that you were advising. Oh, I'm yes, just curious yes. about when you mean you, the, you mean the watershed project? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, actually, I, okay, I, I did a one watershed project and I've done maybe 12 electric power market projects, which right. would you rather hear about? <laughs> because the same thing arises in electric power markets. I'm a little more comfortable there uh, because we're actively engaged uh, there uh, because I am a courtesy research professor of electrical and computer engineering. Uh, mm -hmm. I have been actively involved with interdisciplinary uh, research with power engineers since 2000. And what what the 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 the, the main approach that's taken within engineering, some of you may know, is to involve industry in the research. And so the very moment a grad student, a PhD student or a master's student arrives on campus, they're arriving there because they've been invited to join a uh, not only the program uh, of classes and courses, but also a particular research project by a professor. And these pro projects are typically funded by Department of Energy or a national lab, all of mine have been, well, many, most of them, I have a couple of NSF, but ma mainly though, we look for the DOE and the, the, the uh, Pacific National Lab, Pacific Northwest National Lab or Los Alamos National Lab. National lab support has been very, very important. And we bring in industry members. So every project has a whole set of industry members who are actively involved in power market uh, design and policy implementation. And so to get to your point, when, in we, when we're modeling electric power market, we are modeling, I model integrated transmission and distribution systems at two different levels. And so I have to, I'm modeling the people who are running the wholesale power market and I'm running people at the distribution level who are buying the power and involved in retail transaction. And so when I talk to industry members, I say, well, I'm modeling how you <laughs> manage the daily the day ahead market and how you model, uh, how you handle real time market operations and how you handle reserve procurement. And this is how I've modeled it. And uh, so the industry members and the uh, and the uh, academic members of the project get to interact like that to check whether what we're doing makes sense uh, to the actual people who are doing the the actions the policy actions that we are trying to model and so it's a very it's a, been a very challenging 
absolutely astounding and interesting uh, uh, 20 years uh, working in this market area for a particular uh, electric power market in this in my case. Same thing happened on watersheds, but I was only involved there for three years. Here I've been involved for 20 with electric power markets. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, but- uh, Yeah, it does. It, it, it sounds fascinating that you get so close to policy uh, yeah. as that to actually but interact like, with the person who's going to who's, who's yeah. doing it. Yeah. But like I say, if you you know you're pointing to the person in your model who you're modeling and you're talking yeah. to that person and having dinner with them, and so you know you have a chance to really have them spout off, if you will, on whether we've got it right. And yeah. I should I should mention that all these models are implemented by Java Python. And they are available at, uh, we have just released a three new software packages at GitHub sites. I noticed the previous author did the same. So GitHub is a very nice way of releasing software. So these are open source software packages. Uh, I must say that's a little different. Most engineers don't like to share their software, but I do. I've always been open source. So all of these things I'm talking about, even actually the code for this model on slide 11, uh, for this is a dynamic uh, DSGE model uh, with all of the equilibrium stuff torn out and replaced with learning. And so, you, but all of the code for this model and all the code for anything I've ever done basically has been released open source uh, available to others to use. Okay. All right, thanks. Uh, from the chat window, JP asks, um, have you considered how your PRL and IPM uh, could uh, could have or could be used for addressing COVID test and trace uh, or policies um, like that. I thought a lot about that because, uh, but of course, we are in the emergency right now, mm -hmm. and and so what we're looking at here on slide. I don't know if you still see my slide, slide seventeen. Yeah, we can. Okay, we yeah. Can. What you're looking at here is a way to develop models, uh, uh, starting from a conceptual idea and then building up, and usually in power market area to get a idea all the way from concept to implementation if it makes it i mean it's years okay it's not we're not talking about days or months so the problem with covid is that um uh not my problem. I mean, I'm not in this area, but I'm saying the, the problem with COVID would be, are there models already ready to go? And I have been looking and I don't want to cite any specific model because there are lots of them out there. And I, I don't not as that's not my area of expertise, but but there are a lot of people who have been trying to do uh, um, uh, health models, health models of pandemic spread for many years using agent-based tools, diffusion processes, of course, but diffusion when the agent is actually the carrier of the diffusion, it isn't just a mathematical uh, function, but you actually have agents uh, as the carriers of ideas and carriers of disease, uh, carriers of viruses uh, that are interacting with each other. So it's a different, uh, um, uh, um, I might add one thing, I, I know deep learning is very interesting and I, I have a lot about that on my websites as well, but one thing about agent-based modeling is that you are forced here to make sure that you are respecting local constructivity of the agent, that is you aren't um, and this goes back to ideas by Gennery and others that you know you aren't assuming coordination of expectations that's not realistic. Okay, so you've got to have your everything that's happening in the model starting from initial conditions, at least where you can have lots of common knowledge assumed. But after that, everything that happens has to be transmitted constructively from agent to agent uh, through communication channels that are that you've modeled that are processes that should be realistic. So, so here too, then you you the, the agent based model is giving you a chance to really model the real world processes by which you might try to control this disease. And, um, uh, and, and you can start the model out uh, with all of the limitations we currently have in terms of institutional uh, non-communication or inappropriately leveled communication between institutional uh, entities that are trying to handle this uh, thing in a, in, a, in a sort of fragmented way. I think the same thing happens in finance. We've got a lot of different regulatory agents that aren't totally perfectly coordinated. And, and so the issue is whether you want to start with what is and see what can be done, or do you want to redesign the institutions for the next pandemic? I think we have very different types of, types of modeling approaches, depending on what you're actually trying to do, emergency condition modeling or 
modeling longer term for institutional design, market design uh, for a longer term perspective. Yep. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to actually ask Alex to unmute because in the chat window he's um, made some comments that are very positive and uplifting about the state of macro and I wondered if you wanted to elaborate uh, and, and invite some discussion from the from the two speakers. Thank you, Carl. I didn't mean to occupy more attention, but I mean, uh, the last two talks just provoked a few thoughts in my head, which seem really optimistic. And I wanted to discuss a little bit more that, given that we now have time, like um, the session ended earlier, Jesus didn't use his time and neither did Lee, and they proposed very interesting uh, ways, methodologies, uh, uh, additions to, to our talk. So I had these questions. Uh, my optimism comes from two sources. I think I, I can see a synthesis convergence of uh, models based on extreme rationality and several types of agents like the standard DSG models and models like uh, what Lay presented, uh, agent-based computational models where the rationality is minimum, there, there is lots of interaction and, and uh, layers. And given the methods that Jesus proposes, uh, dealing with the curse of dimensionality, finding ways to approximate functions, and on top of that, GitHub and sharing codes, where is the dismal economist? I'm so happy. <laughs> I don't feel dismal. <laughs> to be now generous and, and collaborative. So if we can a little bit talk about that, I had this question to lay Jesus and Paul if they want to interfere and to Laura and to Laura. Thanks. Yeah, if I could just comment on that. There is an, um, an educational aspect to this. I used to teach Asian-based economics uh, when I, I have retired from teaching. But uh, basically students love this stuff because when you're running a, a, a culture dish experiment where you set the initial conditions, close the cover, and then you have to watch, you don't know what's going to happen. You are surprised, maybe, by what happens. And so it's really like a real world experiment in that sense, that we don't have all the answers in advance. We aren't coordinating things from top down and outside the model. We aren't forcing equilibrium. We aren't forcing rationality. We aren't forcing anything. We're just asking if agents have these kind of attributes data and methods and they're you know the agents include institutional structures and all the rest of it um, and you try to do something new within the model or you try to make a change of some kind of policy change or whatever close the cover and watch what your experiment results in and that and and and, and students really there's a different excitement in the classroom when you're teaching that way I might add, chemists, for example, use agent-based modeling to, to allow students to run new kind of experiments and blow up the classroom, you know, virtually. <laughs> so so, so th this, this kind of experimentation, uh, it is similar to human agent experimentation. Of course, there's many, many connections there that we have uh, been exploring. We have uh, uh, been exploring over the years. Uh, and I didn't show you that slide, perhaps I should have, because I had time, but there's actually a whole spectrum of approaches starting from pure human subject experimentation, ending up ending up with pure computational agent experimentation. And in between, you can have huge in, uh, human agents uh, interacting in uh, with computational agents um, in model settings. It's, it's very quite exciting. It's, it's, it's like gaming, of course, but done with a scientific purpose in mind. And I just, I'm just so excited about all these methods. I cannot understand uh, why, why economists aren't more excited by all these tools. As the previous uh, speaker said, deep learning is very exciting. So I've done a lot of work on ANNs in, in different contexts uh, uh, myself. Um, uh, I'm not, you know, I, for myself, I'd have, I'd want to make sure that when you use deep learning uh, on these uh, models that he has that are modeled with mathematical modeling of uh, uh, vectors of, of, uh, of distinct kinds of agents, I would still want to make sure that the informational and expectational aspects there stick to constructivity. That is, they're not, you're not, you're not imposing your modeler uh, outside views and your modeler outside 
uh, objectives onto the actual agents. You've got to let them uh, act within their world with the same amount of information and freedom that their real world counterparts have in order to get a scientifically valid outcome. And so there I'd want to be a little careful. But other than that, I, I think um, deep learning, I've, I've Definitely, use, actually, as the, uh, I'm sure the previous speaker would, would say, even the single layer hidden network ANNs uh, in many contexts work very nicely. So, so that the whole ANN uh, concept is, is very interesting. And, and we've got all these other kinds of things uh, that we can do computationally. So I think computational economics has grown up. Uh, if we just um, stress to people, if, if you don't know object-oriented programming, it's really hard to explain why I'm so excited about agent-based modeling, because object-oriented programming, we've taken it over, calling it agent-oriented programming. We've pushed the limits so that we give more autonomy to the objects, more autonomy to what we call the agents. Uh, we allow them to speak to each other at event structured times. Um, we, we can allow all these different kinds of things like birth and death. I was just thinking about that with the previous speaker. The type of the agent can evolve over time. They aren't fixed types. You know, they can evolve. They can change their minds. They can change their attributes. They certainly can change their data. So we have all of these things, you know, maybe almost too much at this point, freedom, degree of freedom, but it is so exciting. And we need to convey this to our students. We need to convey that all these interesting new tools, computational tools, are opening up whole new worlds for economics, um, way beyond what we've seen uh, in the past. Uh, hundreds of years. Okay. Thank you. Did anybody else want to come in? Uh, uh, Jesus, Paul, on the, the dismal state of macroeconomics or not? Uh, uh, I will only take a little bit of a, of a different approach in the sense that you were saying, you know, why do we put things in GitHub? I think, sure, I mean, there is, you, you always want to share your results, but there is also a, a very pragmatic point uh, if you post your things on GitHub, you are going to get more citations. So no. in that sense, <laughs> you will not. And, and given how important citations are becoming, and they are going to become more and more because that's the way the deans are going to are going to decide which races. Uh, I think at this moment we will see probably a lot of people in the profession posting everything on GitHub more and more. Uh, so in that sense, I again I, I quoted Adam Smith before, and I think I'm going to quote him again. I tend to have a little bit more trust on the self interest of people. Can I can I add one more comment that that yeah. that's very important yeah. um, that I didn't put into my talk, but very important. It's about empirical validation. Okay, what we have, and I think the previous speaker mentioned this as well. We have today is a strong move towards using. Uh, artificial intelligence, uh, I would actually say artificial life as well. Artificial intelligent methods are, are being incorporated into all kinds of different industries and uh, the processes, uh, the implementation of processes within industry. In my area, electric power markets, the power market is highly automated. Okay, now what does this mean? It means that if you're going to do empirical validation, did you get the processes right? Did you get the market right? The most amazing thing is we can actually take from the actual real world market, we can take their optimization software, which we do called security constraint, economic dispatch and commitment. We take the actual optimization software they use to clear the markets every day and we can have our agents using that same software. And also they use automated methods for determining forecasts. Okay, we can adopt those same methods into our model. So the point is that as the world becomes more automated, computational methods, the empirical validation permitted by computational methods grows by leaps and bounds because we can actually adopt the actual methods in the real world into the model and have the agents in our model using those very same methods. And this is, this is, just, this is just beyond anything. Uh, I, I've seen any uh, uh, empirical validation in economics do so far, but it's there, it's there for the taking. Uh, Laura, Paul, did you want to carry on the um, discussion? Yeah, just on, on the theme of um, integrating in the, and synthesis of different approaches. I'm, uh, I'm particularly interested in the, uh, the DSGL model where, as I understand it, you take a DSG model and you 
you strip out the market equilibrium and replace it with something akin. learning yeah learning agents yeah. right yeah. Um, well, there is another literature which is, is is a bit closer to the 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 DSG model, um, which 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 takes a DSG model and and strips out the the model of of, of um, expectations. Um, uh, um, so um, so this is the um, so behavioural literature. So it replaces yes. expectations with with a number of different models of expectations. There's, there's, there's so-called statistical learning. There's Euler oh, yeah. learning, anticipated utility learning. So Gabay has got a, a, a myopia, and this is actually much closer to what we've been doing up to now. Um, so I, I really wonder. Um, I mean, what 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 your views on this is? Yes. Um, again, I'm I. Cameras. I mean, I know that literature quite well, the behavioral literature, and have actually tried using some of the methods that have been proposed in that literature for learning. But uh, what, interestingly enough, uh, what we have, the, the issue here we have here is that we have um, a, a specific, um, a specific organizational structure, a market, uh, a markets, multiple markets, actually labor and final good markets. And we have a variety of different types of agents. We start them fairly similar, but very soon endogenous and uh, endo endogenous heterogeneity sticks in, uh, kicks in because people earn different amounts of money. And when they earn different amounts of money through their various attempts to buy and sell, um, they update their expectation and it's again stressed in the adductive learning literature these expectations are very sensitive to changes in wealth and changes in experience and changes in who you interact with and so my, my only problem with behavioral economics as i have read it to date is that it still uh, sort of assumes a rather static environment within which the learning is occurring but but here in the uh, I call it the stripped <laughs> DSG model, where where you, you start the agents with these inter, you, you start them with the same structure, the same physical structure as in the DSG model. You know they have attributes, they have production functions, they have utility functions, they have initial endowments and all that kind of stuff. But but difference is that they're living their life in a world with these multiple agents who, about whom they don't know very much, and so you've got this a coordination problem. I mean, the market itself can fail. By the way, in our world here that you're looking at on slide 11, um, in some cases, the market fails. I mean, people people go insolvent. Consumers die. <laughs> I mean, they don't get enough money to meet their subsistence needs. They're going to die. And the, the firms go insolvent. They have to leave the economy. So in some cases, with some combinations of learning, the entire economy breaks down. Okay, and the, and there's no circular flow, and and people are just living off their at their 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 means, and and if they don't have uh, you know these uh, artificially uh, given endowments in every period, which we don't have, they have initial endowments, and then they have to everything has to come from the markets after that, uh, then they die, and so this this is what I this is a difference in setting from the typical behavioral economic study, is that this is an extremely dynamic non-stationary, open-ended world in which lots of things can go wrong. And what you're trying to, which I'm trying to do, which is in my, my whole study of markets uh, in electric power, what we're trying to do is not reach the optimum market design. What we're trying to do is find market designs that work well enough that they don't break down. That is, we get rid of the worst possible things that could happen by uh, altering the structure of the market and the market rules of operation. We try to design markets that keep going, that, that allow people to keep going and allow us to sequentially improve them. We don't look for the optimal optimum because we have a non-stationary world. Things are always changing. Uh, new ideas are coming in. This is actually true in, in power markets. It's absolutely exciting. Stuff is coming in at the distribution level, different kinds of designs for doing transactions at distribution level. You will see it coming soon to your local meter. But anyway, uh, you know, th this is just a different world from the typical study in psychology and behavioral economics. I'll quickly contribute one different perspective, which is that, um, uh, you know, there are, um, Every model's wrong, every single one of them, right? Yep. And, and if they weren't, they'd be too complicated to be of any use, even with these high power methods. 
So we're always facing a trade-off between the simplicity and the generality of the model and its complexity and quantitative relevance. And I think you've seen both ends, extreme ends of the spectrum, um, you know, with we can throw every state variable in the kitchen sink in and still compute it and blow everybody out of the water with our computational power. And, you know, let's strip it down and make it as simple as possible. Um, and I think we need both in economics and we need people working in the middle who take um, new ideas that are explored in generality and simplicity and bring them into quantitative models. It's not that one extreme is better than the other, but that ideas need to be generated on both ends and they need to meet in the middle somewhere. That's absolutely right. I'm not sure who's talking because I don't see the list. Uh... It's Laura Velton. Oh, oh, yes. Okay. I absolutely agree with that. I've gone back to slide 17. I am so tired of having the DSGE people uh, uh, talk down and dismiss ACE modeling. And I'm also tired of having agent-based modelers dismiss DSG and conceptual modeling. As slide 17 shows, we're all in this together at different levels. We need the arc. And I, I, I believe that's what the previous speaker was saying. We need the arc from concept to implementation and empirical validation will be different at each level. And the purpose at each level is different. And my only point here is that it does seem to me that we've jumped too quickly from the PRLs one to three that we do in academics. And a lot of these GSGE models are definitely in PRL one to three, in my opinion, because they don't have the processes modeled uh, with, with empirical fidelity. And you take a PRL one to three model and you jump to PRL nine, that's just not gonna work. And so what I'm arguing for is a more deliberate systematic approach in economics, where we slowly build up from one to nine and we recognize the validity and the importance of every step but we don't jump too quickly to coming to a policy decision or coming, you know, arguing for our policy design when we're only working at levels of PRL3. We cannot argue without gross exaggeration whether that the model is ready for policy design at PRL9. And, and so even ACE modeling, which is PRL4 to 6, is not good enough. You should see what people do in industry and power markets. Uh, they have huge prototype scalar models, large scale models, uh, where everything is, is meticulously implemented. Um, and and we're, we're even at in PRL 4 to 6 that we're doing it here at Iowa State, I mean, we recognize that we have to go through 7 and 8 uh, to have any chance of getting to 9. So we're just trying to provide a bridge. Some ideas, some conceptual ideas brought to PRL 6 that I can hand over to the industry people, the regulatory agencies, for further large-scale testing. But we're all important. There, it's all steps in a ladder, as far as I can see. OK. Thank you, Lee. Um, and I'd like to end on that note that we're all important. Uh, that's a nice <laughs> note to end on um, and, and close the session. Uh, so thank you everybody for contributing to this session, especially uh, Lee and Jesus. Uh, we'll return in 15 minutes after a brief, after a break um, uh, with the session on politics and society. Uh, thank you very much. Everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening, everybody. So, we're ready to start and I'm going to welcome everybody back to this session, uh, which is on politics and society. And it is our last session of the day, or um, as is known, of course, in the trade, the graveyard shift. So thank you for all of those that are still here. And uh, we will observe the same format as we have through the day. We have uh, two speakers uh, and uh, we have uh, a chance for questions at the end and of course popping questions in the chat uh, as a way for me to collect and put to them when they finish their presentation. We are going to start uh, with macroeconomic origins and consequences of political identity with Stephen Bosworth presenting. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Marina, and uh, uh, thanks to uh, both you and uh, and Alex for having me on this uh, this panel. I have to admit that uh, macroeconomics is not sort of my my normal area of work, but uh, but the work I'm about to present connects with macroeconomics in the sense that it describes the macroeconomic um, consequences of um, sort of changes in the income distribution on um, people's uh, political economy, that is a political economy at an individual level, and trying to use changes in, um, in overall economic conditions to predict 
changes in um, people's uh, preferences over economic policies. So this is a, a work of um, theoretical political economy. What we are um, trying to get at with this work is to try to get a number of very, um, what we think are in phenomena that we've seen. Tim, in... your microphone is not very good. Can you maybe uh, move away slightly? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, is it uh, is it better now? It is. Thank you so much. Yep. So we. Um, this is a work of uh, theoretical political economy, and what we wanted to do with this is to some phenomena which we think are um, some related and, and very consequential uh, shifts in uh, what happened in, uh, in industrialized, um, rich democracies, and that is that there's um, there's been a lot of income disparities across um, sort of multiple generations now in um, both. United Kingdom and United States, and we observed this along with a, a sort of more recent trend of, uh, of voters shifting their political identities, uh, moving away from uh, traditional political parties, gravitating uh, towards um, what you might consider more, uh, more populist, uh, more nationalistic stances than we would have observed in the um, in the past, and. Let me. Ah, uh, okay. I think I think that was uh, your comment about my mic. Um, right. So we um, we think that these are related. That um, that these uh, shifts in uh, in political economy are a consequence of the the shifts in uh, in macroeconomic outcomes. Uh, the um, the income distribution shifts that we observe. And our theory behind why these two are connected is that uh, we suppose that people form their political identity based on um, a sort of um, util utility maintenance model. So um, this is very much in the um, in the vein of identity economics, where identities are are formed or reinforced based on the um, the value you based on on uh, a particular measure of support having to do um, with sort of that um, that need to stack up relative to uh, to the value that you choose. Um, we propose uh, three particular, um, albeit um, sort of oversimplified uh, political identities, uh, which we classify in terms of more or less um, uh, Sorry, wait. Steve, I'm breaking up again. Is there any chance you can maybe um, switch to a different mic or, or move a bit back? It seemed a lot better when you would move back, but then it's a bit funny again. Sorry to interrupt. Okay, sorry, sorry about that. I'll I'll try and sit back a little bit. I, I don't have my uh, my headset in the in the room with me. Um, so we uh, we classify these in terms of how much this is based on materialistic outcomes. So we can um, say that an identity which is very individualistic uh, places a high weight on one's material to do uh, benchmark, which is the uh, rest of the population. Whereas um, on the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, people who do not place that much emphasis on um, materialistic concerns, but rather um, supplant the uh, the individual performance with uh, with something that is more common. So um, that in our model uh, comprises the national identity. And we assume that people select into these identities on, uh, on the basis of uh, how well that suits them. So people who stack up relatively well in terms of material success will enjoy a relatively high life satisfaction if they uh, develop values or emphasize their, uh, their material success. Whereas if you do not stack up that well in, uh, in uh, material terms to the rest of the uh, reference group population, then uh, you will not be very happy if you don't have a very uh, materialistic outlook on life. Whereas you might be happy if you place uh, more emphasis on, um, on uh, communitarian concerns. So uh, sort of place a higher emphasis on 
uh, on the group outcomes, the group achievements in your um, and um, we, uh, in endogenizing the identity formation, we can show how changes in that reference group that is based on movements in the incomes of people who you're comparing yourself to uh, can change the, the calculation of which of these sort of values you gravitate towards. When the, um, when the reference group gets further and further away from you, uh, if you are sort of in the middle, then your uh, sort of decision to place more weight on materialism versus um, versus communitarianism or, or nationalism is going to uh, weigh more towards um, more towards nationalism, and that's going to change your preferences in terms of what you vote for as well. So uh, if you become more uh, more nationalist, as you, you care some, uh, about the material um, outcome of yourself relative to other people, and you um, care more about um, sort of what a policy does to, uh, to boost the, um, the national uh, well-being uh, versus, say, other nations, then you might uh, become more favorable at voting for things like uh, trade protection or immigration um, uh, restrictions. Let me see if I can go to the next slide. Yeah, so uh, this is a, a graph from uh, a very nice paper by, uh, by Robert Akeloff, uh, who is um, someone who uh, has very heavily inspired the model that we're proposing. And uh, his framework is very elegant. It's, uh, it's that people can choose which things they think are, uh, are worthy of um, sort of measuring themselves against. Uh, that is, um, how do people um, determine what is going to uh, form their self-esteem? He thinks about this along uh, along two dimensions of um, sort of what you could get at in high school as, a, as a nice example. Uh, so you can have different abilities in terms of um, the scholastic ability, so that would be the uh, the horizontal axis, and uh, you could have, uh, on the other hand, different uh, heterogeneous abilities in terms of, uh, say, how well you are at uh, at playing the guitar. Now, depending on um, the mix of the population that you find yourself in, as as well as well as your relative place within this population, that is your relative strengths of sort of scholastic versus versus musical ability. You might uh, gravitate towards becoming a, um, a musician if uh, there's a lot of people who are um, sort of uh, considering themselves, measuring themselves along the, the scholastic axis, and you want to sort of differentiate yourself from them. Uh, whereas if you um, if there's a sort of more mixed uh, population, then you uh, sort of are close enough to this other group. You're, you're going to want to uh, adopt their values and and measure yourself against the values of uh, the group which you, you're trying to interact with, but um, you might not stack up so, uh, so well against. And the, um, the, the, the key idea here is that, um, that heterogeneous uh, ability to satisfy a particular value, um, uh, to satisfy a particular um, value criterion is going to determine um, which values you decide to adopt. So I'm going to um, sorry, stop my video uh, real quick just to see if that improves the, uh, improves the audio. So, um, voters who uh, find themselves um, hit hardest by um, austerity measures uh, in the early 2010s. Um, those uh, areas people are most likely to, um, to gravitate towards UKIP in these 2014 uh, parliamentary elections, and they're also more likely to vote uh, to leave in the uh, press referendum. Um, there's also some work linking um, the performance of local economies also to the national economy and uh, voters in those regions uh, preferring uh, the leave outcome of Brexit. Uh, there's also work uh, contrasting uh, sort of uh, populations across um, the Western world. So, uh, so Han studies a number of, of European democracies and finds that um, the uh, increase in 
support for right-wing parties is um, a consequence of increasing um, uh, economic inequality, but there's uh, heterogeneous effects uh, across the population. So those that support the, the bottom of the income spectrum are uh, more likely to support uh, right-wing parties as uh, economic inequality goes up. Actually, those at the high end of the economic spectrum are less likely to support uh, right-wing populist parties as uh, economic inequality goes up. So it's, uh, it's a story about changing portions. Um, it's a story about changing portions uh, in relative terms. So those who are in the winners from uh, economic trends um, tend to sort of think things are good that um, that measuring themselves being uh, having a materialistic or, or liberal outlook uh, tends to suit them whereas those who are the um, the relative losers from recent economic trends um, are those who are most likely to uh, to gravitate towards alternative uh, political ideologies or um, become more more nationalist more favoring of uh, of right populist parties Uh, here's a, a probably what would be a, a very familiar graph. It shows uh, regions of the United Kingdom uh, according to the strength of their Remain versus Leave Brexit vote. Uh, as you can see, there's a, a, a very large uh, sort of concentration of, uh, of people who are supporting Remain uh, around London and uh, other areas in the southeast, uh, such as uh, where we are right now in Reading. Um, which tend to be uh, sort of the areas which have experienced most of the gains from uh, recent economic growth in the United Kingdom, whereas uh, those areas that uh, tend to lag behind uh, have been the the most supportive of um, of the uh, the Leave vote. We'll notice, of course, that uh, that Scotland, uh, for reasons which are um, sort of very different from uh, from reasons that uh, uh, Remain has been supported in England, uh, have uh, very high levels of um, of support for Remain rather than Leave. Because the uh, the nationalist and the um, and the sort of cosmopolitan uh, policy cause uh, for Scottish people, because they're sort of considering themselves against uh, against the English, uh, tend to align in the right direction, and so that's why we don't see this uh, this pattern within uh, uh, Scotland. So let's uh, talk about um, the model a little bit more specifically. We consider agents to have two sources of self-esteem. Uh, that is, they can uh, have a, an individualistic source of, uh, of esteem, uh, which is their ability to consume, and in particular, their ability to consume relative to, uh, to other people in their reference group. Uh, and as well, they can, uh, they can feel uh, an amount of national pride, which they uh, can attach a greater weight to. Uh, and they can sort of mix the, um, the proportions of each of these two sources of self-esteem uh, in a way that forms what we call an identity. So uh, the identities that we uh, consider available to, uh, to all the agents are um, sort of in a very simplified sense, um, one which places all the weight on um, the uh, individualistic or materialistic components. Um, so we call these individualists. Uh, one which places all of the weight on the uh, the national components. Uh, so these people derive all of their self-esteem from how well the, the nation is doing rather than the individual. We call these uh, communitarians. And we uh, consider sort of a, a mix between these two sources of self-esteem, which we call uh, multi-affiliates. That is, they are uh, in one sense um, sort of out for themselves. Um, they derive esteem from their own performance relative to other people, but they uh, nevertheless have some weight that they place on how well uh, the nation as a whole is, uh, is doing. We assume that um, based on people's heterogeneous abilities, they're going to choose one of these three identities to, um, uh, to sort of uh, affiliate with. And the choice of uh, each of these three identities is going to maximize the individual's uh, uh, utility, uh, where utility is determined by, uh, by how much um, they sort of stack up relative to the, 
goals that they set for themselves, uh, given that uh, given that identity. Um, because this depends on um, your individual income, and especially um, because the uh, the income uh, determines how you stack up on this individualistic uh, component, those at the high end of the income spectrum are going to gravitate towards um, a uh, an individualistic or, or more individualistic outlook. Those at the low end of the income spectrum are going to gravitate towards a more communitarian outlook and those in the middle gravitate towards uh, a mix between the two. And because um, it depends on your income, there's uh, going to be uh, cutoff incomes, which are characterized by higher utility um, at an income which is uh, less than that uh, for a more uh, communitarian identity and higher utility on the other side of that cutoff um, income, which is associated with being a little bit more materialistic, a little bit more uh, individualistic. And because we can characterize these cutoff points based on uh, aspects of the income distribution, we can show how those cutoff points change when we change uh, certain moments of the, the income distribution. We then think about a, uh, a policy which arrives on the agenda, and that policy is either going to be voted up or down, uh, much like, say, uh, Brexit sort of just shows up on the agenda. Um, that policy has a mix of um, consequences for individual income, as well as consequences for, uh, for national pride. And uh, we ask then who supports this policy. We say that um, if those uh, people who have some concern for, um, for relative status, but are currently not measuring up terribly well, uh, will gravitate towards policies that compress income uh, because it reduces their status anxiety. Uh, so it brings sort of the, the liberal elite uh, in, in London back down uh, a little bit towards, uh, towards us uh, who are sort of out in the provinces. And um, the uh, people who have less concern about their relative status, so those who are um, not really interested in the income compression aspect of this at all, uh, might also support it if the, if the policy mix involves also an increase in, uh, in national pride. And so a policy which combines these two aspects, that is an income compression component, as well as a, a boost in national pride, are going to uh, look particularly attractive. And they're going to look increasingly attractive um, the more uh, income disparities widen. So uh, as income disparities widen, the share of the population which supports uh, such a policy package, which might entail a, a combination of an increase in uh, national pride as well as an income compression is, uh, is going to go up. So our main findings uh, from this model are that um, skill bias growth, that is growth which uh, increases the, um, the incomes, the consumption of those who are concentrated at the, the top of the distribution, even if it leaves the incomes of uh, those further down in the distribution the same, uh, will first lead to a, uh, a polarization of uh, political identity. So it will uh, increase both the share of people who are uh, more materialistic, and it will increase the share of people who are um, more nationalistic, and it will sort of hollow out the group of people who uh, who pursue both uh, as uh, desirable objectives to measure their self worth. So um, the population becomes more and more in disagreement about what is desirable uh, for society. The other proposition we uh, we find and uh, and prove is that. Um, social fragmentation, the process uh, that arises from this, this uh, polarization of income, uh, generating polarization of political identity, increases support for what we call closed policies, where uh, closed policies are those that, uh, that both compress income and uh, raise the, uh, the return from uh, nationalism. We characterize the population as um, uh, sort of uh, so the ability uh, in the, um, 
knowledge for each agent is distributed continuously along a unit in interval and, uh, and uniformly. We're not saying that income itself is distributed uniformly, but rather that uh, we want to think about this as the, um, the percentile of, uh, of the income distribution that you, uh, that you find yourself in. This generates what we'll call a, um, an income. Uh, which is equal to uh, a proportion of the um, of the ability rank that you uh, that you find yourself on um, times a productivity parameter called uh, beta. We'll assume that uh, those at the bottom of the income distribution have a relatively lower return uh, from income generation, and those at the higher end of the distribution have a higher return from income generation. It doesn't actually matter from the uh, from the perspective of uh, the starting point that uh, beta u and beta s are different, but uh, what's going to matter here is that if uh, the return to income grows more for those at the upper end of the spectrum relative to uh, those at the lower end of the spectrum, then that is going to generate a, a difference in um, in identity formation. And uh, this is going to enter the uh, utility function linearly. So even though um, obviously income is not distributed uh, uniformly, um, the uh, utility of income probably is distributed a little bit more uniformly due to uh, decreasing marginal utility. Um, and so the utility of a materialistic person, uh, we say, is uh, equal to um, a status comparison utility US uh, plus a pure consumption utility equal to, uh, to xi. So us is parameterized by uh, a function which measures your pride relative to uh, people who are, you are consuming more than. So um, if uh, uxi is uh, higher than the consumption of the comparison person xj, uh, you receive an amount of pride proportional to the difference. And on the other side, if you're comparing yourself with someone who uh, has um, greater income than you, that is xj greater than xi, then you experience a utility loss equal to uh, nv or epsilon, uh, proportional, of course, to the difference in, um, in relative incomes. Since you are going to compare yourself with lots of different people in society um, as, you, uh, as you mix with them, we consider a, a very simplified mixing uh, function that is uh, perfect mixing. That is, you're equally likely to meet anyone else in society. And so on average, your expected utility from, uh, from social comparison depends on uh, where you are in the income distribution, uh, the probability that you're going to meet someone who is um, of uh, lower income than yourself, probability that you're going to meet someone who is of higher income than yourself, uh, times the expected um, income comparison for each of these groups, uh, which which is easy if the um, if the distribution is uniform. We make the further assumption that uh, envy uh, weighs greater than uh, than pride. This is uh, this is going to be necessary to generate our results, but uh, there's quite a lot of evidence in psychology um, that uh, sort of comparisons uh, that are disfavorable are much worse than equivalent comparisons that are favorable are, are good. Uh, so people are loss averse with respect to status. Um, the net envy and pride uh, gives you a utility which you can find by integrating over the, uh, the distribution of income. Um, I won't sort of go through all the calculations there because I think that's not terribly useful. Um, in contrast, uh, if you adopt the um, purely nationalistic, purely communitarian identity, uh, then we assume uh, for purposes of simplicity that that is a, um, an exogenous uh, amount alpha. Uh, so these people also uh, sort of like to have pure consumption utility in their utility function, but they don't uh, compare themselves with others. There's no uh, there's no relative status utility if you adopt um, if you adopt a nationalistic identity. And if you have a an identity which mixes each of these sources of esteem, uh, we assume that the the proportion of that is equal to uh, to phi and one minus phi respectively for the um, the nationalistic and the uh, the materialistic sources of utility. And we also suppose that, uh, that these things are imperfect substitutes, um, which is uh, why we have this uh, parameter sigma, uh, which means that if you 
uh, manage to sort of maintain both sources of utility, it's relatively better than um, sort of having one or, uh, or the other. Each individual along this uh, along this spectrum is uh, assumed to uh, choose a uh, a utility to maximize. Uh, sorry, a um, an identity to maximize their individual utility. So, depending on how that utility function uh, depends on your uh, place in the income distribution AI, you are going to have um, either a higher utility of uh, adopting the communitarian, the uh, mixed, or the purely individualistic. Um, identities and that uh, this utility is uh, um, is monotonic this choice is monotonic in in where you are in the uh, the income distribution we can show that um, the following cutoffs uh, depending on the parameters uh, show uh, which parts of the distribution adopt the um, individualistic multi-affiliated and communitarian identities respectively and these cutoffs depend on uh, both how uh, much status comparison weighs on uh, on your utility function, how badly uh, sort of envy is worse than uh, than pride from social comparison, as well as um, how much you lose by um, by forgoing this this nationalistic identity. So um, the uh, quantity uh, a hat c is the income quantile, um, the income percentile uh, at which you are indifferent between adopting the communitarian and the multi-affiliated identity. Uh, this is less than the um, quantity alpha hat i, which is the uh, income percentile at which you're indifferent between adopting the multi-affiliated and individualistic uh, identity. So the interesting case here is that where um, the uh, shift in income happens for those who are straddling the boundaries uh, between these um, uh, these two extremes. So um, I think it's best uh, best represented in the following graph. So if you have um, AS, which we're going to call the the cutoff at which uh, a shift in income, a relative shift in income happens for those at the top relative to the bottom. And that happens for someone who uh, is uh, adopting both a nationalistic and an individualistic identity. That's going to shift the, the boundaries of, uh, of these identity, um, identity groups. Uh, so those at the bottom, uh, again, are uh, those who derive a higher utility from um, uh, communitarianism. Those in the middle are those who uh, would rather sort of have this mix of sources of utility that is a little bit individualistic, a little bit um, uh, nationalistic. Um, and those at the top are, are going to choose to place the, the bulk of their, their self-esteem in terms of their individual performance. Um, so now what we consider is a shift in the income distribution uh, which happens at uh, this cutoff uh, point AS. So let's um, go back a little bit. This dotted line uh, AS, we're going to assume that everyone to the, um, to the right of AS is going to experience a relative shift in income, whereas everyone to the left of AS is uh, going to have their income stay, uh, stay constant. And so what that means is it's a, uh, a change in the, um, the return to income generation for uh, those at the top, holding fixed the return to income generation for those at the bottom. We can show in a comparative static exercise what that does to the, uh, the cutoffs of, uh, of each of the identities. And in particular, it, um, it makes the um, sort of share of the population who gravitate towards each of the extremes greater. Uh, the reason being that um, those who lie on the um, on the left side of AS, um, who ordinarily would have um, sort of had both sources of utility, many of those people now face um, an uh, identity threat uh, because they are falling further behind in the uh, status comparison race. Those who are on the right side of AS are actually sort of uh, racing ahead in the um, uh, income uh, comparison uh, game. And so they are more likely to place greater weight on that. 
And so what that does is it, uh, it shrinks the, um, the proportion of the population which attaches weight to, to both of these outcomes. And we, uh, we say this as, uh, or we uh, think about this as society becoming more polarized in terms of values. Ah, that's a good question. Why is it possible to assume that people can choose their identity in a society given that they are part of a society that likely influences their preferences? Um, so what I would say to this is that the model um, is very much one which is informed by, um, by economics. That is, it's a utility maximization exercise. I don't actually believe that people um, consciously maximize utility, especially in the, in the domain of, um, of identity uh, adoption. What I do think uh, this is a good sort of metaphor for is, um, is sort of a, a learning process. So if you um, are constantly sort of emphasizing materialistic um, gains or, um, or ways of uh, assessing yourself, and you are sort of constantly experiencing this uh, this cognitive dissonance because you're you sort of don't stack up relative to uh, to the metric that you set for yourself then um, sort of the psychological phenomenon of minimizing cognitive dissonance says that um, uh, over time you're probably going to engage in this exercise less and less uh, likewise if you are someone who um, stacks up relatively well in the materialistic metric and that sort of brings you um, brings you satisfaction. Then uh, reinforcement will say that you'll tend to do that uh, increasingly more. And so, um, so I would say that the identity formation process is um, it's not it's not conscious. But if you if you think about how identities would gravitate over time uh, in, a, in a learning process, it would look a lot like uh, what you would get um, sort of after a long time. Uh, for a, um, a utility maximization exercise. So, so the utility maximization, I think, is, um, is sort of a nice shorthand for these more um, sort of reinforcing psychological processes. Now, an even sort of nicer point, I think, which, which I can't necessarily speak to, is, uh, is this idea that um, the values that pervade in society are going to influence uh, the values that everyone else has, right? So the people at the top, you know, they're on TV all the time, um, emphasizing their, um, you know, their relative wealth. And so uh, if people at the bottom are, you know, watching these TV programs and, you know, and seeing lifestyles of the rich and famous, uh, they might sort of, you know, have a hard time uh, disengaging from uh, that as a, as a value that they measure themselves against. Uh, so I think that that is, that is a potential cautionary um, or sort of mediating, um, no, not mediating, mod that I think is a moderating factor against this, this identity change. Uh, but, but I think it depends on, um, on who, um, who has the uh, greater power of social influence. So I would, I would assume actually that those at the top have, have a greater ability to influence the the values of society than those at the bottom. Um, and yeah, I think this is um, this is definitely um, within the the framework of methodological individualism. Um, but I think where it moves away from methodological individualism is it doesn't assume that uh, that people's preferences are fixed. Right, so it does allow for social influences on um, on individuals' values and preferences, um, even if it sort of um, uses the mechanics of, of utility maximization. So our um, our sort of last point is about the um, uh, the political economy of these identity shifts. So we assume that a, a policy arrives on the um, on the agenda, which is uh, sort of bad for income. Uh, so say uh, Brexit is probably going to hurt um, everyone in the UK, uh, regardless of where they sit in the income distribution. Um, but it's uh, it's going to compress that income distribution because it's uh, probably going to lead to um, sort of proportional changes in um, in income depending on sort of how much income you have. Uh, so we, we think about this as a, a proportional income compression equal to one minus tau 
of the uh, of the income you had uh, prior to the policy arriving. And we also assume that the policy uh, increases the return from national identity. And that's this um, D alpha D tau uh, term, which is uh, assumed to be positive. And so uh, if we ask who is voting for this policy, uh, people could vote for this policy for two reasons. One, they could uh, vote for um, the policy because uh, it compresses income and they um, are uh, feeling like uh, income compression would help uh, their relative status concerns. And so that is a concern for those in the middle. And uh, those who are purely interested in uh, increasing the return from national identity, uh, so those at the bottom will vote for this policy because it, um, it raises the return from national identity so long as the hit to income uh, isn't, too, uh, isn't too big. Uh, we derive an indifferent or, or marginal voter by, um, uh, by thinking about um, the total utility of uh, adopting the policy versus not adopting the policy. And we can characterize that voter according to um, one, uh, how much the policy compresses income, as well as uh, what the return to national identity uh, has uh, done. Uh, since this uh, sort of marginal voter is, um, is one where everyone to the, um, to the left of them in the income distribution would, uh, would prefer, strictly prefer the policy to be adopted, and everyone to the right of them in the income distribution would strictly prefer the policy not to be adopted, then uh, depending on where that marginal voter lies, the policy is going to be more likely to be adopted if uh, the marginal voter happens to be closer to the median. So once that marginal voter uh, passes, uh, passes the median, we would assume that the policy is going to be implemented. Whereas if that marginal voter falls uh, below the median, then we would assume the policy uh, is, is not going to be implemented. And likewise, we can think about what happens, thanks, what happens to that marginal voter in the, what happens to their location in the income distribution when in economic inequality goes up. Uh, and we can show that uh, when economic inequality goes up, there's more people who are concerned about um, the income compression uh, aspect of the, the policy and the marginal voter moves uh, sort of further to the right uh, as inequality goes up. Uh, and so there are two reasons why these sort of policies become particularly attractive as economic inequality goes up. One is that there's a whole bunch of people who are now sort of more interested in, uh, in net return to national identity than they are in um, uh, economic terms. And so the policy is attractive to, the, um, to these uh, people on that count. And there's an increasing constituency of people who feel um, an identity threat from not measuring up in terms of income and might be attracted to the income comp compression aspect of the, uh, of the policy. Right, and so um, what we wanna do with this framework is uh, we want to first uh, dig a little bit more into the identity channel um, so work that is, uh, that is currently ongoing is um, I'm looking at uh, life satisfaction at um, uh, people in the United Kingdom, uh, whether or not they change their uh, political identity over time and, uh, and whether or not that alleviates um, the uh, status anxiety they experience from uh, losses in relative income. Uh, I think also the, um, the, model could accommodate al alternative political co coalitions. So um, there's sort of a, a, at a different uh, point in time, we could have talked about uh, say the, um, the coalition that elected George W. Bush president in, in 2004, which was very much sort of both about increasing returns to national identity, but not compressing income that is sort of exacerbating the, uh, the income spread. Um, and of course, this uh, sort of assumes a very, um, a very homogeneous um, population that is able to gra grab onto um, a, a national identity, whereas um, sort of those who are excluded from a national identity might not sort of be um, drawn into this, uh, this identity change process uh, if they are sort of on the outside. So this is, uh, this is I have to admit, much more a, a model of the 
uh, of the white working class than it is of, of ethnic minorities, for example, either in the United States or the United Kingdom. And, and I think it's worth uh, thinking more about um, what happens to, um, to the political economy of, of ethnic minorities. Um, so that I will conclude. And um, I guess hopefully we have a little bit of time left for discussion. Thank you, Stephen. Yes, there are a few questions still in the chat. I don't know if you want me to read them out or if you want to look at them yourself. Um, yeah, so there was, there was this question about um, the assumption that Brexit hurts, uh, hurts everyone. Um, so this is something that we um, in the model just, just sort of assumed that, that the policy uh, tends to hurt everyone. Uh, if there are people who benefit from the policy, I think it, it depends on sort of where those people lie in the income distribution. Um, I certainly think that, uh, that there are people um, sort of at the top of the income distribution who do benefit from Brexit, right? So um, the, uh, the hedge funders in the city. But um, to be honest, I don't think from the perspective of trying to form a political economy model, there are enough of those people um, at the very, very top of the income distribution to change um, something like uh, something like a vote. I don't think sort of the, um, you know, the top 1% of the 1% is, uh, is going to be determining um, things like, uh, like referenda outcomes. But I do, I do think this is a sort of, um, this is a continuing sort of uh, question mark. One, because we don't actually still, we still don't know what the Brexit deal looks like, right? So, um, we don't know exactly how bad it's going to be and, and who it's it's going to be bad for. Um, but I, I think it's plausible that it's going to be bad for a lot of people. Okay, there's one more question. If you could take that, Steve, and then I'm going to uh, stop you to hand over. Yeah, yes, yeah. so th this is another good point. Um, so there is research that, uh, that shows that people are not quite as aware of their relative position in society as would be completely accurate. What I would say about this is that um, even though people do not accurately perceive their rank in the distribution or sort of the incomes of people who are higher than them, the, um, the perceived rank is monotonic in the actual rank in, uh, in the research that has been done on this. And so I think people do have a sense of whether or not they are uh, more further behind or, or further ahead. And I think people also have a sense of how this thing is changing, right? So. Um, okay. Um, before we launch into a fully fledged discussion about what brought about the Brexit referendum, uh, maybe we could leave that for the end, if that's okay. And, uh, and uh, thank you, Steve. And if you could stop sharing your screen, please. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll just, yeah, hand over to Angus Armstrong talking about social macroeconomics. So thank you very much. Thanks. Can you see my screen okay? Yeah, everything good? Terrific, thank you. Um, thank you very much indeed for um, staying so late in the day. Uh, my presentation is going to be a little bit different. Um, I'm the director of Rebuilding Macroeconomics, um, along with Alex, uh, one of the two organizers of the conference. And my job at Rebuilding Macroeconomics is really to run the thing and to sort of look at um, research projects that we should support. And so as we're coming towards um, the in, entering the last year of the project, we are starting to draw what are the common threads that come out of those projects. And what I would like to do today is uh, raise some of the, um, one of those threads in particular to follow on from uh, Stephen's work um, that he's just presented. So to, we're supported by the ESRC um, and um, our host institution is the National Institute. So I just say that at the beginning. And this is the management group. And the reason why I put this up um, is um, for uh, one very good reason, which is you can see that we're actually, the economists are actually outnumbered. So uh, there was a very real effort here to get it into disciplinary work. So the idea was that we would support research that 
tries to complement existing macroeconomic research by being different. There's no point us spending money to be one inch away from what goes on in university departments. So we thought the most productive thing we could do would be to follow uh, research which um, uh, could offer interdisciplinary insights or bring new methods into macroeconomics to bear on policy relevant questions. So everybody had to address a policy relevant question uh, if they were to get funding. And it's very to say interdisciplinary research, um, but it's very hard to do in practice because people have very different understandings, just even of the language, but foundational issues like uh, methodological individualism become rather totemic issues which can't be crossed. So we had um, uh, three non-economists and two economists on the uh, management board. And as I say, what I would like to do today is just look at uh, one of the issues, which is a common theme in a number of the projects. In the end, we sponsored about uh, 37 projects and two research groups, which is a lot more than we expected to do um, for various negotiating reasons. Um, what are the key threads coming through? I would say there are four. One, that they're about um, uh, social preferences and some of the identity uh, issues that Stephen's just been talking about, but perhaps from a slightly uh, broader take. So a number of the projects have uh, 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 either indirectly or directly raised this issue of social preferences. And we're pretty open-minded about what this really means. I don't think it's a closed book at all. It's not a finished article yet. The idea was to raise new areas um, uh, of thinking. The second is about interaction. So there's one thing I would say that um, really brings together all of the projects is that in standard macroeconomic models, people basically interact through market prices, through the Ravrasian auctioneer. So it's market prices, it's how they usually interact. In most of the research projects that we funded, they interact directly. So this lends itself very much to uh, the sort of modeling that Lee was talking about uh, a couple of hours ago, agent-based models, where we allow them to interact and form clusters Perhaps you have um, um, uh, 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 instabilities and new equilibriums uh, that form uh, multiple equilibrium models uh, through running these simulations. So identity, interaction, instability. So we do not take the view that this get, thing gets tied down to some sort of long run production function. And, um, uh, the shock eventually dissipates. We all go back to equilibrium. No, uh, with these sort of models, we can wander off and not actually reach an equilibrium. It can look more like a chaotic model than an equilibrium model. And the final element of the four is radical uncertainty. So rather than think about shocks uh, in the uh, nature of the uh, Christopher Sims paper, of course, uh, as these exogenous things, which actually help us uh, run these simulations and, and work out the um, value of the uh, macroeconomic interventions, in these approaches, uncertainty becomes endogenous. So it's a feature within the models because people have got local knowledge and it's, uh, it's, the economy is structured. So you're not always aware of what is happening elsewhere in the economy. And so that's how radical uncertainty comes into it rather than just being a shock where you happen to know the distribution, which of course really stops it being, from being um, what you, anything like uh, radically uncertain. So they're the four components, which I think have come through in, um, in the 37 projects that we've written. And the one I want to um, bring up today is to complement what Stephen's been talking about, is about social preferences uh, or identity in, in another way of putting it. Oops. So let me start by uh, this. This is a Rorschach test, which uh, is better known as an inkblot test. And the idea is that people see into this whatever they would like to see. And this was a very nice metaphor used in a, a recent presentation by Ken Rogoff um, for the um, new approaches to economic challenges at the OECD, um, uh, who do excellent work. So um, Ken Rogoff said that the COVID crisis has allowed just about every genre of economists to say, you see, this proves exactly my case and what I've always been trying to say, um, because we're all looking 
to it uh, what we'd like to. And of course, we're no different. And so we think that uh, the, some of the implications of this very much get at uh, um, this, this core issue of social preferences. And rather than it being you know, necessarily the most important thing to get from this is demand or supply, which shock is bigger or, uh, than the other. For us, perhaps one of the most interesting events was on the 24th of March, where the R number, the infection rate was the highest. Only 420 people uh, had died the previous day. I say um, 420 people had died the previous day, but R was very high, so this thing was highly contagious. And the NHS put out a call to arms, so to speak, and said they wanted 250 volunteers to come out and help the NHS. As I'm sure you all know, within two days, they got 750 volunteers uh, to put themselves forward to come and work for the NHS. Uh, can work to can volunteer and put themselves in harm's way. And it struck us that this is kind of an interesting challenge to the notion of us being self-interested. You know, how big a bit of evidence are you going to need before we start getting convinced that this was perhaps not all virtue signaling? So that was the, um, uh, uh, an important event for us. And the idea of social interaction, we sort of think it's a little bit like, you know, people say fish can't see water because it's all around them. Well, human beings, from the moment they wake up, they can't stop interacting, whether it's through, you know, the news, social media, anything they do is almost social interaction with other people. It's exactly what we do. And anthropologists think, think that we interact in greater breadth so a wider number of things, whether it's mediums, of ex whether it's exchange or whether it's telling tales or whether it's care or whether it's affiliation or love or any of these other elements of sharing in greater breadth and greater depth than any other species. So it strikes us that leaving this out is um, perhaps something which we, we need to reconsider. And the sort of conclusion of doing this is that all economies are situated within societies. And that's very important, again, for thinking about, as, as Stephen's just been talking about, how people see each other and uh, uh, in terms of the old, overall um, position uh, and progression of the social system. So that's where I want to go. Um, in terms of where, where is the departure, if we start off with the rational choice model, I think there's a slightly different variation from what Stephen's just presented. Um, the, uh, the idea is that the rational choice model, um, as long as it is stable over the period of interest or the event that might move our preferences or not the event that we're studying, then this has been an extraordinarily powerful tool and, and of course remains very much a, a, the cornerstone really of modern economics. Uh, when Lionel Robbins said it was about scarce resources and given ends. The given ends, of course, were the preferences. They're just given. Um, and this had a very famous debate back in the um, 1970s with um, Stigler and Gary Becker against the Marchesen and Albert Hirschman uh, about whether preferences really could be considered to be exogenous. And the winning vote on that day really came down to yes, they could be, because the deciding factor was model parsimony. And that this is a very attractive property, which of course it remains so today. But what we've seen from a number of the presentations and the sort of data we're working with and new technologies, it's not necessarily obvious that that has to be the limiting factor to lead us to only pursue that type of model. But the big question is what then opens up if we start allowing variation from that? Now, the first thing, I put in four potential challenges here. The first one is we tend to associate um, our desire expressed through the um, utility function, through our preferences, where we have minimal requirements, just uh, completeness and transitivity to give us what, whatever we call rationality or, or rational uh, preferences, which doesn't actually really mean anything about rational in the common usage of the language. But then we say that this is a primitive, 
And by that, we tend to say it's biologically driven, that we want to have more. And then when you push people, they sometimes say, well, it's because we desire more food or more sex or something which has got something very basic as a human desire. But then you start saying, well, what do I actually really consume, you know, quite often? Well, I might have bought myself, um, uh, you know, a Hermes tie. Well, why did I buy a Hermes tie? It's hardly uh, a biological need. And the answer is, it's probably something to do with the status of a Hermes tie. And that, so we get back to asking, well, what was the status about? And so in many of our preferences, they're really reduced form preferences. They're not actually primitive at all. And so when we start getting to the question of identification, it becomes interesting once again, reflecting um, on, on the Chris Sims paper. So the first question is what is really primitive is often uh, overlooked. The second is we have kind of an abundance of data now and evidence from laboratory experiments and empirical data that the idea of self-interest or even mutuality is not the extent of uh, human motivations for our actions. So we know from uh, a lot of the work um, done in labs on games such as like the ultimatum game, uh, but even where people are willing to walk away from returns where there is no reputational gain because nobody's watching them, they still are prepared to do these acts. And the amount of evidence here, it starts becoming a point of, well, when do we actually have to start taking this seriously um, uh, uh, as, as empirical scientists? And the third, of course, uh, many of our uh, uh, um, interactions are strategic. So this gets into the area of game theory. And we know from uh, game theory, when we have strategic interactions, that many equilibria are possible, particularly in repeated games. We have a slew of potential Nash equilibrium, depending on how we want to play this. Um, do we want to cooperate and then default at some later stage? But the question is, how do we pick which equilibrium? Uh, who is the choreographer that gets us to do this? How do we get our beliefs to move to one equilibrium and not another equilibrium? And that's the bit that tends to get unanswered, where um, people like Ken Binmore have suggested we really haven't made much progress on the fundamental question of where did these beliefs come from in the first place that shift us from one equilibrium to another. And the fourth um, uh, challenge comes from um, evolutionary um, economics. And here um, uh, I uh, bring in um, Tinbergen, but not the Tinbergen that we're used to thinking, uh, who did have a lot to say about identification, of course, but his brother, uh, who was an evolution biologist, um, who also got the Nobel Prize. And he said that all um, biological organisms have to be able to explain their behaviors through evolutionary, how they've developed evolutionary, and also uh, how they got to be given in their, in, their, um, in their current form. And as most of, you know, we all know that we tend to get taught a lot of our behaviors uh, within our families and kin. So we think that there are a number of challenges to the rational choice model. And here I have a quote from um, Charles Darwin himself in The Descent of Man. Uh, and he says, after the power of language has been acquired, so after language, the wish of the community could be expressed, the common opinion, how each member ought to act for the public good, would naturally become a paramount degree, the guide to action. And then he talks about uh, uh, pro probation and disapprobation of our fellows depends on our sympathy, which forms a central part of our social instinct and is indeed the foundation stone. So from an evolutionary point of view or from other sciences point of view, whether this is anthropological, evolutionary or even sociological, the idea that everything is motivated self-interest uh, uh, seems something of um, something unlikely. So um, how do we get from there to where we want to go? Well, the, the idea is that uh, we have all societies are structured. We don't just have individuals or individuals and a, 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 a national economy. We have social structures. And human beings get meaning through their life, through identity, which we, we, we create with respect to others. Um, we, uh, the identity exists in 
uh, our social networks that we're either born into or become part of. And the identity is performative in, this, in the sense that it isn't something we can just take or leave. We have to actually perform. We have to be uh, part of uh, that group or, 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 or club. Um, these groups have beliefs. Um, uh, by beliefs, um, understandings of how the world works. They have norms, which means uh, rules of behavior and narratives, which are causal uh, arguments for why things are the way they are. Now, these are quite often distinct. And together, the beliefs, norms, and narratives forms a culture. And this culture uniquely allows us to pass the intergenerational transmission of knowledge, which is, of course, why human beings have been able to build on things uh, over time. The group culture uh, in some ways sets what we could call socially programmable constraints for our rational choice. So that gets into quite a scary area when we start talking about socially programmable. Um, so one argument is that, you know, in the uh, so, um, image of Becker, we can just put other people's utility into our utility function and therefore show that we care. Uh, now, uh, as a great fan of the ingenuity of Gary Becker and, and uh, his um, uh, alacrity of which you could use these models, this is not really altruism, it's more mutualism, it's saying, saying that I benefit from your benefit, which is not really the same as altruism, where I don't benefit, but you do benefit, that's something different. It's also something different to spite, which means I want you to be punished, even though it's going to hurt myself. Um, so these altruism and spite are quite often uh, rules of conduct within groups. Um, uh, their way of enforcing are becoming performative within these groups' rules. They allow cooperation within these groups. And the point of the cooperation is they allow us to overcome incomplete contracts and to be successful at these groups. An important question, um, which I was looking at uh, with regard to Stephen's presentation, is whether these network effects, whether these, um, uh, uh, as we look, our preferences become influenced by others, and as we respond by um, codes of behavior, whether the network effects are increasing returns to scale. In other words, there's feedback effects. And once we allow feedback effects, then we start violating the idea of methodological individualism. So while that's always been sacrosanct in economics, that we can reduce everything at the macro level down to the micro, once we allow these feedback effects, then it's not so obvious that that can take place. And one of the reasons is because you get so-called emergent properties once you aggregate up, which can't be fully explained from the micro. Um, this is another reason why agent-based models get used for these sort of um, programs. The unit of analysis, um, we get a very interesting tension between uh, within, within the group, which becomes the unit of analysis, either groups or regions, the so-called meso level, so we don't just go from individuals to the aggregate. When, when we um, uh, think about a, a group, while we can cooperate within a group, there is, of course, incentive for individual members to free ride. And so that dual tension is always there. In other words, I know, you know, as much as I want to win my game of golf in my golf club, then uh, I also have to behave myself and, and, you know, don't jangle my change in my pocket when my partner's playing. So there's always this tension uh, um, uh, that we face within these groups. And the key is that the groups that are able, groups then compete with others on the basis of fitness, who can adapt best uh, to the environment. So when we think of households, firms, and governments, economists tend to treat them pretty much as principal agent problems. You know, we say, well, in the firm, how does the boss whack the worker in order to work harder because he's always trying, trying to shirk and get paid for nothing? That's a pretty grim view of most workplaces. And if they are like that, they're unlikely to succeed. You know, people who work for Google get paid a lot of money, but they can walk into another firm very successfully, but they very often stay there for a long time. And the reason is because they've created an environment where people cooperate. 
uh, that the, the, these, these um, rules, they even use things like the Google family as a metaphor to try and get people to operate together. Um, and of course, in, in economics, you used to have human resources, used to be part of economics, um, which seems almost bizarre these days. So we do have meso levels in standard economics, households, firms, and governments. But in this view, they don't get at the issue of why these uh, units are created in the first place, which are really methods of cooperating to overcome incomplete contracts, because otherwise you wouldn't have to get together in the first place. And they do this from the cooperative behavior. So Occam's razor, of course, plurality, plurality must never be posited without necessity. So what are we, are we doing all of this for really just trying to be a prove a point and it gets us nowhere? Or does the idea of social preferences give us, give us access to macroeconomic questions, which uh, could be of importance for policymakers? That seems to be, to us, the, um, the most important question uh, uh, to look at. And we have um, a number of uh, areas where we start to look at through these projects. One is the influence of social media on preferences. So arguably the rational choice model, you know, it seems very close to democracy, but if social media can influence our preferences, then what happens to our democracy? And rather than just saying, well, our preference is always fixed, of course they can't do that. One of our projects, uh, looked into the extent that this could happen through scraping the web and trying to look at uh, newspaper um, articles. We'll come on to that in a moment. Another is on macroeconomic stability. This was actually a DSG model. So it's a DSG model where my consumption depends on my neighbor's consumption. So we had what we call looking, uh, keeping up the Joneses model, and that allowed for um, uh, several, uh, for multiple equilibrium outcomes uh, to be generated. Uh, that was another form of uh, social preferences. This idea of the e economics of belonging, uh, an interesting question is whether this is all just a question of income or there's something more to it. And that's another one of our projects, which I'll, I'll describe a bit more fully. Measurement of socio sociality. So at the moment we primarily use GDP. Uh, Dennis Snower, uh, Stephen's co-author, who's one of our hub leaders, has come out with a measure uh, called SAGE, um, which is um, uh, uh, um, uh, agency. Uh, a is the agency, S is sociality. A is agency, the extent to which people feel agency uh, in their decisions. And uh, G are basically goods, the normal commodities. And E is the environment, where he's looked at different indicators to try and get a measure for a wider feeling or wi wider measure um, of sociality than just GDP. And some of the trends in these have been very interesting. So you can have your material side go up quite steadily, but some of the other measures go in a different direction. And, um, and that seems to be the case in the UK. And finally, beliefs as a coordinating activity. So this goes to the idea of the uh, Nash equilibria in repeated um, uh, games. How do you coordinate? And so we have uh, a couple of projects which have been real life projects trying to do that. So giving a couple of examples, this is uh, one paper. So on our website, we have about 40 discussion papers. Um, the global financial crisis, systemic legitimacy and rip off stories by the Daily Mail. So the authors counted the number of times there was rip off stories about energy prices. It started off as, as financial crisis, rip-off stories, but then they moved on to energy prices and took into account the number of uh, news items, legitimate news items, and whether the rip-off stories could lead to um, sort of sustained number of articles uh, uh, raising this, which then didn't go back down. So there was a, a permanent effect of these sort of rip-off stories, uh, uh, or, or certainly a, a long shadow of these rip-off stories in terms of what newspapers are reporting. So that was trying to get at, can we find a way of identifying um, uh, uh, the, the, the media influencing what we think uh, 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 is newsworthy when really nothing is happening uh, in, in terms of real news. So that was one example. Another example is, um, is identity um, 
uh, a shortcut for cooperation. So this was a laboratory experiment with um, uh, students where by telling people uh, narratives and then getting to them to play repeated games, did they change their strategy? This is very much like the, some of the work that Vernon Smith's been doing. And it depends on the narrative, but overall, it seemed that at least in the laboratory, some sort of program or preferences, again, seem to be possible, which opens up uh, uh, new areas of, of thinking. Those papers are published, three that are ongoing. One is by David Sloan Wilson, uh, who um, is an evolutionary um, biologist who is really responsible for multi-level selection theory, where he's looking at actual places in the UK, mostly in the Northwest, to try and see whether the narratives can be changed by working with business leaders uh, uh, and um, unions and people in civic uh, organizations. So that's a, a real attempt to do this. Henrietta Moore is a, uh, an anthropologist who's looking at the economics of belonging and not trying to look at it purely from um, a materialistic, a sort of GDP drives belonging uh, point of view, but whether it's about agency and attachment uh, um, uh, as well as uh, economic resources. So, uh, so this is count, sort of counter to a lot of the work that's been very public on the economics of belonging. Um, and uh, I think it's coming up with some very uh, interesting findings, but that they're not published yet. And the third one is about uh, brain sampling, a very simple cognitive science experiment where the idea was, uh, can we sample across a distribution or do we get stuck in certain parts of the distribution, which again is about beliefs, not looking right across the whole distribution, but only looking at part of the distribution. And Nick Chater has uh, been running experiments uh, based on some very simple physical activities which suggest that people do uh, have problems um, sampling the way that we might think a Bayesian would. We just get stuck in a very small part of the distribution and stay there until something moves and then we get stuck in another part of the distribution. So again, uh, talking the idea of uh, groups. And so just to um, bring this uh, to a close, I think that's uh, my time. Uh, what, what have we got? As, as said, that is one, social preferences are one of the themes that are coming through in the uh, papers that have, have been written. The other, are, the other ones uh, are about um, uh, instability, about interaction, which is agent-based models, and about radical uncertainty. And we have a number of papers um, uh, on the website. And oh, I should just say there's a paper coming out um, uh, at the end of this week, which um, by Rosa Lastra, and we'll be having a conference on it with the IMF, um, where they're looking at central bank digital currencies and where uh, Rosa has worked with a number of um, uh, academic lawyers uh, who have come to the view that basically central bank, um, currency, uh, central bank digital currencies are ultimately just social equity. And the reason why this is quite interesting, a lot of macro issues of, well, how do you know when your debt to GDP ratio is going too far? In some ways, they depend on these things that are endogenous. And so we have a workshop on the 3rd of um, December at 4 p.m. with a joint workshop with the IMF uh, about this very issue. So we have a number of publications coming through and you can find out about all of those on our website. Um, and thank you very much indeed for listening. Thank you, Angus. Uh, what a tour de force, uh, so many projects and so many ideas. Uh, do people want to put questions in the chat so that Angus can um, uh, answer them? Any reactions, any ideas? There was so much on the menu and of course it's been a long day, but it would be good to see anything at all that people would like to say or comment on. I think there was, uh, I, I agree on the on the, the social preferences, I think are, are, are an intriguing area. As I say, um, of course, people like George Akerlof, who wrote a book on identity um, uh, with Cranton, I can't remember the woman's uh, first name, Stephanie, um, anyway, Cranton. Um, Rachel. Rachel Cranton. Thank you very much indeed. Um, 
they have a slightly different way of looking at uh, social preferences of putting the or, or norms actually into the utility function. There's some debate about whether these are really things that you uh, quote unquote uh, consume or whether they're at a higher level. And I think that the way that most of our projects suggest they're more of a constraint. They're constraints on what you then go on to choose. So they are limitations on your behavior because you have to obey by certain norms and then you choose subject to those constraints, which is really like the, um, uh, uh, I think Senjin called them super preferences, but these high level preferences, which he of course referred to as values in that 1970s debate. So all of these questions are exactly replays of what was 50 years ago. Okay, there are quite a few things uh, coming up. Um, so there's one that says, uh, uh, following up on Bert's comment, Angus, do you have any plan on how to implement, integrate these various aspects into the models used by and useful for policymakers? So the, um, in terms of um, uh, policymakers, uh, what we have been surprisingly closely involved uh, with the policymakers. So it's well trailered that tomorrow, um, SUNAC or, or later this week is supposed to announce some changes about the Green Book, which is the um, uh, guide to um, all uh, uh, government spending, um, public investment. And that's done from a very narrow, pretty much self-interested uh, perspective where it's only the value of the individual. There is something at the back that says that, oh, but if there's some wider social consequences of this project, then you should give account of those, but it's kind of an afterthought. And uh, members of the rebuilding macroeconomics community have uh, raised this issue a number of times about the Green Book. And you know, in the past, we used to promote policies deliberately to have greater integra integration. So for example, state housing was often mixed up with private housing specifically to have integration, uh, rather than thinking about them as cheaper sites to have uh, housing. So that was a very deliberate attempt to think about the wider consequences on people's preferences. And so there's a number of examples like that in those sort of areas. In terms of um, more bread and butter policy, we have um, a contribution uh, from um, uh, uh, David Tuckett on uh, how we can use narratives, particularly those taken from agents, to um, get more at what is going on in the economy. So the agents of the Bank of England use these things and how they could be better used. That's a Bank of England discussion paper. And this becomes very interesting when you get moments like they are today. So, you know, we have a vaccine and the big question is not necessarily how many can we buy or its medical efficacy rate, which of course is very important, but it's how safe do people feel to use it. And that is qualitative data. You're not going to get that in a hard bit of economics data, but it's mission critical because if people start becoming feeling unsafe about this, this becomes a real issue. And so his work very much looks at what can we, what do we really not consider to be economic data at the moment, but should realistically be considered economic data um, by collecting these sort of sources. So it's fed into some of those projects uh, on, on um, uh, monetary policy and COVID policy. So there's many, many ways that, uh, that this is expressing interest, but I see that somebody's asked for what is the future of of rebuilding macro from here. Well, it's quite interesting that uh, it's only at this later stage, you know, once the projects start coming in, that one can start fitting the jigsaw puzzle together. And, you know, I've talked about social preferences, but once you've got social preferences and you've got groups and you've got this sort of for form of competition between them, that creates radical uncertainty and that creates these instabilities in terms of um, uh, modeling them like uh, complex models having the macro not the same as the micro because of emergent properties, you can see how this can start to fit together, but it's pretty much uh, in the later stages. And so we will be reporting back with a so-called roadmap for just as Lee and Jesus was talking about where there are potential synergies, um, uh, but also 
complementary paths because they look at different questions. We have to think about the toolbox uh, for policymakers. They want different things for different, um, different, different tools to answer different policy issues. Um, and that's, I hope, what we, we try to bring uh, throughout this uh, project. You've got a question there, Angus, so mm -hmm. that says that from Nicola saying, in that sense, so we should think about social preferences as psychological preferences as well. And sorry, that's just moved now. What about finding a way to put antipathy or sympathy in the utility function? And if you wait a second, I'll, I'll add another one, which is also on social preference. It seems to have just come through from Eddie. Uh, thinking a bit broader about social preferences in macro DSG models, very technical socialist economists have really progressed a lot on this issue, in particular investigating macro effects of Minimax, Wolsian, and other socially supported preferences and other social constructions. How could you use that knowledge and deep insights into your work? Have you engaged with that literature? Uh, so let me just take the, the first one. In terms of the um, uh, the notion, so the notion of sympathy, of course, has a very noble history going back to um, our founder Adam Smith, who said that this is uh, well, circles of sympathy go from um, Greek times all the way through from Smith to Gandhi. There's a, a very common notion that. Um, People that we, as uh, people who we feel a degree of certainty, uh, sorry, sympathy for, uh, are people who are, I guess, in modern terms, you'd call within our social network or our group. The question is how to formulate this, and we would say, or well, we would, some of the researchers would say that um, this is not again not something you just put in your utility function it sets a form of beliefs and behaviors that you then choose subject to those uh, norms and beliefs. So it's sort of um, uh, as much a constraint, even though it's self-imposed, it becomes almost your nature, um, uh, which you value for a, 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 a different reason than uh, um, a purely consumption reason. It becomes your identity. So, they can enter, but they take a slightly different form to uh, preferences over normal goods. In terms of the wider literature, so I haven't engaged uh, with the uh, uh, very technical socialist economists. I'm very interested to hear about them actually. Um, so I'd be delighted to have a, a reference on them. Uh, there is a, a very important methodological division on do you consider this to be within the gambit of methodological individualism or not? And uh, some people do and some people don't. It's, it's still an open question because we haven't explored all sides. And it's only through exploring and seeing where we can get to that one would eventually come down to a decision. Um, but I think there's grounds for at least thinking about the um, feedback effects of social preferences. Um, you know, there's social movements like Black Lives Matter, where there's clearly feedback effects and things can happen very quickly. You can move from one place to a very different place very quickly, um, which seem almost impossible to imagine without feedback effects. If you had to do one by one by one, that'd be very, very difficult. And once one starts to go there, it opens up a different classification of uh, models. But I'd be very to have a reference for that. Thank you. Okay. Uh are there any other questions that anyone would like to put to Angus? Keeping an eye on the chat there to give people time to type. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you're getting an offer of assistance in the getting access to that literature. Great. So always seems to me anyway, I mean, methodological individualism is about where we think the locus of the decision is. It's not about what we think people consider. We don't actually say this is about people just considering themselves as they make decisions. We're saying we're going to focus on modeling that place of decision making rather than say, as sociologists may do at the collective level. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. So the way I guess I would think about it is, can you reduce things down to the individual's decisions uh, or the individual as the, uh, the 
basic unit. And that I think is open. What we definitely, what I think is quite promising is you can keep rationality as defined in economics, which is really, you know, just um, uh, uh, consistency assumptions, at very, very uh, um, general and um, hard to object with assumptions. One can keep that um, and still not have methodological individualism. It's not obvious they have to go together at all. So, you know, you can build a, what would be to all intents and purposes seen as a rational agent, um, uh, but still allowing the, the, these, these um, uh, interactions. Okay, and on that note then, I'm going to thank Angus very much and hand over to Mark Casson for his concluding remarks. Are you with us, Mark? Oh, great, connected right. from his library. Okay, yes. Uh, so if you can hear me okay, Right, good. Okay, so um, I haven't got any slides because I've actually uh, made my notes by listening to this. I've attended every session and I've tried to sum it all up in one page. Um, so what I want to comment on is simply what am I doing here? I did do macroeconomic research about 30 years ago and my focus was on the interwar period, uh, which actually covered both looking at the history of unemployment in that period but also it's in some sense it's the birth of macroeconomics because that's when the quantity theory of money gets discredited. People see there's mass unemployment. They say we, we must be facing rigid money wages and possibly rigid money prices. And so that then provides the opportunity for Keynes's ideas to get traction. Um, and so I thought it would be interesting if I compared what I'd heard today with what economists believed in 1939 what kind of modeling they did then and that would enable us just to sort of take stock about what progress or regress there has been in the intervening period so i do that under four headings one is firstly the relevance of economics to contemporary policy debate the second is the importance of aggregation to what extent is macro different because it deals in aggregates thirdly what are the sort of typical assumptions the professional view about what you ought to assume if you're a proper macroeconomist. And the fourth is how do you apply the models? What, what's thought to be the big payoff of macroeconomics? Um, and just taking these therefore in turn, I think it's undeniable that the macroeconomics in 1939 was hugely influential because it has a single dominant issue, unemployment. Now today, it, macro is a much more versatile subject, but you can say that it doesn't have that impact the same as it did because it doesn't really hammer home I think at any one specific issue with the same vigor and relevance as Keynesianism did to the unemployment debate um, in the 1930s. Some of the assumptions made at that time were accepted as descriptions of reality so you didn't really have an argument about money wage rigidity because people could just see as a fact that things were rigid. The trade unions went on strike in Britain in 1926 to protect a downward adjustment in the money wage as a consequence of a revaluation of the pound. And the point I think is that some of the assumptions now made don't have a ring of truth about them. They actually sound like artificial contrived assumptions made for the convenience of the modeler. And maybe the public wonders what these assumptions are doing if they don't appear to have much uh, practical relevance. And the third thing is that the political stance in the 1930s was fairly clear. It was a reaction against capitalism, which was seen to be almost on the verge of collapse. Cat socialism was coming. And so there wasn't much question about taking a, a political stance in terms of the necessity of planning and regulation. Whereas obviously when you get the fight back um, in, uh, in, in sort of new classical economics uh, in the 1970s, then these issues get muddied again. So it's not just that economics seems to lose touch with the data, it does, doesn't have what we might call clear messaging these days. The second thing on aggregation is that, I'm, that the early models were wholly aggregate. Everything was an aggregate, whether it was consumption or investment or government expenditure or GDP and prices were the general price level. 
Now we like to have micro foundations. So ostensibly we're more disaggregated, but actually we seem to sort of start with aggregates. We go into micro to get some micro foundations. And then we come back out again to predict about aggregates. But the question is, can macro type models predict in a disaggregated way about the impact of policies on specific sections of the population? And if they can, are they really macro anymore? What, what actually is the difference between macro and micro uh, today? And I think that that, that is a, a quite important issue. Furthermore, how do you make macro more micro? Uh, the stance taken today has largely been to imagine that individuals vary according to some characteristic. And you model the distribution of this characteristic. But when you go back to um, other economists in the 1930s who weren't macro, what they did was they used categories. They had mature industries like steel and coal and shipbuilding, and they had new industries like radios and motor cars and things like that. I, I don't detect much interest these days in categorization. Everybody seems to want to use frequency distributions for everything rather than segment into categories. You get spatial categories where people do regional economics. The only place I know where you get decent categories is when people do global macro, when they actually do disaggregate by the country because they recognize that countries are different in a substantial way. So I think aggregation needs to be rethought of. Is it a strength of macro or actually a weakness as it seems to me to be increasingly so. Uh, thirdly, what drives the models and what kind of models do we want? I mean, my assumption always was that macro was about dynamics. When I taught macro to the second and third year undergraduates, I always used to stress things like the multiplier accelerator interaction, Samuelson stability conditions. It was far more exciting than equilibrium. But when I listen to some of the presentations today, I still detect a strong fondness for equilibrium. If only the economy lasted long enough and there weren't these stochastic shocks, we would get to the equilibrium and that would be fine. So is, is in fact disequilibrium at the heart of macroeconomics or, well, or, or isn't it? I think that needs to be clarified. And finally, I think the validation of macro models is also a very restricted sort of area. A lot of macro models these days seem to be validated on their ability to forecast. And if somebody says, oh, well, I can forecast just as well as your simultaneous equation model with a simple univariate uh, VAR or something, or, well, or bivariate VAR, then people say, oh, that's great, that, that'll do then. But the point is, what, what are you actually doing? Is prediction the, the name of the game? Is it simulation or is it actually explanation? If you've got a data set on the post-war period covering about 70 years, shouldn't your model actually explain what was going on? What sort of historical relevance does it have? In my view, macro models are hardly ever discussed in relation to, are they historically plausible? If you pick up a book on post-war economic history, there'll be virtually no reference whatsoever to what a macro model can tell you that's remotely useful about understanding the history of the economy in the post-war period, because the history will be told in terms of all the things that macro models assume away, rather than in terms of the things they actually analyze. So I think there should be much more straightforward hypothesis testing by looking at, at whether certain hypotheses built into the models are correct, whether the models provide a plausible interpretation of historical events. So what, what are my action points from this? Uh, I can safely deliver some action points because since I'm not a practicing macroeconomist, I won't have to act on them myself. Um, but I do think that, that, that uh, there's a difference of opinion here between myself and several of the speakers. Uh, it, even, I, I'm afraid to say, Alex. Alex was very enthusiastic about the new techniques, but I'm not sure that more new techniques are what we need seems to me we have lots of techniques already and we're struggling to get them to work properly. Do we really need more technique or do we need better intuition and judgment about the kind of factors that the model should be focusing on, the kind of factors that people are really concerned about and the kind of things that macroeconomists should reasonably be able to explain. So I don't think it's technique, I think it's the agenda to some extent that's a bit of the problem. 
The second thing is, I think that disaggregation does need to be considered more in terms of these categories, but to, to analyze contemporary cultural problems in Britain, you surely need to distinguish between growth industries and mature industries, between the North and the South, between the high COVID areas and the low COVID areas. Unless you have some substantive uh, classificatory system like this, I don't see how you can work properly, which really means I think we need mesoeconomics to interface between macro and microeconomics. And finally, I think that if we're going to maximize public impact, we need to have much less internal navel gazing dispute over the method methodological correction or, or, or methodological validity of different ways of doing things. Because if the test is, does this provide a plausible explanation, then surely that can be used to decide issues, not whether you've violated somebody's cherished methodological position about methodological individualism or whatnot. So I think economists, probably macroeconomists, could do with being a bit more pragmatic um, and actually testing their models against historical evidence might be one way of bringing them out of their world of abstract theory and a bit more down to earth. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, with that, I think my job is almost finished. And I will just uh, hand over to Alex for the final greetings. Thank you all very much. Thank you to my panelists. And thank you for having me too. If I may just have three minutes to thank everyone. I will start with Mark. Uh, I assigned him to the, the most difficult role. I kind of imposed on him to watch all these presentations and be able to summarize them at, at, at a short notice or no notice at all. But I knew, I knew that he would do this job. He is our most prominent uh, professor and intellectual. And I really thank Mark for being patient and, and willing to observe the whole conference, the whole day, and to summarize for us densely and wisely and eloquently, uh, which is typical for his uh, unique style of an erudite intellectual. We know that wh whoever works in Reading, this whole day of topical as well as technical presentations. Uh, we all learned a lot from uh, this update into modern macroeconomics, not just Mark, we all learned. And, and it seems that macro comes nearer to reality, which is uh, in the title of our conference. I wanted to mention one thing here. Even such extreme and cruel circumstances across the world, like the COVID-19 pandemic, cannot prevent us from uh, uniting around their positive aspects or opportunities, such as organizing a virtual conference. This is my first ever virtual conference co-organized with my colleagues at Rebuilding Macro. So this is an example of a public good to the benefit of society with close to zero monetary cost and made possible by the willingness of researchers to share generously their time and knowledge. So, Finally, I want to extend my thanks, sincere thanks, to all speakers who shared their time and knowledge, all session chairs who made the presentations time constrained and the discussion interesting, to all participants for their attendance and questions. And of course, last but not least, to my colleagues, co-organizers at Rebuilding Macro, Angus, Carla, and Richard. Without all these people, our conference would not have happened at all. Now, it has been a long and busy day, a useful and memorable, and memorable one, I would say, and we now all feel a bit tired. Let me just remind you that the conference was recorded and the recordings will be posted on the websites of the conference and uh, Rebuilding Macro. This will happen in about a week, as Angus mentioned, and now I have nothing left to do but to close our conference, wishing you a relaxing evening. Thank you all once again. Keep safe. Goodbye.